preface of the gray fairy book this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by maria therese the gray fairy book edited by andrew lang preface the tales in the gray fairy book are derived from many countries lithuania various parts of africa germany france greece and other regions of the world they have been translated and adapted by mrs dent mrs lang miss eleanor seller miss blackley and miss hang the three sons of holly is from the last century cabinet des fils a very large collection the french author may have had some oriental original before him in parts at all events he copied the eastern method of putting tail within tail like the eastern balls of carved ivory the stories as usual illustrate the method of popular fiction a certain number of incidents are shaken into many varying combinations like the fragments of colored glass in the kaleidoscope probably the possible combinations like possible music combinations are not unlimited in number but children may be less sensitive in the matter of fairies than mr john stuart mill was as regards music End of preface. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter One of the Grave Fairy Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Lee Paquette. The Gray Fairy Book, edited by Andrew Lang. Chapter One Donkey Skin. There was once upon a time a king who was so much beloved by his subjects that he thought himself the happiest monarch in the whole world, and he had everything his heart could desire. His palace was filled with the rarest of curiosities, and his gardens with the sweetest flowers while in the marble stalls of his stables stood a row of milk-white arabs with big brown eyes strangers who had heard of the marvels which the king had collected and made long journeys to see them were however surprised to find the most splendid stall of all occupied by a donkey with particularly large and drooping ears it was a very fine donkey but still as far as they could tell nothing so very remarkable as to account for the care with which it was lodged and they went away wondering for they could not know that every night when it was asleep bushels of gold pieces tumbled out of its ears which were picked up each morning by the attendants after many years of prosperity a sudden blow fell upon the king in the death of his wife whom he loved dearly but before she died the queen who had always thought first of his happiness gathered all her strength and said to him promise me one thing you must marry again i know for the good of your people as well as of yourself but do not set about it in a hurry wait until you have found a woman more beautiful and better formed than myself oh do not speak to me of marrying sobbed the king rather let me die with you but the queen only smiled faintly and turned over on her pillow and died for some months the king's grief was great then gradually he began to forget a little and besides his counsellors were always urging him to seek another wife at first he refused to listen to them but by and by he allowed himself to be persuaded to think of it only stipulating that the bride should be more beautiful and attractive than the late queen according to the promise he had made her overjoyed at having obtained what they wanted 
the councillors sent envoys far and wide to get portraits of all the most famous beauties of every country. The artists were very busy, and did their best, but alas, nobody could even pretend that any of the ladies could compare for a moment with the late queen. At length one day, when he had turned away discouraged from a fresh collection of pictures, the king's eyes fell on his adopted daughter, who had lived in the palace since she was a baby, and he saw that, if a woman existed on the whole earth more lovely than the queen, this was she. He at once made known what his wishes were, but the young girl, who was not at all ambitious, and had not the faintest desire to marry him, was filled with dismay, and begged for time to think about it. That night, when everyone was asleep, she started in a little car drawn by a big sheep, and went to consult her fairy godmother. "'I know what you have come to tell me,' said the fairy, when the maiden stepped out of the car. "'And if you don't wish to marry him, I will show you how to avoid it. Ask him to give you a dress that exactly matches the sky. It will be impossible for him to get one, so you will be quite safe." The girl thanked the fairy, and returned home again. The next morning, when her father, as she had always called him, came to see her, she told him that she could give him no answer until he had presented her with a dress the color of the sky. The king, overjoyed at this answer, sent for all the choicest weavers and dressmakers in the kingdom, and commanded them to make a robe the color of the sky without an instant's delay, or he would cut off their heads at once. Dreadfully frightened at this threat, they all began to dye and cut and sew, and in two days they brought back the dress, which looked as if it had been cut straight out of the heavens. The poor girl was thunderstruck, and did not know what to do. So in the night she harnessed her sheep again, and went in search of her godmother. "'The king is cleverer than I thought,' said the fairy. "'But tell him you must have a dress of moonbeams.' And the next day, when the king summoned her into his presence, the girl told him what she wanted. "'Madame, I can refuse you nothing,' said he, and he ordered the dress to be ready in twenty-four hours, or every man should be hanged. They set to work with all their might, and by dawn next day the dress of moonbeams was laid across her bed. The girl, though she could not help admiring its beauty, began to cry, till the fairy who heard her came to her help. "'Well, I could not have believed it of him,' said she. "'But ask for a dress of sunshine, and I shall be surprised indeed if he manages that.' The goddaughter did not feel much faith in the fairy after her two previous failures, but not knowing what else to do, she told her father what she was bid. The king made no difficulties about it and even gave his finest rubies and diamonds to ornament the dress, which was so dazzling when finished that it could not be looked at save through smoked glasses. When the princess saw it, she pretended that the sight hurt her eyes and retired to her room, where she found the fairy awaiting her, very much ashamed of herself. "'There is only one thing to be done now,' cried she. You must demand the skin of the ass he sets such store by. It is from that donkey he obtains all his vast riches, and I am sure he will never give it to you. The princess was not so certain. However, she went to the king and told him she could never marry him till he had given her the ass's skin. The king was both astonished and grieved at this new request but did not hesitate an instant. The ass was sacrificed, 
and the skin laid at the feet of the princess. The poor girl, seeing no escape from the fate she dreaded, wept afresh and tore her hair, when suddenly the fairy stood before her. "'Take heart,' she said. "'All will now go well. Wrap yourself in this skin, and leave the palace, and go as far as you can. I will look after you. Your dresses and your jewels shall follow you underground, and if you strike the earth whenever you need anything, you will have it at once. But go quickly. You have no time to lose.' So the princess clothed herself in the ass's skin, and slipped from the palace without being seen by any one. Directly she was missed, there was a great hue and cry, and every corner, possible and impossible, was searched. Then the king sent out parties along all the roads, but the fairy threw her invisible mantle over the girl when they approached, and none of them could see her. The princess walked on a long, long way, trying to find someone who would take her in and let her work for them. But though the cottagers, whose houses she passed, gave her food from charity, the ass's skin was so dirty they would not allow her to enter their houses. For her flight had been so hurried she had had no time to clean it. Tired and disheartened at her ill fortune, she was wandering one day past the gate of a farmyard situated just outside the walls of a large town when she heard a voice calling to her. She turned and saw the farmer's wife standing among her turkeys and making signs to her to come in. "'I want a girl to wash the dishes and feed the turkeys and clean out the pigsty,' said the woman. "'And, to judge by your dirty clothes,' you would not be too fine for the work the girl accepted her offer with joy and she was at once set to work in a corner of the kitchen where all the farm servants came and made fun of her and the ass's skin in which she was wrapped but by and by they got so used to the sight of it that it ceased to amuse them and she worked so hard and so well that her mistress grew quite fond of her and she was so clever at keeping sheep and herding turkeys that you would have thought she had done nothing else during her whole life. One day she was sitting on the banks of a stream bewailing her wretched lot when she suddenly caught sight of herself in the water. Her hair and part of her face was quite concealed by the ass's head, which was drawn right over like a hood and the filthy matted skin covered her whole body. It was the first time she had seen herself as other people saw her, and she was filled with shame at the spectacle. Then she threw off her disguise and jumped into the water, plunging in again and again, till she shone like ivory. When it was time to go back to the farm, she was forced to put on the skin which disguised her, and now seemed more dirty than ever. But, as she did so, she comforted herself with the thought that tomorrow was a holiday, and that she would be able for a few hours to forget that she was a farm girl and be a princess once more. So at break of day she stamped on the ground as the fairy had told her, and instantly the dress like the sky lay across her tiny bed. Her room was so small that there was no place for the train of her dress to spread itself out, but she pinned it up carefully when she combed her beautiful hair and piled it up on the top of her head, as she had always worn it. When she had done, she was so pleased with herself that she determined never to let a chance pass of putting on her splendid clothes, even if she had to wear them in the fields, with no one to admire her but the sheep and turkeys. Now the farm was a royal farm, and one holiday, when Donkey Skin, as they had nicknamed the princess, had locked the door of her room and clothed herself in her dress of sunshine, the king's son rode through the gate, and asked if he might come and rest himself a little after hunting. 
Some food and milk were set before him in the garden, and when he felt rested he got up and began to explore the house, which was famous throughout the whole kingdom for its age and beauty. He opened one door after the other, admiring the old rooms, when he came to a handle that would not turn. He stooped and peeped through the keyhole to see what was inside, and was greatly astonished at beholding a beautiful girl, clad in a dress so dazzling that he could hardly look at it. The dark gallery seemed darker than ever as he turned away, but he went back to the kitchen and inquired who slept in the room at the end of the passage. The scullery maid, they told him, whom everybody laughed at and called Donkey Skin. And though he perceived there was some strange mystery about this, he saw quite clearly there was nothing to be gained by asking any more questions. So he rode back to the palace, his head filled with the vision he had seen through the keyhole. All night long he tossed about, and awoke the next morning in a high fever. The queen, who had no other child, and lived in a state of perpetual anxiety about this one, at once gave him up for lost, and indeed his sudden illness puzzled the greatest doctors, who tried the usual remedies in vain. At last they told the queen that some secret sorrow must be at the bottom of all this, and she threw herself on her knees beside her son's bed and implored him to confide his trouble to her. If it was ambition to be king, his father would gladly resign the cares of the crown and suffer him to reign in his stead. Or, if it was love, everything should be sacrificed to get for him the wife he desired, even if she were daughter of a king with whom the country was at war at present. Madame, replied the prince, whose weakness would hardly allow him to speak. Do not think me so unnatural as to wish to deprive my father of his crown. As long as he lives, I shall remain the most faithful of his subjects. And as to the princesses you speak of, I have seen none that I should care for as a wife, though I would always obey your wishes, whatever it might cost me. Ah, oh, my son, cried she, we will do anything in the world to save your life, and ours too, for if you die, we shall die also. Well then, replied the prince, I will tell you the only thing that will cure me, a cake made by the hand of Donkey Skin. Donkey Skin, exclaimed the queen, who thought her son had gone mad, and who or what is that? Madame, answered one of the attendants present, who had been with the prince at the farm, Donkey Skin is, next to the wolf, the most disgusting creature on the face of the earth. She is a girl who wears a black, greasy skin, and lives at your farmer's as henwife. Never mind, said the queen, my son seems to have eaten some of her pastry. It is the whim of a sick man, no doubt, but send at once and let her bake a cake. The attendant bowed, and ordered a page to ride with the message. Now, it is by no means certain that Donkey Skin had not caught a glimpse of the prince, either when his eyes looked through the keyhole, or else from her little window, which was over the road. But whether she had actually seen him, or only heard him spoken of, directly she received the queen's command, she flung off the dirty skin, washed herself from head to foot, and put on a skirt and bodice of shining silver. Then, locking herself into her room, she took the richest cream, the finest flour, and the freshest eggs on the farm, and set about making her cake. As she was stirring the mixture in the saucepan, a ring that she sometimes wore in secret slipped from her finger and fell into the dough. 
perhaps donkey skin saw it or perhaps she did not but anyway she went on stirring and soon the cake was ready to be put in the oven when it was nice and brown she took off her dress and put on her dirty skin and gave the cake to the page asking at the same time for news of the prince but the page turned his head aside and would not even condescend to answer the page rode like the wind and as soon as he arrived at the palace he snatched up a silver tray and hastened to present the cake to the prince the sick man began to eat it so fast that the doctors thought he would choke and indeed he very nearly did for the ring was in one of the bits which he broke off though he managed to extract it from his mouth without any one seeing him the moment the prince was left alone he drew the ring from under his pillow and kissed it a thousand times then he set his mind to find how he was to see the owner for even he did not dare to confess that he had only beheld donkey skin through a keyhole lest they should laugh at his sudden passion all this worry brought back the fever which the arrival of the cake had diminished for the time and the doctors not knowing what else to say informed the queen that her son was simply dying of love the queen stricken with horror rushed into the king's presence with the news and together they hastened to their son's bedside my boy my dear boy cried the king who is it you want to marry we will give her to you for a bride even if she is the humblest of our slaves what is there in the whole world that we would not do for you the prince moved to tears at these words drew the ring which was an emerald of the purest water from under his pillow ah dear father and mother let this be a proof that she whom i love is no peasant girl the finger which that ring fits has never been thickened by hard work but be her condition what it may i will marry no other the king and queen examined the tiny ring very closely and agreed with their son that the wearer could be no mere farm girl then the king went out and ordered heralds and trumpeters to go through the town summoning every maiden to the palace and she whom the ring fitted would some day be queen first came all the princesses then all the duchess's daughters and so on in proper order but not one of them could slip the ring over the tip of her finger to the great joy of the prince whom excitement was fast curing at last when the high-born damsels had failed the shop girls and chambermaids took their turn but with no better fortune call in the scullions and shepherdesses commanded the prince but the sight of their fat red fingers satisfied everybody there is not a woman left your highness said the chamberlain but the prince waved him aside have you sent for donkey skin who made me the cake asked he and the courtiers began to laugh and replied that they would not have dared to introduce so dirty a creature into the palace let someone go for her at once ordered the king i commanded the presence of every maiden high or low and i meant it the princess had heard the trumpets and the proclamations and knew quite well that her ring was at the bottom of it all she too had fallen in love with the prince in the brief glimpse she had had of him and trembled with fear lest someone else's finger might be as small as her own when therefore the messenger from the palace rode up to the gate she was nearly beside herself with delight hoping all the time for such a summons she had dressed herself with great care putting on the garment of moonlight whose skirt was scattered over with emeralds but when they began calling to her to come down she hastily covered herself with her donkey-skin 
and announced she was ready to present herself before his highness she was taken straight into the hall where the prince was awaiting her but at the sight of the donkey skin his heart sank had he been mistaken after all are you the girl he said turning his eyes away as he spoke are you the girl who has a room in the furthest corner of the inner court of the farmhouse yes my lord i am answered she hold out your hand then continued the prince feeling that he must keep his word whatever the cost and to the astonishment of every one present a little hand white and delicate came from beneath the black and dirty skin the ring slipped on with the utmost ease and as it did so the skin fell to the ground disclosing a figure of such beauty that the prince weak as he was fell on his knees before her while the king and queen joined their prayers to his indeed their welcome was so warm and their caresses so bewildering that the princess hardly knew how to find words to reply when the ceiling of the hall opened and the fairy godmother appeared seated in a car made entirely of white lilac in a few words she explained the history of the princess and how she came to be there and without losing a moment preparations of the most magnificent kind were made for the wedding the kings of every country in the earth were invited including of course the princess's adopted father who by this time had married a widow and not one refused but what a strange assembly it was each monarch travelled in the way he thought most impressive and some came borne in litters others had carriages of every shape and kind while the rest were mounted on elephants tigers and even upon eagles so splendid a wedding had never been seen before and when it was over the king announced that it was to be followed by a coronation for he and the queen were tired of reigning and the young couple must take their place the rejoicings lasted for three whole months then the new sovereigns settled down to govern their kingdom and made themselves so much beloved by their subjects that when they died a hundred years later each man mourned them as his own father and mother from le cabinet de fay end of chapter one recording by linda lee paquette chapter two of the gray fairy book this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gesine. The Grey Fairy Book, edited by Andrew Lang. Chapter Two, The Goblin Pony. Don't stir from the fireplace tonight," said Old Peggy, "for the wind is blowing so violently that the house shakes. Besides, this is Halloween, when the witches are abroad and the goblins, who are their servants, are wandering about in all sorts of disguises, doing harm to the children of men." "'Why should I stay here?' said the eldest of the young people. "'No, I must go and see what the daughter of old Jacob, the rope-maker, is doing. "'She wouldn't close her blue eyes all night if I didn't visit her father before the moon had gone down.' "'I must go and catch lobsters and crabs,' said the second. "'And not all the witches and goblins in the world shall hinder me.' "'So they all determined to go on their business or pleasure, "'and scorned the wise advice of old Peggy.' Only the youngest child hesitated a minute when she said to him, "'You stay here, my little Richard, and I will tell you beautiful stories.' But he wanted to pick a bunch of wild thyme and some blackberries by moonlight, and ran out after the others. When they got outside the house, they said, "'The old woman talks of wind and storm, but never was the weather finer or the sky more clear, 
See how majestically the moon stalks through the transparent clouds. Then, all of a sudden, they noticed a little black pony close beside them. Oh ho, they said, this is old Valentine's pony. It must have escaped from its stable, and it's going down to drink at the horse pond. My pretty little pony, said the eldest, patting the creature with his hand. You mustn't run too far. I'll take you to the pond myself. With these words he jumped on the pony's back, and was quickly followed by his second brother, then by the third, and so on, till at last they were all astride the little beast, down to the small Richard, who didn't like to be left behind. On the way to the pond they met several of their companions, and they invited them all to mount the pony, which they did, and the little creature did not seem to mind the extra weight, but trotted merrily along. The quicker it trotted, the more the young people enjoyed the fun. They dug their heels into the pony's sides, and called out, "'Gallop, little horse! You have never had such brave riders on your back before!' In the meantime the wind had risen again, and the waves began to howl. But the pony did not seem to mind the noise, and instead of going to the pond, cantered gaily towards the seashore. Richard began to regret his time in blackberries, and his eldest brother seized the pony by the mane and tried to make it turn round, for he remembered the blue eyes of Jacob the rope-maker's daughter. But he tugged and pulled in vain, for the pony galloped straight on into the sea, till the waves met its forefeet. As soon as it felt the water it neighed lustily and capered about with glee, advancing quickly into the foaming billows. When the waves had covered the children's legs, they repented their careless behaviour and cried out, the cursed little black pony is bewitched. If we had only listened to old Peggy's advice, we shouldn't have been lost. The further the pony advanced, the higher rose the sea. At last the waves covered the children's heads, and they were all drowned. Towards morning old Peggy went out, for she was anxious about the fate of her grandchildren. She sought them high and low, but could not find them anywhere. She asked all the neighbours if they had seen the children, but no one knew anything about them, except that the eldest had not been with the blue-eyed daughter of Jacob the rope-maker. As she was going home, bowed with grief, she saw a little black pony coming towards her, springing and curveting in every direction. When it got quite near her, it neighed loudly, and galloped past her so quickly that in a moment it was out of her sight. End of chapter 2。Chapter 3 of the Gray Fairy Book。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Bologna Times. The Gray Fairy Book, edited by Andrew Lang. Chapter 3 An Impossible Enchantment. There once lived a king who was much loved by his people, and he, too, loved them warmly. He led a very happy life, but he had the greatest dislike to the idea of marrying, nor had he ever felt the slightest wish to fall in love. His subjects begged him to marry, and at last he promised to try to do so. But, as so far, he had never cared for any woman he had seen, he made up his mind to travel in hopes of meeting some lady he could love. So he arranged all the affairs of state in an orderly manner, and set out, attended by only one equerry, who, though not very clever, had most excellent good sense. These people, indeed, generally make the best fellow-travellers. The king explored several countries, doing all he could to fall in love, but in vain, and at the end of two years journeys he turned his face towards home with as free a heart as when he set out as he was riding along through a forest he suddenly heard the most awful meowing and shrieking of cats you can imagine the noise drew nearer and nearer and at last they saw a hundred huge spanish cats rush through the trees close to them they were so closely packed together that you could easily have covered them with a large cloak and all were following the same track 
they were closely pursued by two enormous apes dressed in purple suits with the prettiest and best made boots you ever saw the apes were mounted on superb mastiffs and spurred them on in hot haste blowing shrill blasts on little toy trumpets all the time the king and his equerry stood still to watch this strange hunt which was followed by twenty or more little dwarves some mounted on wolves and leading relays and others with cats in leash the dwarfs were all dressed in purple silk liveries like the apes a moment later a beautiful young woman mounted on a tiger came in sight she passed close to the king riding at full speed without taking any notice of him but he was at once enchanted by her and his heart was gone in a moment to his great joy he saw that one of the dwarfs had fallen behind the rest and at once began to question him the dwarf told him that the lady he had just seen was the princess mutinosa the daughter of the king in whose country they were at that moment he added that the princess was very fond of hunting and that she was now in pursuit of rabbits the king then asked the way to the court and having been told it hurried off and reached the capital in a couple of hours as soon as he arrived he presented himself to the king and queen and on mentioning his own name and that of his country was received with open arms not long after the princess returned and hearing that the hunt had been very successful the king complimented her on it but she would not answer a word her silence rather surprised him but he was still more astonished when he found that she never spoke once all through supper time sometimes she seemed about to speak but whenever this was the case her father or mother at once took up the conversation however the silence did not cool the king's affection and when he retired to his rooms at night he confided his feelings to his faithful equerry but the equerry was by no means delighted at his king's love affair and took no pains to hide his disappointment but why are you vexed asked the king surely the princess is beautiful enough to please any one she is certainly very handsome replied the equerry but to be really happy in love something more than beauty is required to tell the truth sire he added her expression seems to me hard that is pride and dignity said the king and nothing can be more becoming pride or hardness as you will said the equerry but to my mind the choice of so many fierce creatures for her amusements seems to tell of a fierce nature and i also think there is something suspicious in the care taken to prevent her speaking the equerry's remarks were full of good sense but as opposition is only apt to increase love in the hearts of men and especially of kings who hate being contradicted this king begged the very next day for the hand of the princess mutinosa it was granted him on two conditions the first was that the wedding should take place the very next day and the second that he should not speak to the princess till she was his wife to all of which the king agreed in spite of his equerry's objections so that the first word he heard his bride utter was the yes she spoke at their marriage once married however she no longer placed any check on herself and her ladies-in-waiting came in for plenty of rude speeches even the king did not escape scolding but as he was a good-tempered man and very much in love he bore it patiently a few days after the wedding the newly married pair set out for their kingdom without leaving many regrets behind the good equerry's fears proved only too true as the king found out to his cost the young queen made herself most disagreeable to all her court her spite and bad temper knew no bounds and before the end of a month she was known far and wide as a regular vixen one day when riding out she met a poor old woman walking along the road who made a curtsy and was going on when the queen had her stopped and cried 
you are a very impertinent person don't you know that i am the queen and how dare you not make me a deeper curtsy madam said the old woman i have never learnt how to measure curtsies but i had no wish to fail in proper respect what screamed the queen she dares to answer tie her to my horse's tail and i'll just carry her at once to the best dancing master in the town to learn how to curtsy the old woman shrieked for mercy but the queen would not listen and only mocked when she said she was protected by the fairies at last the poor old thing submitted to be tied up but when the queen urged her horse on he never stirred in vain she spurred him he seemed turned to bronze at the same moment the cord with which the old woman was tied changed into wreaths of flowers and she herself into a tall and stately lady looking disdainfully at the queen she said bad woman unworthy of your crown i wished to judge for myself whether all i had heard of you was true i have now no doubt of it and you shall see whether the fairies are to be laughed at so saying the fairy placida that was her name blew a little gold whistle and a chariot appeared drawn by six splendid ostriches in it was seated the fairy queen escorted by a dozen other fairies mounted on dragons all having dismounted placida told her adventures and the fairy queen approved all she had done and proposed turning mutinosa into bronze like her horse placida however who was very kind and gentle begged for a milder sentence and at last it was settled that mutinosa should become her slave for life unless she should have a child to take her place the king was told of his wife's fate and submitted to it which as he could do nothing to help it was the only course open to him the fairies then all dispersed placida taking her slave with her and on reaching her palace she said you ought by rights to be scullion but as you have been delicately brought up the change might be too great for you i shall therefore only order you to sweep my rooms carefully and to wash and comb my little dog Maltinosa felt there was no use in disobeying so she did as she was bid and said nothing after some time she gave birth to a most lovely little girl and when she was well again the fairy gave her a good lecture on her past life made her promise to behave better in future and sent her back to the king her husband placida now gave herself up entirely to the little princess who was left in her charge she anxiously thought over which of the fairies she would invite to be godmothers so as to secure the best gift for her adopted child at last she decided on two very kindly and cheerful fairies and asked them to the christening feast directly it was over the baby was brought to them in a lovely crystal cradle hung with red silk curtains embroidered with gold the little thing smiled so sweetly at the fairies that they decided to do all they could for her they began by naming her graziella and then placida said you know dear sisters that the commonest form of spite or punishment amongst us consists of changing beauty to ugliness cleverness to stupidity and oftener still to change a person's form altogether now as we can only each bestow one gift i think the best plan will be for one of you to give her beauty the other good understanding whilst i will undertake that she shall never be changed into any other form the two godmothers quite agreed and as soon as the little princess had received their gifts they went home and placida gave herself up to the child's education she succeeded so well with it and little graziella grew so lovely that when she was still quite a child her fame was spread abroad only too much and one day placida was surprised by a visit from the fairy queen who was attended by a very grave and severe-looking fairy the queen began at once 
I have been much surprised by your behavior to Mutinosa. She had insulted our whole race and deserved punishment. You might forgive your own wrongs if you choose, but not those of others. You treated her very gently while she was with you, and I come now to avenge our wrongs on her daughter. You have insured her being lovely and clever and not subject to change of form, but I shall place her in an enchanted prison, which she shall never leave till she finds herself in the arms of a lover whom she herself loves. It will be my care to prevent anything of the kind happening." The enchanted prison was a large high tower in the midst of the sea, built of shells of all shapes and colors. The lower floor was like a great bathroom, where the water was let in, or off at will. The first floor contained the princess's apartments, beautifully furnished. On the second was a library, a large wardrobe room, filled with beautiful clothes and every kind of linen. A music room, a pantry with bins full of the best wines, and a storeroom with all manner of preserves, bonbons, pastry, and cakes, all of which remained as fresh as if just out of the oven. The top of the tower was laid out like a garden, with beds of the loveliest flowers, fine fruit trees, and shady arbors and shrubs, where many birds sang amongst the branches. The fairies escorted Graziella and her governess, Bonetta, to the tower, and then mounted a dolphin, which was waiting for them. At a little distance from the tower the queen waved her wand and summoned two thousand great fierce sharks, whom she ordered to keep close guard and not to let a soul enter the tower. The good governess took such pains with Graziella's education that when she was nearly grown up she was not only most accomplished, but a very sweet, good girl. One day, as the princess was standing on a balcony, she saw the most extraordinary figure rise out of the sea. She quickly called Bonetta to ask her what it could be. It looked like some kind of man, with a bluish face and long sea-green hair. He was swimming towards the tower, but the sharks took no notice of him. It must be a merman, said Bonetta. A man, do you say? cried Graziella. Let us hurry down to the door and see him nearer. When they stood in the doorway, the merman stopped to look at the princess and made many signs of admiration. His voice was very hoarse and husky, but when he found that he was not understood, he took to signs. He carried a little basket made of osiers and filled with rare shells, which he presented to the princess. She took it with signs of thanks, but as it was getting dusk, she retired, and the merman plunged back into the sea. When they were alone, Graziella said to her governess, What a dreadful-looking creature that was! Why do those odious sharks let him come near the tower? I suppose all men are not like him. No, indeed, replied Bonetta. I suppose the sharks look on him as a sort of relation, and so did not attack him. A few days later the two ladies heard a strange sort of music, and looking out of the window there was the merman, his head crowned with water-plants, and blowing a great seashell with all his might. They went down to the tower door, and Graziella politely accepted some coral and other marine curiosities he had brought her. After this he used to come every evening and blow his shell, or dive and play antics under the princess's window. She contented herself with bowing to him from the balcony, but she would not go down to the door in spite of all his signs. Some days later he came with a person of his own kind, but of another sex. Her hair was dressed with great taste, and she had a lovely voice. This new arrival induced the ladies to go down to the door. They were surprised to find that, after trying various languages, she at last spoke to them in their own, and paid Graziella a very pretty compliment on her beauty. The mermaid noticed that the lower floor was full of water. "'Why?' cried she. "'That is just the place for us, for we can't live quite out of water.' 
So saying, she and her brother swam in and took up a position in the bathroom, the princess and her governess seating themselves on the steps which ran round the room. "'No doubt, madam,' said the mermaid, "'you have given up living on land so as to escape from crowds of lovers, but I fear that even here you cannot avoid them, for my brother is already dying of love for you, and I am sure that once you are seen in our city he will have many rivals. She then went on to explain how grieved her brother was not to be able to make himself understood, adding, I interpret for him, having been taught several languages by a fairy. Oh, then you have fairies too, asked Graziella with a sigh. Yes, we have, replied the mermaid, but if I am not mistaken, you have suffered from the fairies on earth. The princess, on this, told her entire history to the mermaid, who assured her how sorry she felt for her, but begged her not to lose courage, adding, as she took her leave, perhaps some day you may find a way out of your difficulties. The princess was delighted with this visit, and with the hopes the mermaid held out, it was something to meet someone fresh to talk to. We will make acquaintance with several of these people, she said to her governess, and I dare say they are not as hideous as the first one we saw. Anyhow, we shan't be so dreadfully lonely. Dear me, said Bonetta, how hopeful young people are, to be sure. As for me, I feel afraid of these folk. But what do you think of the lover you have captivated? Oh, I could never love him, cried the princess. I can't bear him. But perhaps, as his sister says, they are related to the fairy Marina. They may be of some use to us. The mermaid often returned, and each time she talked of her brother's love, and each time Graziella talked of her longing to escape from her prison, till at length the mermaid promised to bring the fairy Marina to see her, in hopes she might suggest something. Next day the fairy came with the mermaid and the princess received her with delight. After a little talk, she begged Graziella to show her the inside of the tower, and let her see the garden on the top. For with the help of crutches, she could manage to move about, and being a fairy could live out of water for a long time, provided she wetted her forehead now and then. Graziella gladly consented, and Bonetta stayed below with the mermaid. When they were in the garden, the fairy said, Let us lose no time, but tell me how I can be of use to you. Graziella then told all her story, and Marina replied, My dear princess, I can do nothing for you as regards dry land, for my power does not reach beyond my own element. I can only say that if you will honor my cousin by accepting his hand, you could then come and live amongst us. I could teach you in a moment to swim and dive with the best of us. I can harden your skin without spoiling its color. My cousin is one of the best matches in the sea, and I will bestow so many gifts on him that you will be quite happy. The fairy talked so well and so long that the princess was rather impressed and promised to think the matter over. Just as they were going to leave the garden, they saw a ship sailing near the tower than any other had done before. On the deck lay a young man under a splendid awning, gazing at the tower through a spyglass. But before they could see anything clearly, the ship moved away, and the two ladies parted, the fairy promising to return shortly. As soon as she was gone, Graziella told her governess what she had said. Bonetta was not at all pleased at the turn matters were taking for she did not fancy being turned into a mermaid in her old age. She thought the matter well over, and this was what she did. She was a very clever artist, and next morning she began to paint a picture of a handsome young man, with beautiful curly hair, a fine complexion, and lovely blue eyes. When it was finished, she showed it to Graziella, hoping it would show her the difference there was between a fine young man and her marine suitor. 
the princess was much struck by the picture and asked anxiously whether there could be any man so good-looking in the world bonetta assured her that there were plenty of them indeed many far handsomer i can hardly believe that cried the princess but alas if there are i don't suppose i shall ever see them or they me so what is the use oh dear how unhappy i am she spent the rest of the day gazing at the picture which certainly had the effect of spoiling all the merman's hopes or prospects after some days the fairy marina came back to hear what was decided but graziella hardly paid any attention to her and showed such dislike to the idea of the proposed marriage that the fairy went off in a regular huff without knowing it the princess had made another conquest on board the ship which had sailed so near was the handsomest prince in the world he had heard of the enchanted tower and determined to get as near it as he could he had strong glasses on board and whilst looking through them he saw the princess quite clearly and fell desperately in love with her at once he wanted to steer straight for the tower and to row off to it in a small boat but his entire crew fell at his feet and begged him not to run such a risk the captain too urged him not to attempt it you will only lead us all to certain death he said pray anchor nearer land and i will then seek a kind fairy i know who has always been most obliging to me and who will i am sure try to help your highness the prince rather unwillingly listened to reason he landed at the nearest point and sent off the captain in all haste to beg the fairy's advice and help meantime he had a tent pitched on the shore and spent all his time gazing at the tower and looking for the princess through his spyglass after a few days the captain came back bringing the fairy with him the prince was delighted to see her and paid her great attention i have heard about this matter she said and to lose no time i am going to send off a trusty pigeon to test the enchantment if there is any weak spot he is sure to find it out and get in i shall bid him bring a flower back as a sign of success and if he does so i quite hope to get you in too but asked the prince could i not send a line by the pigeon to tell the princess of my love certainly replied the fairy it would be a very good plan so the prince wrote as follows lovely princess i adore you and beg you to accept my heart and to believe there is nothing i will not do to end your misfortunes blundell this note was tied round the pigeon's neck and he flew off with it at once he flew fast till he got near the tower when a fierce wind blew so hard against him that he could not get on but he was not to be beaten but flew carefully around the top of the tower till he came to one spot which by some mistake had not been enchanted like the rest he quickly slipped into the arbor and waited for the princess before long graziella appeared alone and the pigeon at once fluttered to meet her and seemed so tame that she stopped to caress the pretty creature as she did so she saw it had a pink ribbon round its neck and tied to the ribbon was a letter she read it over several times and then wrote this answer you say you love me but i cannot promise to love you without seeing you send me your portrait by this faithful messenger if i return it to you you must give up hope but if i keep it you will know that to help me will be to help yourself Graziella. before flying back the pigeon remembered about the flower so seeing one in the princess's dress he stole it and flew away the prince was wild with joy at the pigeon's return with the note after an hour's rest the trusty little bird was sent back again carrying a miniature of the prince which by good luck he had with him on reaching the tower the pigeon found the princess in the garden she hastened to untie the ribbon and on opening the miniature case 
what was her surprise and delight to find it very like the picture her governess had painted for her she hastened to send the pigeon back and you can fancy the prince's joy when he found she had kept his portrait now said the fairy let us lose no more time i can only make you happy by changing you into a bird but i will take care to give you back your proper shape at the right time the prince was eager to start so the fairy touching him with her wand turned him into the loveliest hummingbird you ever saw at the same time letting him keep the power of speech the pigeon was told to show him the way graziella was much surprised to see a perfectly strange bird and still more so when it flew to her saying good morning sweet princess she was delighted with the pretty creature and let him perch on her finger when he said kiss kiss little birdie which she gladly did petting and stroking him all the time after a time the princess who had been up very early grew tired and as the sun was hot she went to lie down on a mossy bank in the shade of the arbor she held the pretty bird near her breast and was just falling asleep when the fairy contrived to restore the prince to his own shape so that as graziella opened her eyes she found herself in the arms of a lover whom she loved in return at the same moment her enchantment came to an end the tower began to rock and to split bonetta hurried up to the top so that she might at least perish with her dear princess just as she reached the garden the kind fairy who had helped the prince arrived with the fairy placida in a car of venetian glass drawn by six eagles come away quickly they cried the tower is about to sink the prince princess and bonetta lost no time in stepping into the car which rose in the air just as with a terrible crash the tower sank into the depths of the sea for the fairy marina and the mermen had destroyed its foundations to avenge themselves on graziella luckily their wicked plans were defeated and the good fairies took their way to the kingdom of graziella's parents they found that queen mutinosa had died some years ago but her kind husband lived on peaceably ruling his country well and happily he received his daughter with great delight and there were universal rejoicings at the return of the lovely princess the wedding took place the very next day and for many days after balls dinners tournaments concerts and all sorts of amusements went on all day and all night all the fairies were carefully invited and they came in great state and promised the young couple their protection and all sorts of good gifts prince blondel and princess graziella lived to a good old age beloved by everyone and loving each other more and more as time went on End of chapter three Chapter Four of the Grey Fairy Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by O One Two Three. The Grey Fairy Book, edited by Andrew Lang. Chapter Four. The Story of Jamil and Jamila. There was once a man whose name was Jamil, and he had a cousin who was called Jamila. They had been betrothed by their parents when they were children, and now Jamil thought that the time had come for them to be married. And he went two or three days' journey to the nearest big town to buy furniture for the new house. While he was away, Jamila and her friends set off to the neighboring woods to pick up sticks and as she gathered them she found an iron mortar lying on the ground she placed it on her bundle of sticks but the mortar would not stay still and whenever she raised a bundle to put it on her shoulders it slipped off sideways at length she saw the only way to carry the mortar was to tie it in the very middle of the bundle and had just unfastened her sticks when she heard her companions voices 
Jamila, what are you doing? It is almost dark, and if you mean to come with us, you must be quick. But Jamila only replied, You had better go back without me, for I am not going to leave my mortar behind, if I stay here till midnight. Do as you like, said the girls, and started on their walk home. The night soon fell, and at the last ray of light the mortar suddenly became an ogre, who threw Jamila on his back and carried her off into a dangerous place, distant a whole month's journey from her native town. Here he sat her into a castle, and told her not to fear, as her life was safe. Then he went back to his wife, leaving Jamila weeping over the fate that she had brought upon herself. Meanwhile, the other girls had reached home, and Jamila's mother came out to look for her daughter. What have you done with her? she asked anxiously. We had to leave her in the wood, they replied, for she had picked up an iron mortar and could not manage to carry it. So the old woman set off at once for the forest, calling to her daughter as she hurried along. Do go home, cried the townspeople, as they heard her. We will go and look for your daughter. You are only a woman, and it is a task that needs strong men. But she answered, Yes, go, but I will go with you. Perhaps it will be only her corpse that we shall find after all. She has most likely been stung by beasts, or eaten by wild beasts. The man, seeing her heart was bent on it, said no more, but told one of the girls she must come with them, and show them the place where they had left Jamila. They found a bundle of wood lying where she had dropped it, but the maiden was nowhere to be seen. Jamila! Jamila! cried they, but nobody answered. If we make a fire, perhaps she will see it, said one of the men. And they lit a fire, and then went, one this way, and one that, through the forest to look for her, whispering to each other that if she had been killed by a lion, they would be sure to find some trace of it, or if she had fallen asleep, the sound of their voices would wake her, or if a snake had bitten her, they would at least come on her corpse. All night they searched, and when morning broke, and they knew no more than before what had become of the maiden, they grew weary, and said to the mother, It is of no use, let us go home. Nothing has happened to your daughter, except that she has run away with a man. Yes, I will come, answered she. But I must first look in the river. Perhaps someone has thrown her in there. But the maiden was not in the river. For four days the father and mother waited and watched for the child to come back. And then they gave up hope, and said to each other, What is to be done? What are we to say to the man who to whom Jamila is betrothed? Let us kill a goat and bury its head in the grave. And when the man returns, we must tell him Jamila is dead. Very soon the bridegroom came back, bringing with him carpets and soft cushions for the house of his bride. And as he entered the town, Jamila's father met him, saying, Greeting to you, she is dead. At these words, the young man broke into loud cries, and it was some time before he could speak. Then he turned to one of the crowd who had gathered round him and asked, Where have they buried her? Come to the churchyard with me, answered he, and the young man went with him, carrying with him some of the beautiful things he had brought. These he laid on the grass and then began to weep afresh. All day he stayed, and at nightfall he gathered up his stuffs and carried them to his own house. But when the day dawned, he took them in his arms and returned to the grave. He remained as long as it was light, playing softly on his food, and this he did daily for six months. One morning, a man who was wandering through the desert, having lost his way, came upon a lonely castle. The sun was very hot, and the man was very tired, so he said to himself, I will rest a little in the shadow of this castle. He stretched himself out comfortably and was almost asleep when he heard a voice calling to him softly. Are we a ghost, it said, or a man? He looked up and saw a girl leaning out of the window, and he answered, 
I'm a man, and a better one, too, than your father or your grandfather. May all good luck be with you, said she. But what has brought you into this land of ogres and horrors? Does an ogre really live in this castle? asked he. Certainly he does, replied the girl. And as night is not far off, he will be here soon. So, dear friend, depart quickly, lest he return and snap you up for supper. But I am so thirsty, said the man. Be kind and give me some drink, or else I shall die. Surely, even in this desert, there must be some spring. Well, I have noticed that whenever the ogre brings back water, he always comes from that side. So if you follow the same direction, perhaps you may find some. The man jumped up at once and was about to start when the maiden spoke again. Tell me, where are you going? Why do you want to know? I have any route for you, but tell me first whether you go east or west. I travel to Damascus. Then do this for me. As you pass through our village, ask for a man called Jamil, and say to him, Jamil greets you from the castle, which lies far away, and is rocked by the wind. In my grave lies only a goat, so take heart. And the man promised, and went his way, till he came to a spring of water, and he drank a great draught, and then lay on the bank and slept quietly. When he woke up, he said to himself, the maiden did a good deed when she told me where to find water. A few hours more, and I should have been dead. So I'll do her bidding, and seek out her native town and the man for whom the message was given. For a whole month he travelled, till at last he reached the town where Jamil dwelt. And as luck would have it, there was the young man sitting before his door, with his beard unshaven and his shaggy hair hanging over his eyes. Welcome, stranger, said Janil as the man stopped. Where have you come from? I come from the waste, and go towards the east, he answered. Well, stop with us a while, and rest and eat, said Janil, and the man entered, and food was set before him, and he sat down with the father of the maiden and her brothers, and Janil. Only Janil himself was absent, squatting on the threshold. Why do you not eat too? asked the stranger. But one of the young men who is put hastily. Leave him alone, take no notice. It is only at night that he ever eats. So the stranger went out silently with his food. Suddenly one of the Jamil's brothers called out and said, Jamil, bring us some water. And the stranger remembered his message and said, Is there a man here named Jamil? I lost my way in the desert and came to a castle, and a maiden looked out of the window and be quiet, they cried, fearing that Jamil might hear. But Jamil had heard, and came forward and said, What did you see? Tell me truly, or I'll cut off your head this instant. My lord, replied the stranger, as I was wandering hot and tired through the desert, I saw near me a great castle, and I said aloud, I'll rest a little in its shadow. And a maiden looked out of the window and said, Are we ghost or a man? And I answered, I am a man, and a better one too than your father or your grandfather. And I was thirsty and asked for water. But she had none to give me, and I felt like to die. Then she told me that the ogre in whose castle she dwelt brought in water always from the same side, and that if I too went that way, most likely I should come to it. But before I started, she begged me to go to her native town, and if I meet a man called Jamil, I was to say to him, Jamila greets you from the castle which lies far away, and is rocked by the wind. In my grave lies only a goat, so take heart. Then Jamil turned to his family and said, Is this true? And is Jamila not dead at all, but simply stolen from her home? No, no, replied they. His story is a pack of lies. Jamila is really dead. Everybody knows it. That I shall see for myself, said Jamil, and snatching up a spade, hastened off to the grave where the goat's head lay buried. And they answered, Then hear what really happened. 
when you were away, she went with the other maidens to the forest to gather wood, and there she found an iron mortar, which she wished to bring home, but she could not carry it, neither would she leave it. So the maidens returned without her, and as night was come, we all set out to look for her, but found nothing, and we said, The bridegroom will be here tomorrow, and when he learns that she is lost, he will set out to seek her, and we shall lose him too. Let us kill a goat and bury it in her grave, and tell him she is dead. Now you know, so do as you will. Only if you go to seek her, take with you this man with whom she has spoken, that he may show you the way. Yes, that is the best plan, replied Jamil. So give me food, and hand me my sword, and we will set out directly. But the stranger answered, I am not going to waste a whole month in leading you to the castle. If it were only a day or two journey, I would not mind, but a month, no. Come with me then for three days, said Jamil, and put me in the right road, and I will reward you richly. Very well, replied the stranger, so let it be. For three days they travelled from sunrise to sunset. Then the stranger said, Jamil. Yes, replied he. Go straight on till you reach a spring. Then go on a little farther, and soon you will see the castle standing before you. So I will, said Jamil. Farewell, then, said the stranger, and turned back the way he had come. It was six and twenty days before Jamil caught sight of a green spot rising out of the sandy desert, and knew that the spring was near at last. He hastened his tapes, and soon was kneeling by its side, drinking thirstily of the bubbling water. Then he lay down on the cool grass and began to think. If the man was right, the castle must be somewhere about. I had better sleep here tonight, and tomorrow I shall be able to see where it is. So he slept long and peacefully. When he awoke, the sun was high, and he jumped up and washed his face and hands in the spring, before going on his journey. He had not walked far, when a castle suddenly appeared before him. To a moment before, not a trace of it could be seen. How am I to get in? he thought. I dare not knock, lest the ogre should hear me. Perhaps it would be best for me to climb up the wall, and wait to see what will happen. So he did, and after sitting on the top for about an hour, a window above him opened, and a voice said, Jamil! He looked up and at the sight of Jamila, whom he had so long believed to be dead, he began to weep. Dear cousin, she whispered, what has brought you here? My grief at losing you. Oh, go away at once. If the ogre comes back, he will kill you. I swear by your head, queen of my heart, that I have not found you only to lose you again. If I must die, well, I must. Oh, what can I do for you? Anything you like. If I let you down a cord, can you make it fast under your arms and climb up? Of course I can, said he. So Jamila lowered the cord, and Jamil tied it round him, and climbed up to her window. Then they embraced each other tenderly, and burst into tears of joy. But what shall I do when the ogre returns? asked she. Trust to me, he said. Now there is chest in the room where Jamila kept her clothes, and she made Jamil get into it and lie at the bottom, and told him to keep very still. He was only hidden just in time, for the lead was hardly closed when the ogre's heavy trade was hard on the stairs. He flung open the door, bringing man's flesh for himself, and lamb's flesh for the maiden. I smell the smell of a man, he thundered. What is he doing here? How could anyone have come to this desert place? asked the girl, and burst into tears. Do not cry, said the ogre. Perhaps a raven has dropped some scraps from his claws. Oh, yes, I was forgetting, answered C. One did drop some bones apart. Well, bound them to powder, replied the ogre, so that I may swallow it. So the maiden took some bones and bound them, and gave them to the ogre, saying, Here is the powder, swallow it. And when he had swallowed the powder, the ogre stretched himself out and went to sleep. 
In a little while the man's flesh, which the maiden was cooking for the ogre's supper, called out and said, His taste, a man lies in the kist. And the lamb's flesh answered, He is your brother and cousin of the other. And the ogre moved sleepily and asked, What did the meat say, Jamila? Only that I must be sure to add salt. Well, add salt? Yes, I have done so, said she. The ogre was soon sound asleep again, when the man's flesh called out a second time, His taste, a man lies in the kist. And the lamb's flesh answered, He is your brother and cousin of the other. What did it say, Jamila? asked the ogre. Only that I must add paper. Well, add paper. Yes, I have done so, said she. The ogre had had a long day's hunting and could not keep himself awake. In a moment his eyes were tight shut, and then the man's flesh called out for the third time. Hist, hist, a man lies in the kist. And the lamb's flesh answered, He is your brother and cousin of the other. What did it say, Zamila? asked the ogre. Only that it is ready, and that I had better take it off the fire. Then if it is ready, bring it to me, and I will eat it. So she brought it to him, and while he was eating, she supped off the lamb's flesh herself, and managed to put some aside for her cousin. When the ogre had finished, and had washed his hands, he said to Jamila, Make my bed, for I am tired. So she made his bed, and put a nice soft pillow for his head, and tucked him up. Father, she said suddenly, Well, what is it? Dear father, if you are really asleep, why are your eyes always open? Why do you ask that, Zamila? Do you want to tell treacherous you to me? No, of course not, father. How could I? And what would be the use of it? Well, why do you want to know? Because last night I woke up and saw the whole place shining a red light, which frightened me. That happens when I am fast asleep. And what is the good of the pin you always keep here so carefully? If I throw that pin in front of me, it turns into an iron mountain. And this darning needle? That becomes a sea. And this hatchet? That becomes a torn hedge, which no one can pass through. But why do you ask all these questions? I am sure you have something in your head. Oh, I just wanted to know. And how could anyone find me out here? And she began to cry. Oh, don't cry, I was only in fun, said the other. He was soon asleep again, and a yellow light shone through the castle. Come quick, called Jamil from the chest. We must fly now while the ogre is asleep. Not yet, she said. There is a yellow light shining. I don't think he is asleep. So they waited for an hour. Then Jamil whispered again, Wake up, there is no time to lose. Let me see if he is asleep, said she and she peeped in, and saw a red light shining. Then she stole back to her cousin and asked, But how are we to get out? Get the rope, and I will let you down. So she fetched the rope, the hatchet, the pin, and the needles, and said, Take them and put them in the pocket of your cloak, and be sure not to lose them. Jamil put them carefully in his pocket and tied a rope round her, and let her down over the wall. Are you safe? he asked. Yes, quiet. Then untie the rope, so that I may draw it up. And Jamila did as he was told, and in a few minutes he stood beside her. Now all this time the ogre was asleep, and had heard nothing. Then his dog came to him and said, O oh, sleeper, are you having pleasant dreams? Jamila has forsaken you and run away. The ogre got out of bed, gave the dog a kick, then went back again and slept till morning. When it grew light, he rose and called, Jamila! Jamila! But he only heard the echo of his own voice. Then he dressed himself quickly, buckled on his sword, and whistled to his dog, and followed the road which he knew the fugitives must have taken. Cousin! said Jamila suddenly, and turning round as he spoke. What is it? answered he. The ogre is coming after us. I saw him. But where is he? I don't see him. Over there. He only looks about as tall as a needle. 
Then they both began to run as fast as they could, while the ogre and his dog kept drawing always nearer. A few more steps, and he would have been by their side, when Jamila threw the darning needle behind her. In a moment it became an iron mountain between them and their enemy. We'll break it down, my dog and I, cried the ogre in a rage, and they dashed at the mountain till they had forced a path through, and came ever nearer and nearer. Cousin, said Jamila suddenly, what is it? The ogre is coming after us with his dog. You go on in front then, answered he, and they both ran on as fast as they could, while the ogre and the dog drew always nearer and nearer. They are close upon us, cried the maiden, glancing behind. You must throw the pin. So Jamil took the pin from his cloak and threw it behind him, and a dense ticket of thorns sprang up around them, which the ogre and his dog could not pass through. I will get through it somehow if I burrow underground, cried he, and very soon he and the dog were on the other side. Cousin, said Jamila, they are close to us now. Go on in front and fear nothing, replied Jamil. So she ran on a little way and then stopped. He is only a few yards away now, she said, and Jamil flung the hatchet on the ground, and it turned into a lake. I will drink, and my dog shall drink, till it is dry, shrieked the ogre, and the dog drank so much that it burst and died. But the ogre did not stop for that, and soon the whole lake was nearly dry. Then he exclaimed, Jamila, let your head become a donkey's head, and your hair far. But when it was done, Jamil looked at her in horror and said, She is really a donkey, and not a omen at all. And he left her and went home. For two days poor Jamila wandered about alone, weeping bitterly. When her cousin drew near his native town, he began to think over his conduct, and feel ashamed of himself. Perhaps by this time she has changed back to her proper shape, he said to himself. I will go and see. So he made all the haste he could, and at last he saw her seated on a rock, trying to keep off the wolves who longed to have her for dinner. He drove them off and said, Get up, dear cousin, you have had a narrow escape. Jamila stood up and answered, Bravo, my friend, you persuaded me to fly with you, and then left me helplessly to my fate. Shall I tell you the truth? asked he. Tell it. I thought you were a witch, and I was afraid of you. Did you not see me before my transformation? And did you not watch it happen under your very eyes when the ogre bewitched me? What shall I do? said Jamil. If I take you into the town, everyone will laugh and say, Is it a new kind of toy you have got? It has hands like a omen, feet like a omen, the body of a omen, but its head is at the head of an ass, and its hair is far. Well, what do you mean to do with me? asked Jamila. Better take me home to my mother by night and tell no one anything about it. So I will, said he. They waited where they were till it was nearly dark. Then Jamil brought his cousin home. Is that Jamil? asked the mother when he knocked softly. Yes, it is. And have you found her? Yes, and I have brought her to you. Oh, where is she? Let me see her, cried the mother. Here, behind me, answered Jamil. But when the poor woman caught sight of her daughter, she shrieked and exclaimed, Are you making fun of me? When did I ever give birth to an ass? Hush, said Jamil, it is not necessary to let the whole world know. And if you look at her body, you will see two scars on it. Mother, sobbed Jamila, do you really not know your own daughter? Yes, of course I know her. What are her two scars, then? On her thigh is a scar from the bite of a dog, and on her breast is the mark of a barn, where she pulled a lamp over her when she was little. Then look at me and see if I am not your daughter, said Jamila, throwing off her clothes and showing her two scars. And at the sight her mother embraced her weeping. Dear daughter, she cried, what evil fate has befallen you? It was the ogre who carried me off first and then bewitched me answered Jamila. 
But what is to be done with you? asked her mother. Hide me away and tell no one anything about me. And you, dear cousin, say nothing to the neighbors. And if they should put questions, you can make answer that I have not yet been found. So I will, replied he. Then he and her mother took her upstairs and hid her in a cupboard, where she stayed for a whole month, only going out to walk when all the world was asleep. Meanwhile, Jamil has returned to his own home, where his father and mother, his brothers and neighbors, greeted him joyfully. When did you come back? said they. And have you found Jamila? No, I searched the whole world after her and could hear nothing of her. Did you part company with the man who started with you? Yes, after three days he got so weak and useless he could not go on. It must be a month by now since he reached home again. I went on and visited every castle and looked in every house, but there were no signs of her, and so I gave it up. And answered to him, We told you before that it was no good. An ogre or an ogress must have snapped her up, and how can you expect to find her? I loved her too much to be still, he said. But his friends did not understand, and soon they spoke to him again about it. We will seek for a wife for you. There are plenty of girls prettier than Zamila. I dare say, but I don't want them. But what will you do with all the cushions and carpets and beautiful things you bought for your house? They can stay in the chests. But the moths will eat them. For a few weeks it is of no consequence. But after a year or two, they will be quite useless. And if they have to lie there ten years, I will have Jamila and her only for my wife. For a month or even two months, I will rest here quietly. Then I will go and seek her afresh. Oh, you are quite mad. You see the only maiden in the world? There are plenty of others better worth having than see. If there are, I have not seen them. And why do you make all this fuss? Every man knows his own business best. Why, it is you who are making all the fuss yourself. But Jamil turned and went into the house, for he did not want to quarrel. Three months later, a Jew, who was travelling across the desert, came to the castle and laid himself down under the wall to rest. In the evening, the ogre saw him there and said to him, Jew, what are you doing here? Have you anything to sell? I have only some clothes, answered the Jew, who was in mortal terror of the ogre. Oh, don't be afraid of me, said the ogre laughing. I shall not eat you. Indeed, I mean to go a bit of the way with you myself. I am ready, gracious sir, replied the Jew, rising to his feet. Well, go straight on till you reach a town, and in the town you will find a maiden called Jamila and a young man called Jamil. Take this mirror and this comb with you, and say to Jamila, Your father, the ogre, greets you, and begs you to look at your face in this mirror, and it will appear as it was before, and to comb your hair with this comb and it will be as for Molly. If you do not carry out my orders, I will eat you the next time we meet. Oh, I will obey you punctually, cried the Jew. After thirty days, the Jew entered the gate of the town and sat down in the first street he came to, hungry, thirsty, and very tired. Quite by chance, Jamil happened to pass by and see a man sitting there, Full in the glare of the sun, he stopped and said, Get up at once, Jew. You will have a sunstroke if you sit in such a place. Oh, good sir, replied the Jew. For a whole month I have been travelling, and I am too tired to move. Which way did you come? asked the Jamil. From out there, answered the Jew, pointing behind him. And you have been travelling for a month, you say? Well, did you see anything remarkable? Yes, good sir, I saw a castle, and lay down to rest under its shadow, and an ogre woke me, and told me to come to this town, where I should find a young man called Jamil, and a girl called Jamila. My name is Jamil. What does the ogre want with me? He gave me some presents for Jamila. How can I see her? Come with me, and you shall give them into her own hands. 
So the two went together to the house of Jamil's uncle, and Jamil led the Jew into his aunt's room. Aunt, he cried, this Jew who is with me has come from the auger, and has brought with him as presents a mirror and a comb which the auger has sent her. But it may be only some wicked trick on the part of the auger, said she. Oh, I don't think so, answered the young man. Give her the things. Then the maiden was called. She came out of her hiding place, and went up to the Jew, saying, Where have you come from, Jew? From your father, the auger. And what errand did he send you on? He told me I was to give you this mirror and this comb, and to say, Look in this mirror, and comb your hair with this comb, and both will become as they were formerly. And Jamila took the mirror and looked into it, and combed her hair with the comb. And she had no longer an ass's head, but the face of a beautiful maiden. Great was the joy of both mother and cousin at this wonderful sight, and the news that Jamila had returned soon spread, and the neighbors came flocking in with greetings. When did you come back? My cousin brought me. Why, he told us he could not find you. Oh, I did that on purpose, answered Jamil. I did not want everyone to know. Then he turned to his father and his mother, his brothers and his sisters-in-law, and said, We must set to work at once, for the wedding will be today. A beautiful litter was prepared to carry the bride to her new home. But she shrank back, saying, I am afraid, lest the ogre should carry me off again. How can the ogre get at you when we are all here? They said. There are two thousand of us all told, and every man has his sword. He will manage it somehow, answered Jamila. He is a powerful king. She is right, said an old man. Take away the litter, and let her go on foot if she is afraid. But it is absurd, exclaimed the rest. How can the ogre get hold of her? I will not go, said Jamila again. You do not know that monster. I do. And while they were disputing, the bridegroom arrived. Let her alone. She shall stay in her father's house. After all, I can live here, and the wedding feast shall be made ready. And so they were married at last, and died without having had a single quarrel. Marahan und Gettis aus der Stadtropolis End of Chapter 4《ชั่ e ต์เรื่องของชีวิตของเด็กผู้ชายและผู้หญิงที่มีชื่อเสียงในชื่อเสียงในสื่อสารของชีวิตของเด็กผู้ชายและผู้หญิงที่มีชื่อเสียงในสื่อสารของชีวิตของเด็กผู้ชายและผู้หญิงที่มีชื่อเสียงในสื่อสารของชีวิตของเด็กผู้ชายและผู้หญิงที่มีชื่อเสียงในสื่อสารของชีวิตของเด็กผู้ชายและผู้หญิง And lived in the wilderness, he owned nothing but a flock of sheep whose milk and wool he sold, and so procured himself bread to eat. He also carried wooden spoons and sold them. He had a wife and one little girl, and after a long time, his wife had another child. The evening it was born, the man went to the nearest village to fetch a nurse, and on the way he met a monk who begged him for a night's lodging. This the man willingly granted and took him home with him. There being no one far nor near to baptize the child, the man asked the monk to do him this service, and the child was given the name Johnny. In the course of time, Johnny's parents died, and he and his sister were left alone in the world. Soon affairs went badly with them, so they determined to wander away to seek their fortune. In packing up, the sister found a knife which the monk had left for his godson, and this she gave to her brother. Then they went on their way, taking with them the three sheep which were all that remained of their flocks. After wandering for three days, they met a man with three dogs, who proposed that they should exchange animals, he taking the sheep and they the dogs. The brother and sister were quite pleased at this arrangement, And after the exchange was made, 
they separated and went their different ways. Johnny and his sister, in the course of time, came to a great castle, in which dwelt forty draken, who, when they heard that Johnny had come, fled forty fathoms underground. So Johnny found the castle deserted and abode there with his sister, and every day went out to hunt with the weapons the draken had left in the castle. One day, when he was away hunting, one of the draken came up to get provisions, not knowing that there was anyone in the castle. When he saw Johnny's sister, he was terrified, but she told him not to be afraid, and by and by they fell in love with each other. For every time that Johnny went to hunt, the sister called the Dracos up. Thus they went on making love to each other, till at length, unknown to Johnny, they got married. Then, when it was too late, the sister repented, and was afraid of Johnny's wrath when he found it out. One day the Dracos came to her and said, You must pretend to be ill, and when Johnny asks what ails you and what you want, you must answer, Cherries. And when he inquires where these are to be found, you must say, There are some in a garden a day's journey from here. Then your brother will go there and will never come back, for there dwell three of my brothers who will look after him well. Then the sister did as the Dracos advised, and next day Johnny set out to fetch the cherries, taking his three dogs with him. When he came to the garden where the cherries grew, he jumped off his horse, drank some water from the spring which rose there, and fell directly into a deep sleep. The draken came round about to eat him, but the dogs flung themselves on them and tore them in pieces, and scratched a grave in the ground with their paws, and buried the draken so that Johnny might not see their dead bodies. When Johnny awoke and saw his dogs all covered with blood, he believed that they had caught somewhere a wild beast, and was angry because they had left none of it for him. But he plucked the cherries and took them back to his sister. When the Dracos heard that Johnny had come back, he fled for fear forty fathoms underground, and the sister ate the cherries and declared herself well again. The next day, when Johnny was gone to hunt, the Dracos came out and advised the sister that she should pretend to be ill again and when her brother asked her what she would like, she should answer, Quinces. And when he inquired where these were to be found, she should say, In a garden, distant about two days' journey. Then would Johnny certainly be destroyed, for there dwelt six brothers of the Dracos, each of whom had two heads. The sister did as she was advised, and next day Johnny again set off, taking his three dogs with him. When he came to the garden he dismounted, sat down to rest a little, and fell fast asleep. First there came three draken round him to eat him, and when these three had been worried by the dogs, there came three others who were worried in like manner. Then the dogs again dug a grave and buried the dead draken, that their master might not see them. When Johnny awoke and beheld the dogs all covered with blood, he thought, as before, that they had killed a wild beast, and was again angry with them for leaving him nothing. But he took the quinces and brought them back to his sister, who, when she had eaten them, declared herself better. The Dracos, when he heard that Johnny had come back, fled for fear forty fathoms deeper underground. Next day, when Johnny was hunting, the Dracos went to the sister and advised that she should again pretend to be ill, and should beg for some pears, which grew in a garden three days' journey from the castle. From this quest Johnny would certainly never return, for there dwelt nine brothers of the Dracos, each of whom had three heads. The sister did as she was told, and next day Johnny, taking his three dogs with him, went to get the pears. When he came to the garden, he laid himself down to rest, and soon fell asleep. 
Then first came three draken to eat him, and when the dogs had worried these, six others came and fought the dogs a long time. The noise of this combat awoke Johnny, and he slew the draken, and knew at last why the dogs were covered with blood. After that he freed all whom the draken held prisoners, amongst others a king's daughter. Out of gratitude she would have taken him for her husband, but he put her off, saying, For the kindness I have been able to do to you, you shall receive in this castle all the blind and lame who pass this way. The princess promised him to do so, and on his departure gave him a ring. So Johnny plucked the pears and took them to his sister, who, when she had eaten them, declared she felt better. When, however, the Dracos heard that Johnny had come back yet a third time safe and sound, he fled for fright, forty fathoms deeper underground. And next day, when Johnny was away hunting, he crept out and said to the sister, Now we are indeed both lost, unless you find out from him wherein his strength lies, and then between us we will contrive to do away with him. When, therefore, Johnny had come back from hunting and sat at evening with his sister by the fire, she begged him to tell her wherein lay his strength, and he answered, It lies in my two fingers. If these are bound together, then all my strength disappears. That I will not believe, said the sister, unless I see it for myself. Then he let her tie his fingers together with a thread and immediately he became powerless. Then the sister called up the Dracos, who, when he had come forth, tore out Johnny's eyes, gave them to his dogs to eat, and threw him into a dry well. Now it happened that some travelers going to draw water from this well heard Johnny groaning at the bottom. They came near and asked him where he was, and he begged them to draw him up from the well, for he was a poor, unfortunate man. The travelers let a rope down and drew him up to daylight. It was not till then that he first became aware that he was blind, and he begged the travelers to lead him to the country of the king whose daughter he had freed, and they would be well repaid for their trouble. When they had brought him there, he sent to beg the princess to come to him. But she did not recognize him till he had shown her the ring she had given him. Then she remembered him and took him with her into the castle. When she learnt what had befallen him, she called together all the sorceresses in the country in order that they should tell her where the eyes were. At last she found one who declared that she knew where they were and that she could restore them. This sorceress then went straight to the castle where dwelt the sister and the Dracos and gave something to the dogs to eat, which caused the eyes to reappear. She then took them with her and put them back in Johnny's head, so that he saw as well as before. Then he returned to the castle of the Dracos, whom he slew as well as his sister, and, taking his dogs with him, went back to the princess, and they were immediately married. End of chapter 5 Recording by Joseph Lawler Chapter 6 of The Grave Fairy Book This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pete Williams The Grave Fairy Book Edited by Andrew Lang The Partnership of the Thief and the Liar There was once upon a time a thief, who, being out of a job, was wandering by himself up and down the seashore. As he walked, he passed a man who was standing still, looking at the waves. "'I wonder,' said the thief, addressing the stranger, "'if you have ever seen a stone swimming.' "'Most certainly I have,' replied the other man, "'and what is more, I saw the same stone jump out of the water and fly through the air.' "'This is capital,' replied the thief. 
you and I must go into a partnership. We shall certainly make our fortunes. Let us start together for the palace of the king of the neighboring country. When we get there, I will go into his presence alone, and will tell him the most startling thing I can invent. Then you must follow, and back up my lie. Having agreed to do this, they set out on their travels. After several days' journeying, they reached the town where the king's palace was, and here they parted for a few hours, while the thief sought an interview with the king, and begged his majesty to give him a glass of beer. "'That is impossible,' said the king, "'as this year there has been a failure of all the crops, and of the hops and the vines. So we have neither wine nor beer in the whole kingdom.' "'How extraordinary,' answered the thief. I have just come from a country where the crops were so fine that I saw twelve barrels of beer made out of one branch of hops. I bet you three hundred florins that is not true, answered the king. And I bet you three hundred florins it is true, replied the thief. Then each staked his three hundred florins, and the king said he would decide the question by sending a servant into that country to see if it was true. So the servant set out on horseback, and on the way he met a man, and he asked him whence he came, and the man told him that he came from the selfsame country to which the servant was at that moment bound. "'If that is the case,' said the servant, "'you can tell me how high the hops grow in your country, and how many barrels of beer can be brewed from one branch.' "'I can't tell you that,' answered the man, "'but I happened to be present when the hops were being gathered in.' and I saw that it took three men with axes three days to cut down one branch. Then the servant thought that he might save himself a long journey, so he gave the man ten florins, and told him he must repeat to the king what he had just told him. And when they got back to the palace, they came together into the king's presence, and the king asked him, "'Well, is it true about the hops?' "'Yes, sire, it is,' answered the servant, "'and here is a man I have brought with me from the country to confirm the tale.' So the king paid the thief the three hundred florins, and the partners once more set out together in search of adventures. As they journeyed, the thief said to his comrade, "'I will now go to another king, and will tell him something still more startling, and you must follow and back up my lie, and we shall get some money out of him. Just see if we don't. When they reached the next kingdom, the thief presented himself to the king, and requested him to give him a cauliflower. And the king answered, Owing to a blight among the vegetables, we have no cauliflower. That is strange, answered the thief. I have just come from a country where it grows so well that one head of cauliflower filled twelve water tubs. I don't believe it, answered the king. I bet you six hundred florins it is true, replied the thief. And I bet you six hundred florins it is not true, answered the king. And he sent for a servant, and ordered him to start at once for the country whence the thief had come, to find out if his story of the cauliflower was true. On his journey the servant met with a man. Stopping his horse, he asked him where he came from, and the man replied that he came from the country to which the other was traveling. If this is the case, said the servant, you can tell me to what size cauliflower grows in your country. Is it so large that one head fills twelve water tubs? I have not seen that, answered the man, but I saw twelve wagons, drawn by twelve horses carrying one head of cauliflower to the market. And the servant answered, Here are ten florins for you, my man, for you have saved me a long journey. Come with me now, and tell the king what you have just told me. All right, said the man, and they went together to the palace, and when the king asked the servant if he had found out the truth about the cauliflower, the servant replied, Sire, all that you heard was perfectly true. Here is a man from the country who will tell you so. So the king had to pay the thief the six hundred florins, and the two partners set out once more on their travels with their nine hundred florins. When they reached the country of the neighboring king, the thief entered the royal presence, and began conversation by asking if his majesty knew that in an adjacent kingdom there was a town with a church steeple on which a bird had alighted, 
and that the steeple was so high and the bird's beak so long that it had pecked the stars till some of them fell out of the sky i do not believe it said the king nevertheless i am prepared to bet twelve hundred florins that it is true answered the thief and i bet twelve hundred florins that it is a lie replied the king and he straightway sent a servant into the neighboring country to find out the truth as he rode the servant met a man coming in the opposite direction so he hailed him and asked him where he came from and the man replied that he came out of the very town to which the man was bound then the servant asked him if the story they had heard about the bird with the long beak was true i don't know about that answered the man as i have never seen the bird but i once saw twelve men shoving all their might and main with brooms to push a monster egg into a cellar this is capital answered the servant presenting the man with ten florins come and tell your tale to the king and he will save me a long journey so when the story was repeated to the king there was nothing for him to do but pay the thief the twelve hundred florins then the two partners set out again with their ill-gotten gains which they proceeded to divide into two equal shares but the thief kept back three of the florins that belonged to the liar's half of the booty shortly afterwards they each married and settled down in homes of their own with their wives one day the liar discovered that he had been done out of three florins by his partner so he went to his house and demanded them from him come next sunday and i will give them to you answered the thief but as he had no intention of giving the liar the money when saturday morning came he stretched himself out stiff and stark upon the bed and told his wife she was to say he was dead so the wife rubbed her eyes with an onion and when the liar appeared at the door she met him in tears and told him that as her husband was dead he could not be paid the three florins but the liar who knew his partner's tricks instantly suspected the truth and said as he has not paid me i will pay him out with three good lashes of my riding whip at these words the thief sprang to his feet and appearing at the door promised his partner that if he would return the following saturday he would pay him so the liar went away satisfied with this promise but when saturday morning came the thief got up early and hid himself under a truss of hay in the hayloft when the liar appeared to demand his three florins the wife met him with tears in her eyes and told him that her husband was dead where have you buried him asked the liar in the hayloft answered the wife then i will go there and take away some hay in payment of his debt said the liar and proceeding to the hayloft he began to toss about the hay with a pitchfork prodding it into the trusses of hay till in terror of his life the thief crept out and promised his partner to pay him the three florins on the following saturday when the day came he got up at sunrise and going down into the crypt of a neighboring chapel stretched himself out quite still and stiff in an old stone coffin but the liar who was quite as clever as his partner very soon bethought him of the crypt and set out for the chapel confident that he would shortly discover the hiding place of his friend he had just entered the crypt and his eyes were not yet accustomed to the darkness when he heard the sound of whispering at the grated windows listening intently he overheard the plotting of a band of robbers who had brought their treasure to the crypt meaning to hide it there while they set out on fresh adventures all the time they were speaking they were removing the bars from the window and in another minute they would all have entered the crypt and discovered the liar quick as thought he wound his mantle round him and placed himself standing stiff and erect in a niche in the wall so that in the dim light he looked just like an old stone statue as soon as the robbers entered the crypt they set about the work of dividing their treasure now there were twelve robbers but by mistake the chief of the band divided the gold into thirteen heaps when he saw his mistake he said they had not time to count it all over again but that the thirteenth heap 
should belong to whosoever among them could strike off the head of the old stone statue in the niche with one stroke. With these words he took up an axe and approached the niche where the liar was standing. But, just as he had waved the axe over his head, ready to strike, a voice was heard from the stone coffin saying in sepulchral tones, Clear out of this, or the dead will arise from their coffins, and the statues will descend from the walls, and you will be driven out more dead than alive. And with a bound, the thief jumped out of his coffin, and the liar from his niche, and the robbers were so terrified that they ran helter-skelter out of the crypt, leaving all their gold behind them, and vowing that they would never put foot inside the haunted place again. So the partners divided the gold between them, and carried it to their homes. And history tells us no more about them. End of chapter 6 Recording by Pete Williams, Pittsburgh, PA Chapter 7 of The Grey Fairy Book This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Grey Fairy Book Edited by Andrew Lang Chapter 7 Fortunatus and His Purse Once upon a time there lived in the city of Famagasta, in the island of Cyprus, a rich man called Theodorus. He ought to have been the happiest person in the whole world, as he had all he could wish for, and a wife and little son whom he loved dearly. But unluckily, after a short time, he always grew tired of everything, and had to seek new pleasures. When people are made like this, the end is generally the same, and before Fortunatus, for that was the boy's name, was ten years old, his father had spent all his money and had not a farthing left. But though Theodorus had been so foolish, he was not quite without sense, and set about getting work at once. His wife, too, instead of reproaching him, sent away the servants and sold their fine horses, and did all the work of the house herself, even washing the clothes of her husband and child. Thus time passed, till Fortunatus was sixteen. One day, when they were sitting at supper, the boy said to Theodorus, Father, why do you look so sad? Tell me what is wrong, and perhaps I can help you. Ah, my son, I have reason enough to be sad. But for me, you would now have been enjoying every kind of pleasure, instead of being buried in this tiny house. Oh, do not let that trouble you, replied Fortunatus. It is time I made some money for myself. To be sure, I have never been taught any trade. Still, there must be something I can do. I will go and walk on the seashore and think about it. Very soon, sooner than he expected, a chance came and Fortunatus, like a wise boy, seized on it at once. The post offered him was that of page to the Earl of Flanders, and as the Earl's daughter was just going to be married, splendid festivities were held in her honor, and at some of the tilting matches Fortunatus was lucky enough to win the prize. These prizes, together with presents from the lords and ladies of the court, who liked him for his pleasant ways, made Fortunatus feel quite a rich man. But though his head was not turned by the notice taken of him, it excited the envy of some of the other pages about the court, and one of them, called Robert, invented a plot to move Fortunatus out of his way. So he told the young man that the earl had taken a dislike to him and meant to kill him. Fortunatus believed the story, and packing up his fine clothes and money, slipped away before dawn. He went to a great many big towns and lived well, and as he was generous, and not wiser than most youths of his age, he very soon found himself penniless. Like his father, he then began to think of work, and tramped half over Brittany in search of it. Nobody seemed to want him, and he wandered about from one place to another, till he found himself in a dense wood, without any paths, and not much light. Here he spent two whole days, with nothing to eat, and very little water to drink, going first in one direction, and then in another, but never being able to find his way out. During the first night he slept soundly, and was too tired to fear either man or beast, but when darkness came on for the second time, and growls were heard in the distance, he grew frightened, and looked about for a high tree out of reach of his enemies. Hardly had he settled himself comfortably in one of the forked branches, when a lion walked up to a spring that burst from a rock close to the tree, and crouching down, drank greedily. This was bad enough, 
but after all lions do not climb trees and as long as fortunatus stayed up on his perch he was quite safe but no sooner was the lion out of sight than his place was taken by a bear and bears as fortunatus knew very well are tree climbers his heart beat fast and not without reason for as the bear turned away he looked up and saw fortunatus now in those days every young man carried a sword slung to his belt and it was a fashion that came in very handily for fortunatus he drew his sword and when the bear got within a yard of him he made a fierce lunge forward the bear wild with pain tried to spring but the bough he was standing on broke with his weight and he fell heavily to the ground then fortunatus descended from his tree first taking good care to see no other wild animals were in sight and killed him with a single blow he was just thinking he would light a fire and make a hearty dinner off bear's flesh which is not at all bad eating when he beheld a beautiful lady standing by his side, leaning on a wheel, and her eyes hidden by a bandage. I am Dame Fortune, she said, and I have a gift for you. Shall it be wisdom, strength, long life, riches, health, or beauty? Think well, and tell me what you will have. But Fortunatus, who had proved the truth of the proverb that it's ill thinking on an empty stomach, answered quickly, Good lady, let me have riches in such plenty that I may never again be as hungry as I am now. And the lady held out a purse, and told him he had only to put his hand into it, and he and his children would always find ten pieces of gold. But when they were dead, it would be a magic purse no longer. At this news, Fortunatus was beside himself with joy, and could hardly find words to thank the lady. But she told him that the best thing he could do was to find his way out of the wood, and before bidding him farewell, pointed out which path he should take. He walked along it as fast as his weakness would let him, until a welcome light at a little distance showed him that a house was near. It turned out to be an inn, but before entering, Fortunatus thought he had better make sure of the truth of what the lady had told him, and took out the purse and looked inside. Sure enough, there were the ten pieces of gold, shining brightly. Then Fortunatus walked boldly up to the inn, and ordered them to get ready a good supper at once, as he was very hungry and to bring him the best wine in the house. And he seemed to care so little what he spent that everybody thought he was a great lord, and vied with each other who should run quickest when he called. After a night passed in a soft bed, Fortunatus felt so much better that he asked the landlord if he could find him some men-servants, and tell them where any good horses were to be got. The next thing was to provide himself with smart clothes, and then to take a big house where he could give great feasts to the nobles and beautiful ladies who lived in palaces round about. In this manner a whole year soon slipped away, and Fortunatus was so busy amusing himself that he never once remembered his parents, whom he had left behind in Cyprus. But though he was thoughtless, he was not bad-hearted. As soon as their existence crossed his mind, he set about making preparations to visit them, and as he was not fond of being alone, he looked round for someone older and wiser than himself to travel with him. It was not long before he had the good luck to come across an old man who had left his wife and children in a far country many years before, when he went out into the world to seek the fortune which he never found. He agreed to accompany Fortunatus back to Cyprus, but only on condition he should first be allowed to return for a few weeks to his own home, before venturing to set sail for an island so strange and distant. Fortunatus agreed to his proposal, and as he was always fond of anything new, said that he would go with them. The journey was long, and they had to cross many large rivers, and climb over high mountains, and find their way through thick woods, before they reached at length the old man's castle. His wife and children had almost given up hopes of seeing him again, and crowded eagerly round him. Indeed, it did not take Fortunatus five minutes to fall in love with the youngest daughter, the most beautiful creature in the whole world whose name was Cassandra. Give her to me for my wife, he said to the old man, and let us all go together to Famagasta. So a ship was bought, big enough to hold Fortunatus, the old man and his wife, and their ten children, five of them sons and five daughters, and the day before they sailed, the wedding was celebrated with magnificent rejoicings, and everybody thought that Fortunatus must certainly be a prince in disguise, but when they reached Cyprus, he learned to his sorrow that both his father and mother were dead and for some time he shut himself up in his house and would see nobody, full of shame at having forgotten them all these years. Then he begged that the old man and his wife would remain with him and take the place of his parents. 
For twelve years, Fortunatus and Cassandra and their two little boys lived happily in Famagosta. They had a beautiful house, and everything they could possibly want, and when Cassandra's sisters married, the purse provided them each with a fortune. But at last, Fortunatus grew tired of staying at home, and thought he should like to go out and see the world again. Cassandra shed many tears at first when he told her of his wishes, and he had a great deal of trouble to persuade her to give her consent. But on his promising to return at the end of two years, she agreed to let him go. Before he went away, he showed her three chests of gold, which stood in a room with an iron door and walls twelve feet thick. If anything should happen to me, he said, and I should never come back, keep one of the chests for yourself, and give the others to our two sons. Then he embraced them all, and took ship for Alexandria. The wind was fair, and in a few days they entered the harbor, where Fortunatus was informed by a man whom he met on landing, that if he wished to be well received in the town, he must begin by making a handsome present to the sultan. That is easily done, said Fortunatus, and went into a goldsmith's shop, where he bought a large gold cup, which cost five thousand pounds. This gift so pleased the sultan that he ordered a hundred casks of spices to be given to Fortunatus. Fortunatus put them on board his ship, and commanded the captain to return to Cyprus and deliver them to his wife, Cassandra. He next obtained an audience of the sultan, and begged permission to travel through the country, which the sultan readily gave him adding some letters to the rulers of other lands, which Fortunatus might wish to visit. Filled with delight at feeling himself free to roam through the world once more, Fortunatus set out on his journey without losing a day. From court to court he went, astonishing everyone by the magnificence of his dress and the splendor of his presence. At length he grew as tired of wandering as he had been of staying at home, and returned to Alexandria, where he found the same ship that had brought him from Cyprus lying in the harbor, of course, the first thing he did was to pay his respects to the sultan, who was eager to hear about his adventures. When Fortunatus had told them all, the sultan observed, Well, you have seen many wonderful things, but I have something to show you more wonderful still. And he led him into a room where precious stones lay heaped against the walls. Fortunatus's eyes were quite dazzled, but the sultan went on without pausing, and opened a door at the farther end. As far as Fortunatus could see, the cupboard was quite bare except for a little red cap, such as soldiers wear in Turkey. Look at this, said the sultan. But there is nothing very valuable about it, answered Fortunatus. I've seen a dozen better caps than that this very day. Ah, said the sultan, you do not know what you are talking about. Whoever puts this cap on his head and wishes himself in any place will find himself there in a moment. But who made it? asked Fortunatus. That I cannot tell you, replied the sultan. Is it very heavy to wear? asked Fortunatus. No, quite light, replied the sultan. Just feel it. Fortunatus took the cap and put it on his head, and then, without thinking, wished himself back in the ship that was starting for Famagasta. In a second he was standing at the prow while the anchor was being weighed, and while the sultan was repenting of his folly in allowing Fortunatus to try on the cap, the vessel was making fast for Cyprus. When it arrived, Fortunatus found his wife and children well, but the two old people were dead and buried. His sons had grown tall and strong, but unlike their father, had no wish to see the world, and found their chief pleasure in hunting and tilting. In the main, Fortunatus was content to stay quietly at home, and if a restless fit did seize upon him, he was able to go away for a few hours without being missed, thanks to the cap, which he never sent back to the sultan. By and by, he grew old and feeling that he had not many days to live, he sent for his two sons, and showing them the purse and cap, he said to them, Never part with these precious possessions. They are worth more than all the gold and lands I leave behind me. But never tell their secret, even to your wife or dearest friend. That purse has served me well for forty years, and no one knows whence I got my riches. Then he died, and was buried by his wife Cassandra, and he was mourned in Famagasta for many years. End of chapter 7Chapter 8 of The Grave Fairy Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pete Williams. The Grave Fairy Book. Edited by Andrew Lang. The Goat Faced Girl. 
There was once upon a time a peasant called Massaniello, who had twelve daughters. They were exactly like the steps of a staircase, for there was just a year between each sister. It was all the poor man could do to bring up such a large family, and in order to provide food for them he used to dig in the fields all day long. In spite of his hard work, he only just succeeded in keeping the wolf from the door, and the poor little girls often went hungry to bed. One day, when Massaniello was working at the foot of a high mountain, he came upon the mouth of a cave, which was so dark and gloomy that even the sun seemed afraid to enter it. Suddenly, a huge green lizard appeared from the inside and stood before Massaniello, who nearly went out of his mind with terror, for the beast was as big as a crocodile and quite as fierce-looking. But the lizard sat down beside him in the most friendly manner and said, "'Don't be afraid, my good man. I am not going to hurt you. On the contrary, I am most anxious to help you.' When the peasant heard these words, he knelt before the lizard and said, "'Dear lady, for I know not what to call you, I am in your power. But I beg of you to be merciful, for I have twelve wretched little daughters at home who are dependent on me.' "'That's the very reason why I have come to you,' replied the lizard. "'Bring me your youngest daughter to-morrow morning. I promise to bring her up as if she were my own child.' and to look upon her as the apple of my eye. When Massaniello heard her words he was very unhappy because he felt sure, from the lizards wanting one of his daughters, the youngest and tenderest too, that the poor little girl would only serve as dessert for the terrible creature's supper. At the same time he said to himself, If I refuse her request, she will certainly eat me up on the spot. If I give her what she asks, she does indeed take part of myself, but if I refuse, she will take the whole of me. What am I to do, and how in the world am I to get out of this difficulty? As he kept muttering to himself, the lizard said, Make up your mind to do as I tell you at once. I desire to have your youngest daughter, and if you won't comply with my wish, I can only say it will be the worse for you. Seeing that there was nothing else to be done, Massaniello set off for his home, and arrived there looking so white and wretched that his wife asked him at once, "'What has happened to you, my dear husband? Have you quarrelled with any one, or has the poor donkey fallen down?' "'Neither the one nor the other,' answered her husband. "'But something far worse than either. A terrible lizard has nearly frightened me out of my senses, for she threatened that if I did not give her our youngest daughter, she would make me repent it.' My head is going round like a mill-wheel, and I don't know what to do. I am indeed between the devil and the deep sea. You know how dearly I love Renzala, and yet if I fail to bring her to the lizard to-morrow morning I must say farewell to life. Do advise me what to do. When his wife had heard all he had to say, she said to him, How do you know, my dear husband, that the lizard is really our enemy? May she not be a friend in disguise? and your meeting with her may be the beginning of better things and the end of all our misery. Therefore go and take the child to her, for my heart tells me that you will never repent doing so. Massaniello was much comforted by her words, and next morning, as soon as it was light, he took his little daughter by the hand and led her to the cave. The lizard, who was awaiting the peasant's arrival, came forward to meet him, and taking the girl by the hand, she gave the father a sack full of gold, and said, Go and marry your other daughters, and give them dowries with this gold, and be of good cheer, for Renzala will have both father and mother in me. It is a great piece of luck for her that she has fallen into my hands. Masaniello, quite overcome with gratitude, thanked the lizard and returned home to his wife. As soon as it was known how rich the peasant had become, suitors for the hands of his daughters were not wanting, and very soon he married them all off. And even then there was enough gold left to keep himself and his wife in comfort and plenty all their days. 
as soon as the lizard was left alone with renzala she changed the cave into a beautiful palace and led the girl inside here she brought her up like a little princess and the girl wanted for nothing she gave her sumptuous food to eat beautiful clothes to wear and a thousand servants to wait on her now it happened one day that the king of the country was hunting in a wood close to the palace and was overtaken by the dark seeing a light shining in the palace he sent one of his servants to ask if he could get a night's lodging there when the page knocked at the door the lizard changed herself into a beautiful woman and opened it herself when she heard the king's request she sent him a message to say that she would be delighted to see him and give him all he wanted the king on hearing this kind invitation instantly betook himself to the palace where he was received in the most hospitable manner a hundred pages with torches came to meet him a hundred more waited on him at table and another hundred waved big fans in the air to keep the flies from him renzala herself poured out the wine for him and so gracefully did she do it that his majesty could not take his eyes off her when the meal was finished and the table cleared the king retired to sleep and renzala drew the shoes from his feet at the same time drawing his heart from his breast so desperately had he fallen in love with her that he called the fairy to him and asked her for renzala's hand in marriage as the kind fairy had only the girl's welfare at heart she willingly gave her consent and not her consent only but a wedding portion of seven thousand gold guineas the king full of delight over his good fortune prepared to take his departure accompanied by renzala who never so much as thanked the fairy for all she had done for her when the fairy saw such a base want of gratitude she determined to punish the girl and cursing her she turned her face into a goat's head in a moment renzala's pretty mouth stretched out into a snout with a beard a yard long at the end of it her cheeks sank in and her shining plates of hair changed into two sharp horns when the king turned round and saw her he thought he must have taken leave of his senses he burst into tears and cried out where is the hair that bound me so tightly where are the eyes that pierced through my heart and where are the lips i kissed am i to be tied to a goat all my life no no nothing will induce me to become the laughing-stock of my subjects for the sake of a goat-faced girl when they reached his own country he shut renzala up in a little turret chamber of his palace with a waiting maid and gave each of them ten bundles of flax to spin telling them that their task must be finished by the end of the week the maid obedient to the king's commands set at once to work and combed out the flax wound it round the spindle and sat spinning at her wheel so diligently that her work was quite done by saturday evening but renzala who had been spoilt and petted in the fairy's house and was quite unaware of the change that had taken place in her appearance threw the flax out the window and said what is the king thinking of that he should give me this work to do if he wants shirts he can buy them it isn't even as if he had picked me out of the gutter for he ought to remember that i brought him seven thousand golden guineas as my wedding portion and that i am his wife and not his slave he must be mad to treat me like this all the same when saturday evening came and she saw that the waiting maid had finished her task she took fright lest she should be punished for her idleness so she hurried off to the palace of the fairy and confided all her woes to her the fairy embraced her tenderly and gave her a sack full of spun flax in order that she might show it to the king and let him see what a good worker she was renzala took the sack without one word of thanks and returned to the palace leaving the kind fairy very indignant over her want of gratitude when the king saw the flax all spun he gave renzala and the waiting maid each a little dog and told them to look after the animals and train them carefully the waiting maid brought hers up with the greatest possible care and treated it almost as if it were her son but renzala said i don't know what to think have i come among a lot of lunatics does the king imagine that i am going to comb and feed a dog with my own hands 
With these words she opened the window and threw the poor little beast out, and he fell on the ground as dead as a stone. When a few months had passed, the king sent a message to say he would like to see how the dogs were getting on. Renzala, who felt very uncomfortable in her mind at this request, hurried off once more to the fairy. This time she found an old man at the door of the fairy's palace, who said to her, "'Who are you, and what do you want?' When Renzala heard his question, she answered angrily, "'Don't you know me, old Goatbeard? And how dare you address me in such a way?' "'The pot can't call the kettle black,' answered the old man, "'for it is not I, but you, who have a goat's head. Just wait a minute, you ungrateful wretch, and I will show you to what a pass your want of gratitude has brought you.' With these words he hurried away and returned with a mirror, which he held up before Renzala. At the sight of her ugly, hairy face, the girl nearly fainted with horror, and she broke into loud sobs at seeing her countenance so changed. Then the old man said, You must remember, Renzala, that you are a peasant's daughter, and that the fairy turned you into a queen. But you were ungrateful, and never as much as thanked her for all she had done for you. Therefore she is determined to punish you. But if you wish to lose your long white beard, Throw yourself at the fairy's feet, and implore her to forgive you. She has a tender heart, and will, perhaps, take pity on you." Renzala, who was really sorry for her conduct, took the old man's advice, and the fairy not only gave her back her former face, but she dressed her in a gold-embroidered dress, presented her with a beautiful carriage, and brought her back, accompanied by a host of servants, to her husband. When the king saw her looking as beautiful as ever, he fell in love with her once more, and bitterly repented having caused her so much suffering. So Renzala lived happily ever afterwards, for she loved her husband, honored the fairy, and was grateful to the old man for having told her the truth. End of chapter 8 Recording by Pete Williams, Pittsburgh, PA Chapter 9 of The Grey Fairy Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Grey Fairy Book by Andrew Lang. Chapter 9 What Came of Picking Flowers. Read by Sean Randall. What Came of Picking Flowers. There was once a woman who had three daughters whom she loved very much. One day the eldest was walking in a water meadow, when she saw a pink growing in the stream. She stooped to pick the flower, but her hand had scarcely touched it, when she vanished altogether. The next morning the second sister went out into the meadow, to see if she could find any traces of the lost girl, and, as a branch of lovely roses lay trailing across her path, she bent down to move it away and in so doing could not resist plucking one of the roses. In a moment she too had disappeared. Wondering what could have become of her two sisters, the youngest followed in their footsteps, and fell a victim to a branch of delicious jessamine. So the old woman was left without any daughters at all. She wept, and wept, and wept, all day and all night, and went on weeping so long that her son, who had been a little boy when his sisters disappeared, grew up to be a tall youth. Then, one night, he asked his mother to tell him what was the matter. When he had heard the whole story, he said, "'Give me your blessing, mother, and I will go and search the world till I find them.' So he set forth, and, after he had travelled several miles without any adventures, he came upon three big boys fighting in the road. He stopped and inquired what they were fighting about, and one of them answered, "'My lord, our father left to us when he died a pair of boots, a key, and a cap.' Whoever puts on the boots and wishes himself in any place will find himself there. The key will open every door in the world, and, with the cap on your head, no one can see you. Now our eldest brother wants to have all three things for himself, and we wish to draw lots for them. Oh, that is easily settled, said the youth. I will throw this stone as far as I can, and the one who picks it up first shall have the three things. So he took the stone and flung it, and, while the three brothers were running after it, 
he drew hastily on the boots and said, Boots, take me to the place where I shall find my elder sister. The next moment the young man was standing on a steep mountain before the gates of a strong castle guarded by bolts and bars and iron chains. The key, which he had not forgotten to put in his pocket, opened the doors one by one, and he walked through a number of halls and corridors till he met a beautiful and richly dressed young lady, who started back in surprise at the sight of him and exclaimed, Oh, sir, how did you contrive to get in here? The young man replied that he was her brother, and told her by what means he had been able to pass through the doors. In return she told him how happy she was, except for one thing, and that was her husband lay under a spell and could never break it till should there be put to death a man who could not die. They talked together for a long time, and then the lady said that he had better leave her, as she expected her husband back at any moment, and he might not like him to be there. But the young man assured her that she need not be afraid, as he had with him a cap which would make him invisible. They were still deep in conversation when the door suddenly opened and the bird flew in, but he saw nothing unusual for, at the first noise, the youth had put on his cap. The lady jumped up and brought a large golden basin into which the bird flew, reappearing quickly after as a handsome man. Turning to his wife, he cried, I am sure someone is in the room. She got frightened and declared that she was quite alone, but her husband persisted and in the end she had to confess the truth. "'If he is really your brother, why did you hide him?' asked he. "'I believe you are telling me a lie, and if he comes back I shall kill him.' At this the youth took off his cap and came forward. Then the husband saw that he was indeed so like his wife that he doubted her word no longer, and embraced his brother-in-law with delight. Drawing a feather from his bird's skin, he said, "'If you are in danger and cry, "'Come and help me, king of the birds!' All will go well with you. The young man thanked him and went away, and, after he had left the castle, he told the boots that they must take him to the place where his second sister was living. As before, he found himself at the gates of a huge castle, and within was his second sister, very happy with her husband, who loved her dearly, but longing for the moment when he should be set free from the spell that kept him half his life a fish. When he arrived and had been introduced by his wife to her brother, he welcomed him warmly and gave him a fish scale, saying, If you are in danger, call to me. Come and help me, king of the fishes, and everything will go well with you. The young man thanked him and took his leave, and when he was outside the gates, he told the boots to take him to the place where his younger sister lived. The boots carried him to a dark cavern with steps of iron leading up to it. Inside she sat weeping and sobbing, and, as she had done nothing else the whole time she had been there, the poor girl had grown very thin. When she saw a man standing before her, she sprang to her feet and exclaimed, Oh, whoever you are, save me, and take me from this horrible place. Then he told her who he was, and how he had seen her sisters, whose happiness was spoiled by the spell under which both their husbands lay, and she, in turn, related her story. She had been carried off in the water meadow by a horrible monster who wanted to make her marry him by force, and had kept her a prisoner all these years because she would not submit to his will. Every day he came to beg her to consent to his wishes, and to remind her that there was no hope of her being set free, as he was the most constant man in the world, and, besides that, he could never die. At these words the youth remembered his two enchanted brothers-in-law, and he advised his sister to promise to marry the old man if he would tell her why he could never die. Suddenly everything began to tremble as if it was shaken by a whirlwind, and the old man entered, and, flinging himself at the feet of the girl, he said, Are you still determined never to marry me? If so, you will have to sit there weeping till the end of the world, for I shall always be faithful to my wish to marry you. I will marry you, she said, if you will tell me why it is that you can never die. Then the old man burst into peals of laughter. Ah, ha, 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 you are thinking how you will be able to kill me. Well, to do that, you would have to find an iron casket which lies at the bottom of the sea and has a white dove inside. And then you would have to find the egg which the dove laid and bring it here and dash it against my head.
He laughed again in his certainty that no one had ever got down to the bottom of the sea, and if they did, they would never find the casket or be able to open it. When he could speak once more, he said, Now you will be obliged to marry me, as you know my secret. But she begged so hard that the wedding might be put off for three days that he consented and went away rejoicing at his victory. When he had disappeared, the brother took off the cap which had kept him visible all this time, and told his sister not to lose heart, as he hoped in three days she would be free. Then he drew on his boots and wished himself at the seashore, and there he was directly. Drawing out the fish scale, he cried, Come and help me, king of the fishes! And his brother-in-law swam up, and asked what he could do. The young man related the story, and when he had finished, his listener summoned all the fishes to his presence. The last to arrive was a little sardine, who apologised for being so late, but said she had hurt herself by knocking her head against an iron casket that lay in the bottom of the sea. The king ordered several of the largest and strongest of his subjects to take the little sardine as a guide, and bring him the iron casket. They soon returned with the box placed across their backs, and laid it down before him. Then the youth produced the key and said, "'Key, open that box!' and the key opened it, and though they were all crowding round, ready to catch it, the white dove within flew away. It was useless to go after it, and for a moment the young man's heart sank. The next minute, however, he remembered that he had still his feather, and drew it out, crying, "'Come to me, king of the birds!' And a rushing noise was heard, and the king of the birds perched on his shoulder, and asked what he could do to help him. His brother-in-law told him the whole story, and when he had finished, the king of the birds commanded all his subjects to hasten to his presence. In an instant the air was dark with birds of all sizes, and at the very last came the white dove, apologising for being so late by saying that an old friend had arrived at his nest, and he had been obliged to give him some dinner. The king of the birds ordered some of them to show the young man the white dove's nest, and when they reached it, there lay the egg which was to break the spell and set them all free. When it was safely in his pocket, he told the boots to carry him straight to the cavern where his younger sister sat awaiting him. Now it was already far on into the third day which the old man had fixed for the wedding, and when the youth reached the cavern with his cap on his head, he found the monster there, urging the girl to keep her word and let the marriage take place at once. At a sign from her brother, she sat down and invited the old monster to lay his head on her lap. He did so with delight, and her brother, standing behind her back, passed her the egg unseen. She took it, and dashed it straight at the horrible head. The monster started, and with a groan that people took for the rumblings of an earthquake, he turned over and died. As the breath went out of his body, the husbands of the two eldest daughters resumed their proper shapes, and, sending for their mother-in-law, whose sorrow was so unexpectedly turned into joy, they had a great feast, and the younger sister was rich to the end of her days with the treasure she found in the cave, collected by the monster. That is the end of What Became of Picking Flowers, from The Grey Fairy Book, by Andrew Lang. It was read by Sean Randall on the 13th of August, 2010. Chapter 10 of The Grey Fairy Book This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sophia Otero the Grey Fairy Book, edited by Andrew Lank. The Story of Benzerdatu There once was a king and a queen who had three wonderfully beautiful daughters, and their one thought from morning till night was how they could make the girls happy. One day the princess said to the king, Dear father, we want so much to have a picnic and to eat our dinner in the country. "'Very well, dear children, let us have a picnic by all means,' answered he, and gave orders that everything should be got ready. When the luncheon was prepared, 
it was put into a cart, and the royal family stepped into a carriage and drove right away into the country. After a few miles, they reached a house and a garden belonging to the king, and close by was their favorite place for lunch. The drive had made them very hungry, and they ate with a hearty appetite till almost all the food had disappeared. When they had quite done, they said to their parents, Now we wish like to wander about the garden a little, but when you want to go home, just call us. And they ran off, laughing, down a green glade which led to the garden. But no sooner had they stepped across the fence than a dark cloud came down and covered them and prevented them from seeing whither they were going. Meanwhile, the king and queen sat lazily among the heather, and an hour or two slipped away. The sun was dropping towards the horizon, and they began to think it was time to go home. So they called to their daughters and called again. But no one answered them. Frightened at the silence, they searched every corner of the garden, the house, and the neighboring wood. But no trace of the girls was to be found anywhere. The earth seemed to have swallowed them up. The poor parents were in despair. The queen wept all the way home and for many days after, and the king issued a proclamation that whoever should bring back his lost daughters should have one of them to wife and should, after his death, reign in his stead. Now two young generals were at that time living at the court, and when they heard the king's declaration, they said to one another, Let us go in search of them. Perhaps we shall be the lucky persons. And they set out, each mounted on a strong horse, taking with them a change of raiment and some money. But though they inquired at every village they rode through, they could hear nothing of the princesses, and by and by their money was all spent, and they were forced to sell their horses or give up the search. Even this money only lasted a little while longer, and nothing but their clothes lay between them and starvation. They sold the spare garments that were bound on their saddles, and went in the coats that they stood up in to the inn to beg for some food, as they were really starving. But when, however, they had to pay for what they had eaten and drank, they said to the host, We have no money, and not but the clothes we stand up in. Take these, and give us instead some old rags, and let us stay here and serve you. And the innkeeper was content with the bargain, and the general remained and were his servants. All this time the king and queen remained in their palace, hungering for their children, but not a word was heard of either of them or of the generals who had now gone to seek for them. Now there was living in the palace a faithful servant of the king's called ben Serdatu, who had served him for many years, and when ben Serdatu saw how grieved the king was, he lifted up his voice and said to him, Your majesty, let me go and seek your daughters. No, no, ben Serdatu replied the king, Three daughters have I lost in two generals, and shall I lose you also? But ben Serdatu said again, Let me go now, your majesty, and trust me, and I will bring you back your daughters. Then the king gave way, and ben Serdatu set forth and rode on till he came to the inn, where he dismounted and asked for food. It was brought by the two generals, whom he knew at once in spite of their miserable clothes, and much astonished, asked them how in the world they came there. They told him all their adventures, and he sent for the innkeeper and said to him, Give them back their garments, and I will pay everything that they owe you. And the innkeeper did as he was bid, and when the two generals were dressed in their proper clothes, they declared they would join ben Serdatu and with him seek for the king's daughters. The three companions rode on for many miles, and at length they came to a wild place, without sign of a human being. It was getting dark, and fearing to be lost on this desolate spot, they pushed on their horses, and at last saw light in the window of a tiny hut. "'Who comes there?' asked a voice as they knocked at the door. "'Oh, have pity on us, and give us a night's shelter,' replied Benzer Dartu. We are three tired travellers who have lost our way. 
Then the door was opened by a very old woman, who stood back and beckoned them to enter. "'Whence do you come, and whither do you go?' said she. "'Ah, good woman, we have a heavy task before us,' answered Benzardatu. "'We are bound to carry the king's daughters back to the palace.' "'Oh, unhappy creatures!' cried she. "'You know not what you are doing.' The king's daughters were covered by a thick cloud, and no one knows where they may be now. Oh, tell us if you know, my good woman, entreated Benzardatu, for with them lies all our happiness. Even if I were to tell you, answered she, you could not rescue them. To do that you would have to go to the very bottom of a deep river, and though certainly you would find the king's daughters there, Yet the two eldest are guarded by two giants, and the youngest is watched by a serpent with seven heads. The two generals who stood by listening were filled with terror at her words and wished to return immediately. But Benzardatu stood firm and said, Now we have got so far, we must carry the thing through. Tell us where the river is, that we may get there as soon as possible. And the old woman told them, and gave them cheese, wine, and bread, so that they should not set forth starving. And when they had eaten and drunk, they laid themselves down to sleep. The sun had only just risen above the hills next morning, before they all woke, and taking leave of the wise woman who had helped them, they rode on, till they came to the river. "'I am the eldest,' said one of the generals, "'and it is my right to go down first. So the others fastened a cord round him, gave him a little bell, and let him down into the water. But scarcely had the river closed above his head, when such dreadful rushing sounds and peals of thunder came crashing round about him, that he lost all his courage, and rang his bell, if perchance it might be heard amidst all this clamour. Great was his relief when the rope began slowly to pull him upwards. Then the other general plunged in, but he fared no better than the first, and was soon on dry ground again. "'Well, you are a brave pair,' said Benzardatu, as he tied the rope round his own waist. "'Let us see what will happen to me.' And when he heard the thunder and clamour round about him, he thought to himself, "'Oh, make as much noise as you like. It won't hurt me.' When his feet touched the bottom, he found himself in a large, brightly lighted hall, and in the middle sat the eldest princess, and in front of her lay a huge giant, fast asleep. Directly she saw Benzardatu, she nodded to him, and asked with her eyes how he had come there. For answer he drew his sword, and was about to cut off the giant's head, when she stopped him quickly, and made signs to hide himself, as the giant was just beginning to wake. "'I smell man-flesh,' murmured he, stretching his great arms. "'Why, how in the world could any man get down here?' replied she. "'You had better go to sleep again.' So he turned over and went to sleep. Then the princess signed to Benzardatu, who drew his sword, and cut off the giant's head with such a blow that it fell into the corner. And the heart of the princess leapt within her and she placed a golden crown on the head of Benzardatu, and called him her deliverer. "'Now show me where your sisters are,' he said, "'that I may free them also.' So the princess opened a door, and led him into another hall, wherein sat her next sister, guarded by a giant who was fast asleep. When the second princess saw them, she made a sign to them to hide themselves, for the giant was showing symptoms of waking. "'I smell man's flesh,' murmured he sleepily. "'Now how could any man get down here?' asked she. "'Go to sleep again.' And as soon as he closed his eyes, Benzardatu stole out from his corner and struck with such a blow at his head that it flew far, far away. The princess could not find words to thank Benzardatu for what he had done, and she too placed in his hand a golden crown. "'Now show me where your youngest sister is,' said he, "'that I may free her also.' "'Ah, that I fear you will never be able to do,' sighed they. 
for she is in the power of a serpent with seven heads. Take me to him, replied Benzerdatu. It will be a splendid fight. Then the princess opened the door, and Benzerdatu passed through and found himself in a hall that was even larger than the other two. And there stood the youngest sister, chained fast to the wall, and before her was a stretched a serpent with seven heads, horrible to see. As Benzerdatu came forward, it twisted all its seven heads in its direction, and then made a quick dart to snatch him within its grasp. But Benzerdatu drew his sword and laid about him till the seven heads were rolling on the floor. Flinging down his sword, he rushed to the princess and broke her chains, and she wept for joy and embraced him and took the golden crown from off her head and placed it in his hand. Now we must go back to the upper world, said Benzerdatu, and led her to the bottom of the river. The other princesses were waiting there, and he tied the rope round the eldest and rung his bell. And the generals above heard and drew her up gently. They then unfastened the cord and threw it back into the river, and in a few moments the second princess stood beside her sister. So now there was left only Benzerdatu and the youngest princess. "'Dear Benzodatu, said she, "'do me a kindness and let them draw you up before me. "'I dread the treachery of the generals.' "'No, no,' replied Benzodatu. "'I certainly will not leave you down here. "'There is nothing to fear from my comrades. "'It is your wish I will go up, then. "'But first I swear that if you do not follow to marry me, "'I shall stay single for the rest of my life.' Then he bound the rope round her, and the general drew her up. But instead of lowering the rope again into the river, envy at the courage and success of Benzerdatu so filled the heart of the two generals that they turned away and left him to perish. And more than that, they threatened the princesses and forced them to promise to tell their parents that it was the two generals who had set them free. And if they should ask you about Benzerdatu, you must say you have never seen him, they added. And the princesses, fearing for their lives, promised everything, and they rode back to the court together. The king and queen were besides themselves with joy when they saw their dear children once more. But when the generals had told their story and the dangers they had run, the king declared that they had gained their reward, and that the two eldest princesses should become their wives. And now... We must see what poor Benzerdatu is doing. He waited patiently a long, long time, but when the rope never came back, he knew he had been right, and that his comrades had betrayed him. Ah, oh, now I shall never reach the world again, murmured he. But being a brave man, and knowing that moaning his fate would profit him nothing, he rose and began to search through the three halls where, perhaps, he might find something to help him. In the last one stood a dish covered with food, which reminded him that he was hungry, and he sat down and ate and drank. Months passed away, when one morning, as he was walking through the halls, he noticed a purse hanging on the wall, which had never been there before. He took it down to examine it, and nearly let it fall with surprise when a voice came from the purse saying what commands have you oh take me from this horrible place and up into the world again and in a moment he was standing by the river bank with the purse tightly grasped in his hand now let me have the most beautiful ship that was ever built all manned and ruddy for sea and there was the ship with a flag floating from its mast on which were the words king with the three crowns. Then Benzerdatu climbed on board, and sailed away to the city where the three princesses dwelt. And when he reached the harbor, he blew trumpets and beat drums, so that every one ran to the doors and windows. And the king heard too, and saw the beautiful vessel, and said to himself, That must indeed be a mighty monarch, for he has three crowns, while I only have one. So he hastened to greet the stranger, and invited him to his castle, for, thought he, this will be a fine husband for my youngest daughter. 
Now the youngest princess had never married, and had turned a deaf ear to all her wooers. Such a long time had passed since Benzardatu had left the palace, that the king never guessed for a moment that the splendidly clad stranger before him was the man whom he had so deeply mourned as dead. "'Noble lord,' said he, "'let us feast and make merry together, and then, if it seem good to you, do me the honor to take my youngest daughter to wife. And Benzardatu was glad, and they all sat down to a great feast, and there were great rejoicings. But only the youngest daughter was sad, for her thoughts were with Benzardatu. After they rose from the table, the king said to her, Dear child, this mighty lord does you the honor to ask your hand in marriage. Oh, father, answered she, spare me i pray you for i desire to remain single then benzardatu turned to her and said and if i were benzardatu would you give the same answer to me as she stood silently gazing at him he added yes i am benzardatu and this is my story the king and queen had their hearts stirred within them at the tale of his adventures and when he had ended, the king stretched out his hand, and said, Dear Benzardatu, my youngest daughter shall indeed be your wife, and when I die my crown shall be yours. As for the men who have betrayed you, they shall leave the country, and you shall see them no more. And the wedding feast was ordered, and rejoicings were held for three days over the marriage of Benzardatu and the youngest princess. End of chapter 10、Chapter、eleven of the Gray Fairy Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Gray Fairy Book, edited by Andrew Lang. Chapter 11 Once upon a time there was a king who had three sons. Now it happened that one day the three princes went out hunting in a large forest at some distance from their father's palace, and the youngest prince lost his way, so his brothers had to return home without him. For four days the prince wandered through the glades of the forest, sleeping on moss beneath the stars at night, and by day living on roots and wild berries. At last, on the morning of the fifth day, he came to a large open space in the middle of the forest. And here stood a stately palace, but neither within nor without was there a trace of human life. The prince entered the open door and wandered through the deserted rooms without seeing a living soul. At last he came on a great hall, and in the center of the hall was a table spread with dainty dishes and choice wines. The prince sat down and satisfied his hunger and thirst, and immediately afterwards the table disappeared from his sight. This struck the prince as very strange. But though he continued his search through all the rooms, upstairs and down, he could find no one to speak to. At last, just as it was beginning to get dark, he heard steps in the distance, and he saw an old man coming towards him up the stairs. What are you doing wandering about my castle? asked the old man. To whom the prince replied, I lost my way hunting in the forest. If you will take me into your service, I should like to stay with you and will serve you faithfully. Very well, said the old man. You may enter my service. You will have to keep the stove always lit. You will have to fetch the wood for it from the forest. And you will have the charge of the black horse in the stables. I will pay you a florin a day, and at meal times you will always find the table in the hall spread with food and wine, and you can eat and drink as much as you require. The prince was satisfied, and he entered the old man's service, and promised to see that there was always wood on the stove, so that the fire should never die out. Now, though he did not know it, his new master was a magician, and the flame of the stove was a magic fire, and if it had gone out, the magician would have lost a great part of his power. One day the prince forgot, and let the fire burn so low that it was nearly burnt out. Just as the flame was flickering, the old man stormed into the room. What do you mean by letting the fire burn so low? he growled. 
I have only arrived in the nick of time. And while the prince hastily threw a log on the stove and blew on the ashes to kindle a glow, his master gave him a severe box on the ear and warned him that if it ever happened again, it would fare badly with him. One day the prince was sitting disconsolate in the stables when, to his surprise, the black horse spoke to him. Come into my stall, it said. I have something to say to you. Fetch my bridle and saddle from that cupboard and put them on me. Take the bottle that is beside them. It contains an ointment which will make your hair shine like pure gold. Then put all the wood you can gather together onto the stove till it is piled quite high. So the prince did what the horse told him. He saddled and bridled the horse. He put the ointment on his hair till it shone like gold. And he made such a big fire in the stove that the flame sprang up and set fire to the roof. And in a few minutes, the palace was burning like a huge bonfire. Then he hurried back to the stables and the horse said to him, There is one thing more you must do. In the cupboard you will find a looking glass, a brush, and a riding whip. Bring them with you. Mount on my back and ride as hard as you can, for now the house is burning merrily. The prince did as the horse bade him. Scarcely had he got into the saddle than the horse was off and away, galloping at such a pace that in a short time the forest and all the country belonging to the magician lay far behind them. In the meantime, the magician returned to his palace, which he found in smoldering ruins. In vain he called for his servant. At last he went to look for him in the stables. And when he discovered that the black horse had disappeared too, he at once suspected that they had gone together. So he mounted a roan horse that was in the next stall and set out in pursuit. As the prince rode, the quick ears of the horse heard the sound of pursuing feet. Look behind you, he said, and see if the old man is following. And the prince turned in his saddle and saw a cloud-like smoke or dust in the distance. We must hurry, said the horse. After they had galloped for some time, the horse said again, Look behind and see if he is still at some distance. He is quite close, answered the prince. Then throw the looking glass on the ground, said the horse. So the prince threw it. And when the magician came up, the roan horse stepped on the mirror and crash. His foot went through the glass and he stumbled and fell, cutting his feet so badly that there was nothing for the old man to do but to go slowly back with him to the stables and put new shoes on his feet. Then they started once more in pursuit of the prince, for the magician set great value on the horse and was determined not to lose it. In the meanwhile, the prince had gone a great distance, but the quick ears of the black horse detected the sound of following feet from afar. Dismount, he said to the prince. Put your ear to the ground and tell me if you do not hear a sound. So the prince dismounted and listened. I seem to hear the earth tremble, he said. I think he cannot be far off. Mount me at once, answered the horse, and I will gallop as fast as I can. And he set off so fast that the earth seemed to fly from under his hoofs. Look back once more, he said, after a short time, and see if he is in sight. I see a cloud and a flame, answered the prince, but a long way off. We must make haste, said the horse. And shortly after, he said, look back again. He can't be far off now. The prince turned in his saddle and exclaimed, he is close behind us. In a minute, the flame from his horse's nostrils will reach us. Then throw the brush on the ground, said the horse. And the prince threw it, and in an instant, the brush was changed into such a thick wood that even a bird could not have got through it. And when the old man got up to it, the roan horse came suddenly to a standstill not able to advance a step into the thick tangle. So there was nothing for the magician to do but to retrace his steps to fetch an axe with which he cut himself away through the wood. But it took him some time, during which the prince and the black horse got on well ahead. But once more they heard the sound of pursuing feet. Look back, said the black horse, and see if he is following. Yes, answered the prince. This time I hear him distinctly. Let us hurry on, said the horse, and a little later he said, Look back now and see if he's in sight. Yes, said the prince, turning round. I see the flame. He is close behind us. Then you must throw down the whip, answered the horse, and in the twinkling of an eye the whip has changed into a broad river. 
When the old man got up to it, he urged the roan horse into the water. But as the water mounted higher and higher, the magic flame which gave the magician all his power grew smaller and smaller, till, with a fizz, it went out, and the old man and the roan horse sank in the river and disappeared. When the prince looked round, they were no longer to be seen. Now, said the horse, you may dismount. There is nothing more to fear, for the magician is dead. Beside that brook you will find a willow wand. Gather it, and strike the earth with it, and it will open, and you will see a door at your feet. When the prince had struck the earth with the wand, a door appeared, and opened into a large vaulted stone hall. Lead me into that hall, said the horse. I will stay there, but you must go through the fields till you reach a garden, in the midst of which is a king's palace. When you get there, you must ask to be taken into the king's service. Goodbye, and don't forget me. So they parted. But first the horse made the prince promise not to let anyone in the palace see his golden hair. So he bound a scarf round it like a turban, and the prince set out through the fields till he reached a beautiful garden, and beyond the garden he saw the walls and towers of a stately palace. At the garden gate he met the gardener, who asked him what he wanted. I want to take service with the king, replied the prince. Well, you may stay and work under me in the garden, said the man, for as the prince was dressed like a poor man, he could not tell that he was a king's son. I need someone to weed the ground and to sweep the dead leaves from the paths. You shall have a florin a day, a horse to help you cart the leaves away, and food and drink. So the prince consented and set about his work. But when his food was given to him, he only ate half of it. The rest he carried to the vaulted hall beside the brook and gave to the black horse. And this he did every day, and the horse thanked him for his faithful friendship. One evening, as they were together, after his work in the garden was over, the horse said to him, Tomorrow a large company of princes and great lords are coming to your king's palace. They are coming from far and near, as wooers for three princesses. They will all stand in a row in the courtyard of the palace, and the three princesses will come out, and each will carry a diamond apple in her hand, which she will throw into the air. At whosoever feet the apple falls, he will be the bridegroom of that princess. You must be close by in the garden at your work. The apple of the youngest princess, who is much the most beautiful of the sisters, will roll past the wooers and stop in front of you. Pick it up at once and put it in your pocket. The next day, when the wooers were all assembled in the courtyard of the castle, everything happened just as the horse had said. The princesses threw the apples into the air, and the diamond apple of the youngest princess rolled past all the wooers, out onto the garden, and stopped at the feet of the young gardener, who was busy sweeping the leaves away. In a moment he had stooped down, picked up the apple, and put it in his pocket. As he stooped, the scarf round his head slipped a little to one side, and the princess caught sight of his golden hair and loved him from that moment. But the king was very sad, for his youngest daughter was the one he loved best. But there was no help for it, and the next day a threefold wedding was celebrated at the palace, and after the wedding the youngest princess returned with her husband to the small hut in the garden where he lived. Some time after this, the people of a neighboring country went to war with the king, and he set out to battle, accompanied by the husbands of his two eldest daughters mounted on stately steeds. But the husband of the youngest daughter had nothing but the old broken-down horse, which helped him in his garden work, and the king, who was ashamed of this son-in-law, refused to give him any other. So as he was determined not to be left behind, he went into the garden, mounted the sorry nag, and set out. But scarcely had he ridden a few yards before the horse stumbled and fell. So he dismounted and went down to the brook, to where the black horse lived in the vaulted hall. And the horse said to him, Saddle and bridle me, and then go into the next room, and you will find a suit of armor and a sword. Put them on, and we will ride forth together to battle. And the prince did as he was told. And when he had mounted the horse, his armor glittered in the sun, and he looked so brave and handsome that no one would have recognized him as the gardener who swept away the dead leaves from the paths. 
The horse bore him away at a great pace, and when they reached the battlefield, they saw that the king was losing the day. So many of his warriors had been slain. But when the warrior on his black charger and in glittering armor appeared on the scene, hewing right and left with his sword, the enemy were dismayed and fled in all directions, leaving the king master of the field. Then the king and his two sons-in-laws, when they saw their deliverer, shouted, and all that was left of the army joined in the cry, A god has come to our rescue! And they would have surrounded him, but his black horse rose in the air and bore him out of their sight. Soon after this, part of the country rose in rebellion against the king, and once more he and his two sons-in-law had to fare forth to battle. And the son-in-law, who was disguised as a gardener, wanted to fight too. So he came to the king and said, Dear father, let me ride with you to fight your enemies. I don't want a blockhead like you to fight for me, answered the king. Besides, I haven't got a horse fit for you. But see, there is a carter on the road carting hay. You may take his horse. So the prince took the carter's horse, but the poor beast was old and tired, and after it had gone a few yards it stumbled and fell. So the prince returned sadly to the garden, and watched the king ride forth at the head of the army, accompanied by his two sons-in-law. When they were out of sight, the prince betook himself to the vaulted chamber by the brookside, and having taken counsel of the faithful black horse, he put on the glittering suit of armor, and was borne on the back of the horse through the air, to where the battle was being fought. And once more he routed the king's enemies, hacking to right and left with his sword, and again they all cried, a god has come to our rescue. But when they tried to detain him, the black horse rose in the air and bore him out of their sight. When the king and his sons-in-law returned home, they could talk of nothing but the hero who had fought for them, and all wondered who he could be. Shortly afterwards, the king of a neighboring country declared war, and once more the king and his sons-in-law and his subjects had to prepare themselves for battle. And once more the prince begged to ride with them, but the king said he had no horse to spare for him. But, he added, you may take the horse of the woodman, who brings the wood from the forest. It is good enough for you. So the prince took the woodman's horse, but it was so old and useless that it could not carry him beyond the castle gates. So he betook himself once more to the vaulted hall, where the black horse had prepared a still more magnificent suit of armor for him than the one he had worn on the previous occasions, and when he had put it on and mounted on the back of the horse, he bore him straight to the battlefield, and once more he scattered the king's enemies, fighting single-handed in their ranks, and they fled in all directions. But it happened that one of the enemy struck with his sword and wounded the prince in the leg. And the king took his own pocket handkerchief, with his name and crown embroidered on it, and bound it round the wounded leg and the king would fain have compelled him to mount in a litter and be carried straight to the palace, and two of his knights were to lead the black charger to the royal stables. But the prince put his hand on the mane of his faithful horse and managed to pull himself up into the saddle, and the horse mounted into the air with him. Then they all shouted and cried, The warrior who has fought for us is a god. He must be a god. And throughout all the kingdom nothing else was spoken about, and all the people said, Who can the hero be who has fought for us in so many battles? He cannot be a man. He must be a god. And the king said, If only I could see him once more, and if it turned out that after all he was a man and not a god, I would reward him with half my kingdom. Now when the prince reached his home, the gardener's hut where he lived with his wife, he was weary, and he lay down on his bed and slept and his wife noticed the handkerchief bound round his wounded leg, and she wondered what it could be. Then she looked at it more closely and saw in the corner that it was embroidered with her father's name and the royal crown. So she ran straight to the palace and told her father, and he and his two sons-in-law followed her back to her house, and there the gardener lay asleep on his bed, and the scarf that he always wore bound round his head had slipped off, and his golden hair gleamed on the pillow. And they all recognized that this was the hero who had fought and won so many battles for them. Then there was great rejoicing throughout the land, 
and the king rewarded his son-in-law with half of his kingdom, and he and his wife reigned happily over it. End of chapter 11. Recording by Lynn Handler. LynnHandlerVoiceOvers.com Chapter 12 of the Grey Fairy Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Zoranka. The Grey Fairy Book, edited by Andrew Lang. The Little Grey Man. A nun, a countryman, and a blacksmith were once wandering through the world together. One day they lost their way in a thick, dark forest, and were thankful when they saw, in the distance, the walls of a house, where they hoped they might obtain refuge for the night. When they got close to the house, they found that it was an old, deserted castle, fast falling into ruins, but with some of the rooms in it still habitable. As they were homeless, they determined to take up their abode in the castle, and they arranged that one of them should always stay at home and keep house, while the other two went into the world to seek their fortunes. The lot of remaining at home fell first to the nun, and when the countryman and the blacksmith had gone out into the wood, she set to work, tidied up the house, and prepared all the food for the day. As her companions did not come home for their midday meal, she ate up her own portion and put the rest in the oven to keep warm. Just as she was sitting down to sew, the door opened and a little gray man came in, and standing before her said, Oh, how cold I am! The nun was very sorry for him, and said at once, Sit down by the fire and warm yourself. The little man did as he was told, and soon called out, Oh, how hungry I am! The nun answered, There is food in the oven. Help yourself. The little man did not need to be told twice, for he set to work and ate up everything with the greatest possible dispatch. When the nun saw this, she was very angry and scolded the dwarf because he had left nothing for her companions. The little man resented her words and flew into such a passion that he seized the nun, beat her, and threw her first against one wall and then against the other. When he had nearly killed her, he left her lying on the floor and hastily walked out of the house. In the evening, the countryman and the blacksmith returned home, and when they found, on demanding their dinner, that there was nothing left for them, they reproached the nun bitterly and refused to believe her when she tried to tell them what had happened. The next day, the countryman asked left to be in charge of the house and promised that, if he remained at home, no one should go hungry to bed. So the other two went out into the forest, and the countryman, having prepared the food for the day, ate up his own portion and put the rest in the oven. Just as he had finished clearing away, the door opened, and the little gray man walked in, and this time he had two heads. He shook and trembled as before, and exclaimed, Oh, how cold I am! The countryman, who was frightened out of his wits, begged him to draw near the fire and warm himself. Soon after, the dwarf looked greedily round and said, Oh, how hungry I am! There is food in the oven so you can eat, replied the countryman. Then the little man fell to with both his heads and soon finished the last morsel. When the countryman scolded him for this proceeding, he treated him exactly as he had done the nun and left the poor fellow more dead than alive. Now when the blacksmith came home with the nun in the evening, and found nothing for supper, he flew into a passion, and swore that he would stay home the following day, and that no one should go supperless to bed. When day dawned, the countryman and the nun set out into the wood, and the blacksmith prepared all the food for the day as the others had done. Again the grey dwarf entered the house without knocking, and this time he had three heads. When he complained of cold, the blacksmith told him to sit near the fire, and when he said he was hungry, the blacksmith put some food on a plate and gave it to him. The dwarf made short work of what was provided for him, and then, looking greedily round with his six eyes, he demanded more. When the blacksmith refused to give him another morsel, he flew into a terrible rage, 
and proceeded to treat him in the same way as he had treated his companions. But the blacksmith was a match for him, for he seized a huge hammer and struck off two of the dwarfs' heads with it. The little man yelled with pain and rage and hastily fled from the house. The blacksmith ran after him and pursued him for a long way, but at last they came to an iron door, and through it the little creature vanished. The door shut behind him, and the blacksmith had to give up the pursuit and return home. He found that the nun and the countryman had come back in the meantime, and they were much delighted when he placed some food before them, and showed them the two heads he had struck off with his hammer. The three companions determined there and then to free themselves from the power of the great dwarf and the very next day they set to work to find him. They had to walk a long way and to search for many hours before they found the iron door through which the dwarf had disappeared, and when they had found it, they had the greatest difficulty in opening it. When at last they succeeded in forcing the lock, they entered a large hall in which sat a young and lovely girl working at a table. The moment she saw the nun, the blacksmith, and the countryman, she fell at their feet, thanking them with tears in her eyes for having set her free. She told them that she was a king's daughter, who had been shut up in the castle by a mighty magician. The day before, just about noon, she had suddenly felt the magic power over her disappear, and ever since that moment she had eagerly awaited the arrival of her deliverers. She went on to say that there was yet another princess shut up in the castle, who had also fallen under the might of the magician. They wandered through many halls and rooms till at last they found the second princess, who was quite as grateful as the first, and thanked the three companions most warmly for having set her free. Then the princesses told their rescuers that a great treasure lay hidden in the cellars of the castle, but that it was carefully guarded by a fierce and terrible dog. Nothing daunted, they all went down below at once, and found the fierce animal mounting guard over the treasure as the princesses had said. But one blow from the blacksmith's hammer soon made an end of the monster, and they found themselves in a vaulted chamber full of gold and silver and precious stones. Beside the treasure stood a young and handsome man, who advanced to meet them, and thanked the nun, the blacksmith, and the countryman for having freed him from the magic spell he was under. He told them that he was a king's son, who had been banished to this castle by a wicked magician, and that he had been changed into the three-headed dwarf. When he had lost two of his heads, the magic power over the two princesses had been removed, and when the blacksmith had killed the horrible dog, then he too had been set free. To show his gratitude, he begged the three companions to divide the treasure between them, which they did, but there was so much of it that it took a very long time. The princesses, too, were so grateful to the rescuers that one married the blacksmith and the other the countryman. Then the prince claimed the nun as his bride, and they all lived happily together till they died. From the German End of The Little Grey Man Recording by Elizabeth Zarenka Chapter 13 of The Grey Fairy Book This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Claudia Wilson. The Grey Fairy Book, edited by Andrew Lang. Chapter 13. Herr Lazarus and the Draken. Once upon a time there was a cobbler called Lazarus, who was very fond of honey. One day, as he ate some while he sat at work, the flies collected in such numbers that with one blow he killed forty. Then he went and ordered a sword to be made for him, on which he had written these words, With one blow I have slain forty. When the sword was ready he took it and went out into the world, and when he was two days' journey from home he came to a spring, by which he laid himself down and slept. Now in that country there dwelt Draken, one of whom came to the spring to draw water, there he found Lazarus sleeping, and read what was written on his sword. Then he went back to his people and told them what he had seen, and they all advised him to make fellowship with this powerful stranger. So the Draken returned to the spring, awoke Lazarus, and said that if it was agreeable to him they should make fellowship together. Lazarus answered that he was willing, 
and after a priest had blessed the fellowship, they returned together to the other drachen, and Lazarus dwelt among them. After some days they told him that it was their custom to take it in turns to bring wood and water, and as he was now of their company, he must take his turn. They went first for water and wood, but at last it came to be Lazarus's turn to go for water. The drachen had a great leathern bag, holding two hundred measures of water. This Lazarus could only with great difficulty drag empty to the spring, and because he could not carry it back full, he did not fill it at all, but instead he dug up the ground all round the spring. As Lazarus remained so long away, the drachen sent one of their number to see what had become of him. And when this one came to the spring, Lazarus said to him, We will no more plague ourselves by carrying water every day. I will bring the entire spring home at once, and so we shall be freed from this burden. But the drachen called out, On no account, Herr Lazarus, else we shall all die of thirst. Rather, we will carry the water ourselves in turns, and you alone shall be exempt. Next it comes to be Lazarus's turn to bring the wood. Now the drachen, when they fetched the wood, always took an entire tree on their shoulder, and so carried it home. Because Lazarus could not imitate them in this, he went to the forest, tied all the trees together with a thick rope, and remained in the forest till evening. Again the drachen sent one of them after him to see what had become of him, and when this one asked what he was about, Lazarus answered, I will bring the entire forest home at once, so that after that we may have rest. But the drachen called out, By no means, Herr Lazarus, else we shall all die of cold. Rather we will go ourselves to bring wood, and let you be free. And then the drachen tore up one tree, threw it over his shoulder, and so carried it home. When they had lived together some time, the drachen became weary of Lazarus, and agreed among themselves to kill him. Each drachen, in the night while Lazarus slept, should strike him a blow with a hatchet. But Lazarus heard of this scheme, and when the evening came he took a log of wood, covered it with his cloak, laid it in the place where he usually slept, and then hid himself. In the night the drachen came, and each one hit the log a blow with his hatchet till it flew in pieces. Then they believed their object was gained, and they lay down again. Thereupon Lazarus took the log, threw it away, and laid himself down in its stead. Towards dawn he began to groan, and when the drachen heard that, they asked what ailed him, to which he made answer, The gnats have stung me horribly. This terrified the drachen for they believed that Lazarus took their blows for gnat stings, and they determined at any price to get rid of him. Next morning, therefore, they asked him if he had not wife or child, and said that if he would like to go and visit them, they would give him a bag of gold to take away with him. He agreed willingly to this, but asked further that one of the drachen should go with him to carry the bag of gold. They consented, and one was sent with him. When they had come to within a short distance of Lazarus's house, he said to the drachen, Stop here in the meantime, for I must go on in front and tie up my children, lest they eat you. So he went and tied his children with strong ropes, and said to them, As soon as the drachen comes in sight, call out as loud as you can, Drachen flesh! Drachen flesh! So, when the drachen appeared, the children cried out, Drachen flesh! Drachen flesh! and this so terrified the drachen that he let the bag fall and fled. On the road he met a fox, which asked him why he seemed so frightened. He answered that he was afraid of the children of Herr Lazarus, who had been within a hair-breadth of eating him up. But the fox laughed and said, What? You were afraid of the children of Herr Lazarus? He had two fowls, one of which I ate yesterday, the other I will go and fetch now, if you do not believe me. Come and see for yourself, but you must first tie yourself to my tail. The drachen then tied himself on to the fox's tail, and went back thus with it to Lazarus's house, in order to see what it would arrange. There stood Lazarus with his gun raised ready to fire, who, when he saw the fox coming along with the drachen, called out to the fox, Did I not tell you to bring me all the drachen, and you bring me only one? When the drachen heard that, he made off to the right about it once, 
and ran so fast that the fox was dashed in pieces against the stones. When Lazarus had got quit of the draken, he built himself, with their gold, a magnificent house, in which he spent the rest of his days in great enjoyment. End of Herr Lazarus and the Draken Chapter 14 of The Grave Fairy Book This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pete Williams The Grey Fairy Book, edited by Andrew Lang The Story of the Queen of the Flowery Isles There once lived a queen who ruled over the Flowery Isles, whose husband, to her extreme grief, died a few years after their marriage. On being left a widow, she devoted herself almost entirely to the education of the two charming princesses, her only children. The elder of them was so lovely that as she grew up her mother greatly feared she would excite the jealousy of the queen of all the isles, who prided herself on being the most beautiful woman in the world, and insisted on all rivals bowing before her charms. In order the better to gratify her vanity, she had urged the king, her husband, to make war on all the surrounding islands, and as his greatest wish was to please her, the only conditions he imposed on any newly conquered country was that each princess of every royal house should attend his court as soon as she was fifteen years old, and do homage to the transcendent beauty of his queen. The Queen of the Flowery Isles, well aware of this law, was fully determined to present her daughter to the proud queen as soon as her fifteenth birthday was passed. The queen herself had heard a rumor of the young princess's great beauty, and awaited her visit with some anxiety, which soon developed into jealousy, for when the interview took place it was impossible not to be dazzled by such radiant charms and she was obliged to admit that she had never beheld any one so exquisitely lovely. Of course, she thought in her own mind, excepting myself, for nothing could have made her believe it possible that any one could eclipse her. But the outspoken admiration of the entire court soon undeceived her and made her so angry that she pretended illness and retired to her rooms so as to avoid witnessing the princess's triumph. She also sent word to the Queen of the Flowery Isles that she was sorry not to be well enough to see her again, and advised her to return to her own states with the princess, her daughter. This message was entrusted to one of the great ladies of the court, who was an old friend of the Queen of the Flowery Isles, and who advised her not to wait to take a formal leave, but to go home as fast as she could. The queen was not slow to take the hint, and lost no time in obeying it. Being well aware of the magic powers of the incensed queen, she warned her daughter that she was threatened by some great danger if she left the palace for any reason whatever during the next six months. The princess promised obedience, and no pains were spared to make the time pass pleasantly for her. The six months were nearly at an end, and on the very last day a splendid fete was to take place in a lovely meadow, quite near the palace. The princess, who had been able to watch all the preparations from her window, implored her mother to let her go as far as the meadow, and the queen, thinking all risk must be over, consented, and promised to take her there herself. The whole court was delighted to see their much-loved princess at liberty, and every one set off in high glee to join in the fete. The princess, overjoyed at being once more in the open air, was walking a little in advance of her party, when suddenly the earth opened under her feet and closed again after swallowing her up. The queen fainted away with terror 
and the younger princess burst into floods of tears and could hardly be dragged away from the fatal spot, whilst the court was overwhelmed with horror at so great a calamity. Orders were given to bore the earth to a great depth, but in vain. Not a trace of the vanished princess was to be found. She sank right through the earth and found herself in a desert place, with nothing but rocks and trees, and no sign of any human being. The only living creature she saw was a very pretty little dog, who ran up to her and at once began to caress her. She took him in her arms, and after playing with him for a little, put him down again. When he started off in front of her, looking round from time to time, as though begging her to follow. She let him lead her on, and presently reached a little hill, from which she saw a valley full of lovely fruit trees, bearing flowers and fruit together. The ground was also covered with fruit and flowers, and in the middle of the valley rose a fountain surrounded by a velvety lawn. The princess hastened to this charming spot, and, sitting down on the grass, began to think over the misfortune which had befallen her, and burst into tears as she reflected on her sad condition. The fruit and clear fresh water would, she knew, prevent her from dying of hunger or thirst, but how could she escape if any wild beast appeared and tried to devour her? At length, Having thought over every possible evil which could happen, the princess tried to distract her mind by playing with the little dog. She spent the whole day near the fountain, but as night drew on, she wondered what she should do, when she noticed that the little dog was pulling at her dress. She paid no heed to him at first, but as he continued to pull her dress and then run a few steps in one particular direction, she at last decided to follow him. He stopped before a rock, with a large opening in the center, which he evidently wished her to enter. The princess did so, and discovered a large and beautiful cave, lit up by the brilliancy of the stones with which it was lined, with a little couch covered with soft moss in one corner. She lay down on it, and the dog at once nestled at her feet. Tired out with all she had gone through, she soon fell asleep. Next morning she was awakened very early by the songs of many birds. The little dog woke up too, and sprang round her in his most caressing manner. She got up and went outside, the dog as before running on in front and turning back constantly to take her dress and draw her on. She let him have his way, and he soon led her back to the beautiful garden where she had spent part of the day before. Here she ate some fruit, drank some water of the fountain, and felt as if she had made an excellent meal. She walked about among the flowers, played with her little dog, and at night returned to sleep in the cave. In this way the princess passed several months and as her first terrors died away, she gradually became more resigned to her fate. The little dog, too, was a great comfort, and her constant companion. One day she noticed that he seemed very sad, and did not even caress her as usual. Fearing he might be ill, she carried him to a spot where she had seen him eat some particular herbs, hoping they might do him good but he would not touch them. He spent all the night, too, sighing and groaning as if in great pain. At last the princess fell asleep, and when she awoke her first thought was for her little pet. But not finding him at her feet as usual, she ran out of the cave to look for him. As she stepped out of the cave, she caught sight of an old man who hurried away so fast that she had barely time to see him before he disappeared. This was a fresh surprise, and almost as great a shock as the loss of her little dog, who had been so faithful to her ever since the first day she had seen him. She wondered if he had strayed away, or if the old man had stolen him. Tormented by all kinds of thoughts and fears, 
she wandered on, when suddenly she felt herself wrapped in a thick cloud and carried through the air. She made no resistance, and before very long found herself, to her great surprise, in an avenue leading to the palace in which she had been born. No sign of the cloud anywhere. As the princess approached the palace, she perceived that everyone was dressed in black, and she was filled with fear as to the cause of this mourning. She hastened on, and was soon recognized and welcomed with shouts of joy. Her sister, hearing the cheers, ran out and embraced the wanderer, with tears of happiness, telling her that the shock of her disappearance had been so terrible that their mother had only survived it a few days. Since then, the younger princess had worn the crown, which she now resigned to her sister, to whom it by right belonged. But the elder wished to refuse it, and would only accept the crown on condition that her sister should share in all the power. The first acts of the new queen were to do honor to the memory of her dear mother, and to shower every mark of generous affection on her sister. Then, being still very grieved at the loss of her little dog, she had a careful search made for him in every country and when nothing could be heard of him, she was so grieved that she offered half her kingdom to whoever should restore him to her. Many gentlemen of the court, tempted by the thought of such a reward, set off in all directions in search of the dog, but all returned empty-handed to the queen, who in despair announced that since life was unbearable without her little dog, she would give her hand in marriage to the man who brought him back. The prospect of such a prize quickly turned the court into a desert, nearly every courtier starting on the quest. Whilst they were away, the queen was informed one day that a very ill-looking man wished to speak with her. She desired him to be shown into a room where she was sitting with her sister. On entering her presence, he said that he was prepared to give the queen her little dog if she, on her side, was ready to keep her word. The princess was the first to speak. She said that the queen had no right to marry without the consent of the nation, and that on so important an occasion the general council must be summoned. The queen could not say anything against this statement, but she ordered an apartment in the palace to be given to the man, and desired the council to meet on the following day. Next day, Accordingly, the council assembled in great state, and by the princess's advice it was decided to offer the man a large sum of money for the dog, and should he refuse it, to banish him from the kingdom without seeing the queen again. The man refused the price offered, and left the hall. The princess informed the queen of what had passed, and the queen approved of all, but added that as she was her own mistress, she had made up her mind to abdicate her throne, and to wander through the world till she had found her little dog. The princess was much alarmed by such a resolution, and implored the queen to change her mind. Whilst they were discussing the subject, one of the chamberlains appeared to inform the queen that the bay was covered with ships. The two sisters ran to the balcony, and saw a large fleet in full sail for the port. In a little time, they came to the conclusion that the ships must come from a friendly nation, as every vessel was decked with gay flags, streamers, and pennons, and the way was led by a small ship flying a great white flag of peace. The queen sent a special messenger to the harbor, and was soon informed that the fleet belonged to the prince of the Emerald Isles, who begged leave to land in her kingdom, and to present his humble respects to her. The queen at once sent some of the court dignitaries to receive the prince, and bid him welcome. She awaited him, seated on her throne, but rose on his appearance, and went a few steps to meet him then begged him to be seated, and for about an hour kept him in close conversation. 
The prince was then conducted to a splendid suite of apartments, and the next day he asked for a private audience. He was admitted to the queen's own sitting-room, where she was sitting alone with her sister. After the first greetings, the prince informed the queen that he had some very strange things to tell her, which she only would know to be true. Madam, said he, I am a neighbor of the queen of all the isles, and a small isthmus connects part of my states with hers. One day, when hunting a stag, I had the misfortune to meet her, and not recognizing her, I did not stop to salute her with all proper ceremony. You, madam, know better than any one how revengeful she is, and that she is also a mistress of magic. I learnt both facts to my cost. The ground opened under my feet, and I soon found myself in a far distant region, transformed into a little dog, under which shape I had the honor to meet your majesty. After six months, the queen's vengeance not being yet satisfied, she further changed me into a hideous old man, and in this form I was so afraid of being unpleasant in your eyes, madam, that I hid myself in the depths of the woods, where I spent three months more. At the end of that time I was so fortunate as to meet a benevolent fairy, who delivered me from the proud queen's power, and told me all your adventures and where to find you. I now come to offer you a heart which has been entirely yours, madam, since first we met in the desert. A few days later, a herald was sent through the kingdom to proclaim the joyful news of the marriage of the Queen of the Flowery Isles with the young prince. They lived happily for many years, and ruled their people well. As for the bad queen, whose vanity and jealousy had caused so much mischief, the fairies took all of her power away for a punishment. End of chapter 14 Recording by Pete Williams, Pittsburgh, PA Chapter 15 of The Grey Fairy Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Bologna Times. The Grey Fairy Book. Edited by Andrew Lang. Chapter 15. Eudea and Her Seven Brothers. Once upon a time there was a man and his wife who had seven boys. The children lived in the open air and grew big and strong, and the six eldest spent part of every day hunting wild beasts. The youngest did not care so much about sport, and he often stayed with his mother. One morning, however, as the whole seven were going out for a long expedition, they said to their aunt, Dear aunt, if a baby sister comes into the world today, wave a white handkerchief, and we will return immediately. But if it is only a boy, just brandish a sickle, and we will go on with what we are doing. Now the baby, when it arrived, really proved to be a girl, but as the aunt could not bear the boys, she thought it was a good opportunity to get rid of them. So she waved the sickle. And when the seven brothers saw the sign, they said, Now we have nothing to go back for, and plunged deeper into the desert. The little girl soon grew to be a big girl, and she was called by all her friends, though she did not know it, Eudea, who had driven her seven brothers into strange lands. One day, when she had been quarreling with her playmates, the oldest among them said to her, It is a pity you were born, as ever since your brothers have been obliged to roam about the world. Eudea did not answer, but went home to her mother and asked her, Have I really got brothers? Yes, replied her mother, seven of them. But they went away the day you were born, and I have never heard of them since. Then the girl said, I will go and look for them till I find them. My dear child, answered her mother, it is fifteen years since they left, and no man has seen them. How will you know which way to go? Oh, I will follow them, north and south, 
east and west, and though I may travel far, yet some day I will find them. Then her mother said no more, but gave her a camel and some food, and a negro and his wife to take care of her, and she fastened a cowrie shell round the camel's neck for a charm, and bade her daughter go in peace. During the first day the party journeyed on without any adventures, but the second morning the negro said to the girl, Get down, and let the negress ride instead of you. Mother! cried Eudea. What is it? asked her mother. Barca wants me to dismount from my camel. Leave her alone, Barca, commanded the mother, and Barca did not dare to persist. But on the following day he said again to Eudea, Get down, and let the negress ride instead of you. And though Eudea called to her mother, she was too far away, and the mother never heard her. Then the negro seized her roughly, and threw her on the ground, and said to his wife, Climb up, and the negress climbed up, while the girl walked by the side. She had meant to ride all the way on her camel, as her feet were bare, and the stones cut them till the blood came. But she had to walk on till night, when they halted, and the next morning it was the same thing again. Weary and bleeding, the poor girl began to cry, and implored the negro to let her ride, if only for a little. But he took no notice, except to bid her walk a little faster. By and by they passed a caravan, and the negro stopped and asked the leader if they had come across seven young men, who were thought to be hunting somewhere about. And the man answered, Go straight on, and by midday you will reach the castle where they live. When he heard this, the black melted some pitch in the sun, and smeared the girl with it till she looked as much a negro as he did. Next he bade his wife get down from the camel, and told Eudea to mount, which she was thankful to do. So they arrived at her brother's castle. Leaving the camel kneeling at the entrance for Eudea to dismount, the negro knocked loudly at the door, which was opened by the youngest brother, all the others being away hunting. He did not, of course, recognize Eudea, but he knew the negro and his wife, and welcomed them gladly, adding, But who does the other negress belong to? Oh, that is your sister, said they. My sister? But she is coal black. That may be, but she is your sister for all that. The young man asked no more questions, but took them into the castle, and he himself waited outside till his brothers came home. As soon as they were alone, the negro whispered to Eudea, If you dare tell your brothers that I made you walk, or that I smeared you with pitch, I will kill you. Oh, I will be sure to say nothing, replied the girl, trembling, and at that moment the six elder brothers appeared in sight. I have some good news for you, said the youngest, hastening to meet them. Our sister is here. Nonsense, they answered. We have no sister. You know the child that was born was a boy. But that is not true, replied he, and here she is with the negro and his wife. Only she, too, is black, he added softly, but his brothers did not hear him, and pushed past joyfully. How are you, good old Barca? they said to the negro, and how comes it that we never knew that we had a sister till now? They greeted Eudea warmly, while she shed tears of relief and gladness. The next morning they all agreed that they would not go out hunting, and the eldest brother took Eudea on his knee, and she combed his hair and talked to him of their home till the tears ran down his cheeks and dropped on her bare arm, and where the tears fell a white mark was made. Then the brother took a cloth and rubbed the place, and he saw that she was not black at all. "'Tell me, who painted you over like this?' cried he. "'I am afraid to tell you,' sobbed the girl. "'The negro will kill me.' "'Afraid? And with seven brothers?' "'Well, I will tell you then,' she answered. "'The negro forced me to dismount from the camel and let his wife ride instead. "'And the stones cut my feet till they bled, and I had to bind them. "'And after that, when we heard your castle was near by, "'he took pitch and smeared my body with it. "'Then the brother rushed in wrath from the room and, seizing his sword, cut off first the negro's head and then his wife's. He next brought in some warm water and washed his sister all over, till her skin was white and shining again. Ah, now we see that you are our sister, they all said. What fools the negro must have thought us to believe for an instant that we could have a sister who was black. And all that day and the next they remained in the castle. But on the third morning they said to their sister, 
Dear sister, you must lock yourself into this castle with only the cat for company, and be very careful never to eat anything which she does not eat, too. You must be sure to give her a bit of everything. In seven days we shall be back again. All right, she answered, and locked herself into the castle with the cat. On the eighth day the brothers came home. How are you? they asked. You have not been anxious? No, why should I be anxious? The gates were fast locked, and in the castle are seven doors, and the seventh is of iron. What is there to frighten me? No one will try to hurt us, said the brother, for they fear us greatly. But for yourself we implore you to do nothing without consulting the cat, who has grown up in the house, and take care never to neglect her advice. All right, replied Eudea, and whatever I eat, she shall have half. Capital! And if ever you are in danger, the cat will come and tell us. Only elves and pigeons, which fly round your window, know where to find us. This is the first I have heard of the pigeons, said Eudea. Why did you not speak of them before? We always leave them food and water for seven days. Ah, sighed the girl, if I had only known, I would have given them fresh food and fresh water, for after seven days anything becomes bad. Would it not be better if I fed them every day? Much better, said they, and we shall feel any kindness you do towards the cat or the pigeons, exactly as if they were shown to ourselves. Set your minds at ease, answered the girl. I will treat them as if they were my brothers. That night the brothers slept in the castle. But after breakfast, next morning, they buckled on their weapons and mounted their horses and rode off to their hunting grounds, calling out to their sister, Mind you let nobody in till we come back. Very well, cried she, and kept the doors carefully locked for seven days, and on the eighth the brothers returned as before. Then, after spending one evening with her, they departed as soon as they had done breakfast. Directly they were out of sight, Eudea began to clean the house, and among the dust she found a bean which she ate. What are you eating? asked the cat. Nothing, said she. Open your mouth and let me see. The girl did as she was told, and then the cat said, Why did you not give me half? I forgot, answered she, but there are plenty of beans about. You can have as many as you like. No. That won't do. I want half of that particular bean. But how can I give it to you? I tell you I have eaten it. I can roast you a hundred others. No, I want half of that one. Oh, do as you like. Only go away, cried she. So the cat ran straight to the kitchen fire and spit on it and put it out. And when Eudea came to cook the supper, she had nothing to light it with. Why did you put the fire out? said she. just to show you how nicely you would be able to cook the supper. Didn't you tell me to do what I liked? The girl left the kitchen and climbed up on the roof of the castle and looked out. Far, far away, so far that she could hardly see it, was the glow of a fire. I will go and fetch a burning coal from there and light my fire, thought she, and opened the door of the castle. When she reached the place where the fire was kindled, a hideous man-eater was crouching over it. Peace be with you, grandfather, said she. The same to you, replied the man eater. What brings you here, Eudea? I came to ask for a lump of burning coal to light my fire with. Do you want a big lump or a little lump? Why, what difference does it make? said she. If you have a big lump, you must give me a strip of your skin from your ear to your thumb, and if you have a little lump, You must give me a strip from your ear to your little finger. Eudea, who thought that one sounded as bad as the other, said she would take the big lump, and when the man eater had cut the skin, she went home again, and as she hastened on, a raven beheld the blood on the ground and plastered it with earth, and stayed by her till she reached the castle. And as she entered the door, he flew past, and she shrieked from fright, for up to that moment, She had not seen him. In her terror, she called after him, May you get the same start as you have given me? Why should you wish me harm? asked the raven, pausing in his flight, when I have done you a service. What service have you done me? said she. 
Oh, you shall soon see, replied the raven, and with his bill he scraped away all the earth he had smeared over the blood, and then flew away. In the night the man-eater got up and followed the blood till he came to Udea's castle. He entered through the gate, which she had left open, and went on till he reached the inside of the house. But there he was stopped by the seven doors, six of wood and one of iron, and all fast locked. And he called through them, O oh, Udea, what did you see your grandfather doing? I saw him spread silk under him, and silk over him, and lay himself down in a four-post bed. When he heard that, the man-eater broke in one door, and laughed, and went away. And the second night he came back, and asked her again what she had seen her grandfather doing, and she answered him as before, and he broke in another door, and laughed, and went away, and so each night till he reached the seventh door. Then the maiden wrote a letter to her brothers, and bound it round the neck of a pigeon, and said to it, O oh, thou pigeon, that served my father and my grandfather, carry this letter to my brothers, and come back at once. And the pigeon flew away. It flew, and it flew, and it flew, till it found the brothers. The eldest unfastened the letter from the pigeon's neck, and read what his sister had written. I am in a great strait, my brothers. If you do not rescue me to-night, to-morrow I shall be no longer living, for the man-eater has broken open six doors, and only the iron door is left. So haste, haste, post-haste. Quick, quick, my brothers, cried he. What is the matter? asked they. If we cannot reach our sister to-night, to-morrow she will be the prey of the man-eater. And without more words they sprang on their horses and rode like the wind. The gate of the castle was thrown down, and they entered the court and called loudly to their sister. But the poor girl was so ill with fear and anxiety that she could not even speak. Then the brothers dismounted and passed through the six open doors, till they stood before the iron one, which was still shut. Eudea, open! they cried. It is only your brothers. And she arose and unlocked the door, and throwing herself on the neck of the eldest, burst into tears. Tell us what has happened, he said, and how the man-eater traced you here. It is all the cat's fault, replied Eudea. She put out my fire so that I could not cook, all about a bean. I ate one and forgot to give her any of it. But we told you so particularly, said the eldest brother, never to eat anything without sharing it with the cat. Yes, but I tell you, I forgot, answered Eudea. Does the man-eater come here every night? asked the brothers. Every night, said Eudea, and he breaks one door in, and then goes away. Then all the brothers cried together, We will dig a great hole, and fill it with burning wood, and spread a covering over the top, and when the man-eater arrives we will push him into it. So they all set to work, and prepared the great hole, and set fire to the wood, till it was reduced to a mass of glowing charcoal. And when the man-eater came, and called as usual, Eudea, what did you see your grandfather doing? She answered, I saw him pull off the ass's skin and devour the ass, and he fell into the fire, and the fire burned him up. Then the man-eater was filled with rage, and he flung himself upon the iron door and burst it in. On the other side stood Eudea's seven brothers, who said, Come, rest yourself a little on this mat. And the man-eater sat down, and he fell right into the burning pit, which was under the mat, and they heaped on more wood, till nothing was left of him, not even a bone. Only one of his finger-nails was blown away, and fell into an upper chamber where Eudea was standing, and stuck under one of the nails of her own fingers, and she sank lifeless to the earth. Meanwhile her brothers sat below waiting for her, and wondering why she did not come. "'What can have happened to her?' exclaimed the eldest brother. "'Perhaps she has fallen into the fire, too.' So one of the brothers ran upstairs and found his sister stretched on the floor. Eudea, Eudea, he cried, but she did not move or reply. Then he saw that she was dead, and rushed down to his brothers in the courtyard and called out, Come quickly, our sister is dead. In a moment they were all beside her, and knew that it was true, and they made a bier and laid her on it, and placed her across a camel, and said to the camel, Take her to her mother, but be careful not to halt by the way, and let no man capture you, and see you kneel down before no man, save him who shall say, String, to you. 
but to him who says string then kneel so the camel started and when it had accomplished half its journey it met three men who ran after it in order to catch it but they could not then they cried stop but the camel only went the faster the three men panted behind till one said to the others wait a minute the string of my sandal is broken the camel caught the word string and knelt down at once and the men came up and found a dead girl lying on a bier with a ring on her finger and as one the young men took hold of her hand to pull off the ring he knocked out the man-eater's finger-nail which had stuck there and the maiden sat up and said let him live who gave me life and slay him who slew me and when the camel heard the maiden speak it turned and carried her back to her brothers now the brothers were still seated in the court bewailing their sister and their eyes were dim with weeping so that they could hardly see and when the camel stood before them they said perhaps it has brought back our sister and rose to give it a beating but the camel knelt down and the girl dismounted and they flung themselves on her neck and wept more than ever for gladness tell me said the eldest as soon as he could speak how it all came about and what killed you i was waiting in the upper chamber said she and a nail of the man-eaters stuck under my nail and i fell dead upon the ground that is all i know but who pulled out the nail asked he a man took hold of my hand and tried to pull off my ring and the nail jumped out and i was alive again and when the camel heard me say let him live who gave me life slay him who slew me it turned and brought me back to the castle that is my story she was silent and the eldest brother spoke will you listen to what i have to say my brothers and they replied how should we not hear you are you not our father as well as our brother then this is my advice let us take our sister back to our father and mother that we may see them once more before they die and the young men agreed and they mounted their horses and placed their sister in a litter on the camel so they set out at the end of five days journey they reached the old home where their father and mother dwelt alone and the heart of their father rejoiced and he said to them dear sons why did you go away and leave your mother and me to weep for you night and day dear father answered the son let us rest a little now and then i will tell you everything from the beginning all right replied the father and waited patiently for three days and on the morning of the fourth day the eldest brother said dear father would you like to hear our adventures certainly i should well it was our aunt who was the cause of our leaving home for we agreed that if the baby was a sister she should wave a white handkerchief and if it was a brother she should brandish a sickle for then there would be nothing to come back for and we might wander far away now our aunt could not bear us and hated us to live in the same house with her so she brandished the sickle and we went away that is all our story and that is all this story End of chapter 15、Chapter、16 of the Gray Fairy Book Edited by Andrew Lang, Chapter Sixteen: The White Wolf. Once upon a time, there was a king who had three daughters. They were all beautiful, but the youngest was the fairest of the three. Now it happened that one day their father had to set out for a tour in a distant part of his kingdom. Before he left, his youngest daughter made him promise to bring her back a wreath of wild flowers. When the king was ready to return to his palace. He bethought himself that he would like to take home presents to each of his three daughters, so he went into a jeweler's shop and bought a beautiful necklace for the eldest princess. Then he went to a rich merchant's and bought a dress embroidered in gold and silver thread for the second princess. But in none of the flower shops nor in the market could he find the wreath of wild flowers that his youngest daughter had set her heart on. So he had to set out on his homeward way without it. Now his journey led him through a thick forest. While he was still about four miles distant from his palace, 
he noticed a white wolf squatting on the roadside and behold on the head of the wolf there was a wreath of wild flowers then the king called to the coachman and ordered him to get down from his seat and fetch him the wreath from the wolf's head but the wolf heard the order and said my lord and king i will let you have the wreath but i must have something in return what do you want answered the king i will gladly give you rich treasure in exchange for it i do not want rich treasure replied the wolf only promise to give me the first thing that meets you on your way to your castle in three days i shall come and fetch it and the king thought to himself i am still a good long way from home i am sure to meet a wild animal or a bird on the road it will be quite safe to promise so he consented and carried the wreath away with him but all along the road he met no living creature till he turned into the palace gates where his youngest daughter was waiting to welcome him home that evening the king was very sad remembering his promise and when he told the queen what had happened she too shed bitter tears and the youngest princess asked them why they both looked so sad and why they wept then her father told her what a price he would have to pay for the wreath of wild flowers he had brought home to her for in three days a white wolf would come and claim her and carry her away and they would never see her again but the queen thought and thought and at last she hit upon a plan there was in the palace a servant-maid the same age and the same height as the princess and the queen dressed her up in a beautiful dress belonging to her daughter and determined to give her to the white wolf who would never know the difference on the third day the wolf strode into the palace yard and up the great stairs to the room where the king and the queen were seated i have come to claim your promise he said give me your youngest daughter then they led the servant maid up to him and he said to her you must mount on my back and i will take you to my castle and with these words he swung her onto his back and left the palace when they reached the place where he had met the king and given him the wreath of wild flowers he stopped and told her to dismount that they might rest a little so they sat down by the roadside i wonder said the wolf what your father would do if this forest belonged to him and the girl answered my father is a poor man so he would cut down the trees and saw them into planks and he would sell the planks and we would never be poor again but would always have enough to eat then the wolf knew that he had not got the real princess and he swung the servant maid on his back and carried her to the castle and he strode angrily into the king's chamber and spoke give me the real princess at once if you deceive me again i will cause such a storm to burst over your palace that the walls will fall in and you will all be buried in the ruins then the king and queen wept but they saw there was no escape so they sent for their youngest daughter and the king said to her dearest child you must go with the white wolf for i promised you to him and i must keep my word so the princess got ready to leave her home but first she went to her room to fetch her wreath of wild flowers which she took with her then the white wolf swung her on his back and bore her away but when they came to the place where he had rested with the servant maid he told her to dismount that they might rest for a little at the roadside then he turned to her and said i wonder what your father would do if this forest belonged to him and the princess answered my father would cut down the trees and turn it into a beautiful park and gardens and he and his courtiers would come and wander among the glades in the summer time this is the real princess said the wolf to himself but aloud he said mount once more on my back and i will bear you to my castle and when she was seated on his back he set out through the woods and he ran and ran and ran till at last he stopped in front of a stately courtyard with massive gates this is a beautiful castle said the princess as the gates swung back and she stepped inside 
"'If only I were not so far away from my father and my mother!' But the wolf answered, "'At the end of a year we will pay a visit to your father and mother.' And at these words the white furry skin slipped from his back, and the princess saw that he was not a wolf at all, but a beautiful youth, tall and stately, and he gave her his hand and led her up the castle stairs. One day, at the end of half a year, he came into her room and said, "'My dear one, you must get ready for a wedding. Your eldest sister is going to be married, and I will take you to your father's palace. When the wedding is over, I shall come and fetch you home. I will whistle outside the gate, and when you hear me, pay no heed to what your father or mother say. Leave your dancing and feasting, and come to me at once. For if I have to leave without you, you will never find your way back alone through the forests. When the princess was ready to start, she found that he had put on his white fur skin and was changed back into the wolf, and he swung her on to his back and set out with her to her father's palace, where he left her, while he himself returned home alone. But in the evening he went back to fetch her, and standing outside the palace gate he gave a long, loud whistle. In the midst of her dancing the princess heard the sound, and at once she went to him, and he swung her on his back and bore her away to his castle. Again, at the end of half a year, the prince came into her room as the white wolf and said, Dear heart, you must prepare for the wedding of your second sister. I will take you to your father's palace today, and we will remain there together till tomorrow morning. So they went together to the wedding. In the evening, when the two were alone together, he dropped his fur skin, and ceasing to be a wolf became a prince again. But they did not know that the princess's mother was hidden in the room. When she saw the white skin lying on the floor, she crept out of the room and sent a servant to fetch the skin and to burn it in the kitchen fire. The moment the flames touched the skin, there was a fearful clap of thunder heard and the prince disappeared out of the palace gate in a whirlwind, and returned to his palace alone. But the princess was heartbroken, and spent the night weeping bitterly. Next morning she set out to find her way back to the castle, but she wandered through the woods and forests, and she could find no path or track to guide her. For fourteen days she roamed in the forest, sleeping under the trees, and living upon wild berries and roots and at last she reached a little house. She opened the door and went in, and found the wind seated in the room all by himself, and she spoke to the wind and said, Wind, have you seen the white wolf? And the wind answered, All day and all night I have been blowing round the world, and I have only just come home, but I have not seen him. But he gave her a pair of shoes, in which he told her she would be able to walk a hundred miles with every step. Then she walked through the air till she reached a star, and she said, Tell me, star, have you seen the white wolf? And the star answered, I have been shining all night, and I have not seen him. But the star gave her a pair of shoes, and told her that if she put them on, she would be able to walk two hundred miles at a stride. So she drew them on, and she walked to the moon, and she said, Dear moon, have you not seen the white wolf? But the moon answered, All night long I have been sailing through the heavens, and I have only just come home. But I did not see him. But he gave her a pair of shoes, in which she would be able to cover four hundred miles with each stride. So she went to the sun and said, Dear son, have you seen the white wolf? And the son answered, Yes, I have seen him, and he has chosen another bride, for he thought you had left him and would never return, and he is preparing for the wedding. But I will help you. Here are a pair of shoes. If you put these on, you will be able to walk on glass or ice and to climb the steepest places. And here is a spinning wheel, with which you will be able to spin moss into silk. When you leave me, you will reach a glass mountain. 
put on the shoes that I have given you, and with them you will be able to climb it quite easily. At the summit you will find the palace of the White Wolf. Then the princess set out, and before long she reached the glass mountain, and at the summit she found the White Wolf's palace, as the sun had said. But no one recognized her, as she had disguised herself as an old woman, and had wound a shawl round her head. Great preparations were going on in the palace for the wedding, which was to take place next day. Then the princess, still disguised as an old woman, took out her spinning wheel, and began to spin moss into silk. And as she spun, the new bride passed by, and seeing the moss turn into silk, she said to the old woman, Little mother, I wish you would give me that spinning wheel. And the princess answered, I will give it you if you will allow me to sleep to-night on the mat outside the prince's door. And the bride replied, Yes, you may sleep on the mat outside the door. So the princess gave her the spinning wheel, and that night, winding the shawl all round her, so that no one could recognize her, she lay down on the mat outside the white wolf's door. And when everyone in the palace was asleep, she began to tell the whole of her story. She told how she had been one of the three sisters, and that she had been the youngest and the fairest of the three, and that her father had betrothed her to a white wolf. And she told how she had gone first to the wedding of one sister, and then with her husband to the wedding of the other sister, and how her mother had ordered the servant to throw the white fur skin into the kitchen fire. And then she told of her wanderings through the forest, and of how she had sought the white wolf weeping and how the wind and star and moon and sun had befriended her, and had helped her to reach his palace. And when the white wolf heard all the story, he knew that it was his first wife who had sought him, and had found him after such great dangers and difficulties. But he said nothing, for he waited till the next day, when many guests, kings and princes from far countries, were coming to his wedding. Then, when all the guests were assembled in the banqueting hall, he spoke to them and said, Hearken to me, ye kings and princes, for I have something to tell you. I have lost the key of my treasure casket, so I ordered a new one to be made. But I have since found the old one. Now, which of these keys is the better? Then all the kings and royal guests answered, certainly the old key is better than the new one then said the wolf if that is so my former bride is better than my new one and he sent for the new bride and he gave her in marriage to one of the princes who was present and then he turned to his guest and said and here is my former bride and the beautiful princess was led into the room and seated beside him on his throne i thought she had forgotten me and that she would never return. But she has sought me everywhere, and now we are together once more, we shall never part again. End of chapter 16 Chapter 17 of the Grey Fairy Book This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ashley LeBlanc The Grey Fairy Book, edited by Andrew Lang Chapter 17 Mohammed with the Magic Finger Once upon a time, there lived a woman who had a son and a daughter. One morning, she said to them, I have heard of a town where there is no such thing as death. Let us go and dwell there. So she broke up her house and went away with her son and daughter. When she reached the city, the first thing she did was to look about and see if there was any churchyard, and when she found none, she exclaimed, This is a delightful spot. We will stay here forever. By and by, her son grew to be a man, and he took for a wife a girl who had become born in the town but after a while he grew restless and went away on his travels leaving his mother his wife and his sister behind him 
he had not been gone many weeks when one evening his mother said i am not well my head aches dreadfully what did you say inquired her daughter-in-law my head feels ready to split replied the old woman the daughter-in-law asked no more questions but left the house and went in haste to some butchers in the next street i have got a woman to sell what will you give me for her said she the butchers answered that they must see the woman first and they all returned together then the butchers took the woman and told her they must kill her but why she asked because they said it is always our custom that when persons are ill and complain of their head they should be killed at once it is a much better way than leaving them to die a natural death very well replied the woman but leave i pray you my lungs and my liver untouched until my son comes back then give both to him but the men took them out at once and gave them to the daughter-in-law saying put away these things until your husband returns and the daughter-in-law took them and hid them in a secret place when the old woman's daughter who had been in the woods heard that her mother had been killed while she was out she was filled with fright and ran away as fast as she could at last she reached a lonely spot far from the town where she thought she was safe and sat down on a stone and wept bitterly as she was sitting sobbing a man passed by what is the matter little girl answer me i will be your friend ah oh, sir they have killed my mother my brother is far away and i have nobody will you come with me asked the man thankfully said she and he led her down down under the earth till they reached a great city then he married her and in course of time she had a son and the baby was known throughout the city as mohammed with the magic finger because whenever he stuck out his little finger he was able to see anything that was happening for as far as two days distance by and by as the boy was growing bigger his uncle returned from his long journey and went straight to his wife where are my mother and sister he asked but his wife answered have something to eat first then i will tell you but he replied how can i eat till i know what has become of them then she fetched from the upper chamber a box full of money which she laid before him saying that is the price of your mother she sold well what do you mean he gasped oh your mother complained one day that her head was aching so i got in two butchers and they agreed to take her however i have got her lungs and liver hidden till you came back in a safe place and my sister well while the people were chopping up your mother she ran away and i heard no more of her Give me my mother's liver and lungs, said the young man, and she gave them to him. Then he put them in his pocket and went away, saying, I can no longer in this horrible town. I go to seek my sister. Now, one day, the little boy stretched out his finger and said to his mother, My uncle is coming. Where is he? she asked. He is still two days' journey off, looking for us, but he will soon be here and in two days as the boy had foretold the uncle had found the hole in the earth and arrived at the gate of the city all his money was spent and not knowing where his sister lived he began to beg all the people he saw here comes my uncle called out the little boy where asked his mother here at the house door and the woman ran out and embraced him and wept over him when they could both speak he said my sister where were you when they killed my mother i was absent when they slew her she replied and as i could do nothing i ran away but you my brother how did you get here by chance he said after i had wandered far but i did not know i should find you my little boy told me you were coming she explained when you were yet two days distance he alone of all men has that great gift but she did not tell him that her husband could change himself into a serpent a dog or a monster whenever he pleased he was a very rich man and possessed large herds of camels goats 
sheep, cattle, horses, and asses, all the best of their kind. And the next morning the sister said, Dear brother, go and watch our sheep, and then you are thirsty, drink their milk. Very well, answered he, and he went. Soon after she said again, Dear brother, go and watch our goats. But why? I like tending sheep better. Oh, it is much nicer to be a goat herd, he said. So he took the goats out. When he was gone, she said to her husband, You must kill my brother, for I cannot have him living here with me. But my dear, why should I? He has done me no harm. I wish you to kill him, she answered, or if not, I will leave. Oh, all right then, he said. Tomorrow I will change myself into a serpent and hide myself in the date barrel. And when he comes to fetch dates, I will sting him in the hand. That will do very well, said she. When the sun was up the next day, she called to her brother, Go and mind the goats. Yes, of course, he replied. But the little boy called out, Uncle, I want to come with you. Delighted, said the uncle, and they started together. After they got out of sight of the house, the boy said to him, Dear uncle, my father is going to kill you. He changed himself into a serpent and has hidden himself in a date barrel. My mother has told him to do it. And what am I to do? said the uncle. I will tell you. When we bring the goats back to the house and my mother says to you, I am sure you must be hungry. Get a few dates out of the cask. Just say to me, I'm not feeling very well, Mohammed. You go and get them for me. So when they reached the house and the sister came out to meet them, saying, Dear brother, you must certainly be hungry. Go and get a few dates. But he answered, I am not feeling very well. Mohammed, you go and get them for me. Of course I will, replied the little boy, and ran out to the cask. No, no, his mother called after him. Come here directly. Let your uncle fetch them himself. But the boy would not listen, and crying out to her, I would rather get them thrust his hand into the date cask. Instead of the fruit, it struck against something cold and slimy, and he whispered softly, Keep still, it is I, your son, when he picked up his dates and went away to his uncle. Here they are, dear uncle, eat as many as you want, and his uncle ate them. When he saw that the uncle did not mean to come near the cask, the serpent crawled out and regained his proper shape. I am thankful I did not kill him, he said to his wife, for after all, he is my brother-in-law, and it would have been a great sin. Either you kill him, or I leave you, said she. Well, well, sighed the man, tomorrow I will do it. The woman let the night go by without doing anything further, but at daybreak she said to her brother, Get up, brother, it is time to take the goats to the pasture. All right, cried he. I will come with you, uncle cried out the little boy yes come along replied he but the mother ran up saying the child must not go out in this cold or he will be ill to which he only answered nonsense i'm going so it is no use your talking i'm going i am i am then go that she said and so they started driving the goats in front of them when they reached the pasture the boy said to his uncle dear uncle this night my father means to kill you while we are away, he will creep into your room and hide in the straw. Directly we get home, my mother will say to you, Take that straw and give it to the sheep, and if you do, he will bite you. Then what am I to do? Oh, do not be afraid, dear uncle. I will kill my father myself. All right, replied the uncle. As they drove back the goats towards the house, the sister cried, Be quick, dear brother. Go and get me some straw for the sheep. Let me go, said the boy. You are not big enough. Your uncle will get it, replied she. We will both get it, answered the boy. Come, uncle, let us go and fetch that straw. All right, replied the uncle, and they went to the door of the room. It seems very dark, said the boy. I must go and get a light. And when they came back with one, he set fire to the straw, and the servant was burnt. Then the mother broke into sobs and tears. Oh, you wretched boy, what have you done? Your father was in that straw, and you have killed him. Now how was I to know my father was lying in the straw instead of in the kitchen, said the boy. But his mother only wept more and sobbed out, From this day you have no father. You must do without him best you can. 
Why did you marry a serpent? asked the boy. I thought he was a man. How did he learn those odd tricks? As the sun rose, she woke her brother and said, Go and take the goats to pasture. I will come too, said the little boy. Go then, said his mother, and they went together. On the way, the boy began, Dear uncle, this night my mother means to kill both of us by poisoning us with the bones of the serpent, which she will grind to powder and sprinkle in our food. And what are we to do? asked the uncle. I will kill her, dear uncle. I do not want either a father or a mother like that. When they came home in the evening, they saw the woman preparing supper and secretly scattering the powdered bones of the serpent on one side of the dish. On the other, where she meant to eat herself, there was no poison. And the boy whispered to his uncle, Dear uncle, be sure you eat from the same side of the dish as I do. All right, said the uncle. So there, all three sat down at the table, but before they helped themselves, the boy said, I am thirsty, mother. Will you get me some milk? Very well, said she, but you had better begin your supper. And when she came back with the milk, they were both eating busily. Sit down and have something, too, said the boy, and she sat down and helped herself from the dish, but at that very moment she sank dead upon the ground. She has got what she meant for us observed the boy, and now we will sell all the sheep and cattle. So the sheep and cattle were sold, and the uncle and nephew took the money and went to see the world. For ten days they traveled through the desert, and then they came to a place where the road parted in two. Uncle, said the boy. Well, what is it? replied he. You see these two roads? You must take one, and I the other, for the time has come when we must part. But the uncle cried, No, no, my boy, we will keep together always. Alas, that cannot be, said the boy, so tell me which way you will go. I will go to the west, said the uncle. One word before I leave you, continued the boy, beware of a man who has red hair and blue eyes. Take no service under him. All right, replied the uncle, and they parted. For three days the man wandered on without any food till he was very hungry then when he was almost fainting a stranger met him and said will you work for me by contract asked the man yes by contract replied the stranger and whichever of us breaks it shall have a strip of skin taken from his body all right replied the man what shall i have to do every day you must take the sheep out to pasture and carry my old mother on your shoulder taking great care her feet shall never touch the ground and besides that you must catch every evening seven singing birds for my seven sons that is easily done said the man then they went back together and the stranger said here are your sheep now stoop down and let my mother climb on your back very good answered mohammed's uncle the new shepherd did as he was told and returned in the evening with the old woman on his back and the seven singing birds in his pocket, which he gave to the seven boys when they came to meet him. So the days passed, one exactly like the other. At last one night he began to weep and cried, Oh, what have I done that I should have to perform such hateful tasks? And his nephew Mohammed saw him from afar and thought to himself, My uncle is in trouble. I must go and help him. And the next morning... He went to his master and said, Dear master, I must go to my uncle, and I wish to send him here instead of myself, while I serve under his master. And that you may know it is he and no other man, I will give him my staff and put my mantle on him. All right, said the master. Mohammed set out on his journey, and in two days he arrived at the place where his uncle was standing with the old woman on his back trying to catch birds as they flew past. And Mohammed touched him on the arm and spoke, Dear uncle, did I not warn you to never take service under any blue-eyed, red-haired man? But what could I do? said the uncle. I was hungry, and he passed, and we signed a contract. Give the contract to me, said the young man. Here it is, replied the uncle, holding it out. Now, continued Mohammed, let the old woman get down from your back. Oh no, I mustn't do that, cried he. But the nephew paid no attention and went on talking. Do not worry yourself about the future. 
I see my way all out of it, and first you must take my stick and mantle and leave this place. After two days' journey straight before you, you will come to some tents which are inhabited by shepherds. Go in there and wait. All right, said the uncle. Then Mohammed, with the magic finger, picked up a stick and struck the old woman with it, saying, Get down and look after the sheep. I want to go to sleep. Oh, certainly, replied she. So Mohammed lay down comfortably under a tree and slept till evening. Towards sunset, he woke up and said to the old woman, Where are the singing birds which you have to catch? You never told me anything about that, replied she. Oh, didn't I? He answered, Well, it is part of your business, and if you don't do it, I shall kill you. Of course I will catch them, cried she in a hurry, and ran about the bushes after the birds, till thorns pierced her foot, and she shrieked from pain and exclaimed, Oh dear, how unlucky I am, and how abominably this man is treating me. However, at last she managed to catch the seven birds and brought them to Mahogany, saying, Here they are. Then now we will go back to the house, said he. When they had gone some way, he turned to her sharply. Be quick and drive the sheep home, for I do not know where their fold is. And she drove them before her. By and by, the young man spoke. Look here, old hag, if you say anything to your son about my having struck you, or about my not being the old shepherd, I'll kill you. Oh no, of course I won't say anything. When they got back, the son said to his mother, That is a good shepherd I've got, isn't he? Oh, a splendid shepherd, said she. Why not look how fat the sheep are and how much milking they give? Yes, indeed, replied the son, as he rose to get supper for his mother and the shepherd. In this time, Mohammed's uncle, the shepherd, had had nothing to eat but the scraps left by the old woman, but the new shepherd was not going to be content with that. You will not touch the food till I have had as much as I want, whispered he. Very good, replied she. And when he had had enough, he said, Now eat. But she wept and cried. That was not written in your contract. You were only to have what I left. If you say one word more, I'll kill you, said he. The next day he took the old woman on his back and drove the sheep in front of him till he was some distance from the house. When he let her fall and said, Quick, go and mind the sheep. Then he took a ram and killed it. He lit a fire and broiled some of its flesh and called to the old woman, Come and eat with me, and she came. But instead of letting her eat quietly, he took a large lump of meat and rammed it down her throat with his crook, so that she died. And when he saw she was dead, he said, that is what you have got for tormenting my uncle, and left her lying where she was, while he went after the singing birds. It took him a long time to catch them, but at length he had had the whole seven hidden in his pocket of his tunic. And when he threw the old woman's body into some bushes, and drove the sheep before him back to their fold. And when they drew near the house of the seven boys came to meet him, he gave a bird to each. Why are you weeping? asked the boys as they took the board. Because your grandmother is dead, and they ran and told their father. Then the man came up to Mohammed. What was the matter? How did she die? And Mohammed answered, I was tending the sheep, and she said to me, Kill me that ram, I'm hungry. So I killed it and gave her the meat, but she had no teeth, and it choked her. But why did you kill the ram instead of one of the sheep? asked the man. What was I to do? said Mohammed. I had to obey orders. Well, I must see to her burial, said the man, and the next morning Mohammed drove out the sheep as usual, thinking to himself, Thank goodness I got rid of the old woman. Now for the boys. All day long he looked after the sheep, and towards evening he began to dig some little holes in the ground, out of which he took six scorpions. He put these in his pocket, together with one bird, which he caught. After this, he drove his flock home. When he approached the house, the boys came out to meet him, as before, saying, Give me my bird, and he put a scorpion into the hand of each, and it stung him, and he died. But to the youngest, he only gave a bird. As soon as he saw the boys lying dead on the ground, 
Mohammed lifted up his voice and cried loudly, Help! Help! The children are dead. And the people came running fast, saying, What happened? How have they died? And Mohammed answered, It was your own fault. The boys had been accustomed to birds, and this bitter cold their fingers grew stiff and could hold nothing, so that the birds flew away and their spirits flew with them. Only the youngest who managed to keep tight hold of his bird is still alive. And the father groaned and said, I have borne enough. Bring no more birds, lest I lose the youngest also. All right, said Mohammed. As he was driving the sheep out of the grass, he said to his master, Out there is a splendid pasture, and I will keep the sheep there for two or perhaps three days, so do not be surprised at our absence. Very good, said the man, and Mohammed started. For two days he drove them on and on, till he reached his uncle and said to him, Dear uncle, take these sheep and look after them. I have killed the old woman and the boys, and the flock I have brought to you. Then Mohammed returned to his master, and on the way he took a stone and beat his own head till it bled and bound his hands tight and began to scream. The master came running and asked, What's the matter? And Mohammed answered, While the sheep were grazing, robbers came and drove them away, because I tried to prevent them. They struck me on the head and bound my hands. See how bloody I am? What shall we do? said the master. Are the animals far off? So far that you are not likely to ever see them again, replied Mohammed. This is the fourth day since the robbers came down. How should you be able to overtake them? Then go and herd the cows, said the man. All right, replied Mohammed, and for two days he went. But on the third day he drove the cows to his uncle, first cutting off their tails. Only one cow he left behind him. Take these cows, dear uncle, said he. I'm going to teach that man a lesson. Well, I suppose you know your business best, said the uncle, and certainly he most worried me to death. So Mohammed returned to his master, carrying the cow's tails tied up in a bundle on his back. When he came to the seashore, he stuck all the tails in the sand and went and buried one cow, whose tail he had not cut off, up to her neck, leaving the tail projecting. After he had got everything ready, he began to shriek and scream as before, till his master and all the other servants came running to see what was the matter. What in the world has happened, they cried. The sea has swallowed up the cows, said Mohammed, and nothing remains but their tails. But if you are quick and pull hard, perhaps you may get them out again. The master ordered each man instantly to take hold of a tail, but the first pulled and nearly tumbled backwards as the tails were left in their hands. Stop, cried Mohammed, you're doing it all wrong. You've just pulled off their tails, and the cows have sunk to the bottom of the sea. See if you can do any better, they said. And Mohammed ran to the cow, which had buried in the rough grass, and took hold of her tail and dragged the animal out at once. There, that is the way to do it, said he. I told you nothing about it. The men slunk away, much ashamed of themselves, but the master came up to Mohammed. Get you gone, he said. There is nothing more for you to do. You have killed my mother, you have slain my children, you have stolen my sheep, you have drowned my cows. I have nothing now, no work to give you. First give me the strip of your skin which belongs to me of right, as you have broken your contract. That a judge shall decide, said the master. We will go before him. Yes, we will, replied Mohammed, and they went before the judge. What is your case? asked the judge of the master. My lord, said the man, bowing low, my shepherd here has robbed me of everything. He has killed my children and my old mother. He has stolen my sheep and drowned my cows in the sea. The shepherd answered, he must pay me what he owes me, and then I will go. Yes, that is the law, said the judge. Very well, returned the master. Let him reckon up how long he has been in my service. That won't do, replied Mohammed. I want my strip of skin, as we agreed in the contract. Seeing there was no help for it, the master cut a bit of skin and gave it to Mohammed, who went off at once to his uncle. Now we are rich, dear uncle, he cried. We will sell our cows and sheep and go to a new country. This one is no longer the place for us. 
The sheep were soon sold, and the two comrades started on their travels. That night they reached some Bedouin tents where they had supper with the Arabs. Before they lay down to sleep, Mohammed called the owner of the tent aside. Your greyhound will eat my strip of leather, he said to the Arab. No, do not fear. But supposing he does? Well then, I will give him to you in exchange, replied the Arab. Mohammed waited till everyone was fast asleep. Then he rose softly, and tearing the bit of skin to pieces, he threw it down before the greyhound, setting up wild shrieks as he did so. O oh, master, said I not well that your dog would eat my thong? Be quiet, don't make so much noise, and you shall have the dog. So Mohammed put a leash around his neck and led him away. In the evening they arrived at the tents of some more bedroom and asked for shelter. After supper, Mohammed said to the owner of the tent, Your ram will kill my greyhound. Oh, no, he won't. And supposing he does, then you can take him in exchange. So in the night, Mohammed killed the greyhound and laid his body across the horns of the ram. Then he set up shrieks and yells till he roused the Arab, who said, Take the ram and go away. Mohammed did not need to be told twice and at sunset he reached another Bedouin encampment. He was received kindly, as usual, and after supper he said to his host, Your daughter will kill my ram. Be silent, she will do nothing of the sort. My daughter does not need to steal meat, she has some every day. Very well, I will go to sleep, but if anything happens to my ram, I will call out. If my daughter touches anything belonging to my guest, I will kill her, said the Arab and went to his bed. When everybody was asleep, Mohammed got up, killed the ram, and took out his liver, which he broiled on the fire. He placed a piece of it in the girl's hand and laid some more on her nightdress while she slept and knew nothing about it. After this, he began to cry out loudly, What's the matter? Be silent at once, called the Arab. How can I be silent when my ram, which I loved like a child, has been slain by your daughter? But my daughter is asleep, said the Arab. Well, go and see if she is not some of the flesh about her. If she has, you may take her in exchange for the ram. And as they found the flesh exactly as Mohammed had foretold, the Arab gave his daughter a good beating and then told her to get out of the sight, for she was now the property of this stranger. They wandered in the desert at nightfall. They came to a bed in encampment where the hospitality bidden to enter. Before lying down to sleep, Mohammed said to the owner of the tent, Your mare will kill my wife. Certainly not. And if she does, then you shall take the mare in exchange. When everyone was asleep, Mohammed said softly to his wife, Maiden, I have got such a clever plan. I am going to bring in the mare and put it at your feet, and I will cut you just a few flesh wounds, so that you may be covered with blood, and everybody will suppose you to be dead. But remember that you must not make a sound or we shall both be lost. This was done, and then Mohammed wept and wailed louder than ever. The Arab hastened the spot and cried, Oh, cease making that terrible noise. Take the mare and go, but carry off the dead girl with you. She can lie quite easily across the mare's back. Then Mohammed and his uncle picked up the girl and placing her on the mare's back, led it away being very careful to walk one on each side so that she might not slip down and hurt herself. After the Arab tents could be seen no longer, the girl sat up on the saddle and looked about her as they were all hungry, and they tied up the mare and took out some dates to eat. When they had finished, Mohammed said to his uncle, Dear uncle, the maiden shall be your wife. I give her to you. But the money we got from the sheep and cows will be divided between us. You shall have two-thirds, and I'll have one. For you will have a wife, but I never mean to marry. And now go in peace, for never more will you see me. The bond of bread and salt is at an end between us. So they wept and fell on each other's necks, and asked forgiveness for any wrongs in the past. Then they parted their ways. End of chapter 17
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Om123. The Grey Fairy Book. Edited by Andrew Lang. Chapter 18. Bobino. Once on a time, there was a rich merchant who had an only son called Bobino. Now, as the boy was clever and had a great desire for knowledge, his father sent him to be under a master, from whom he thought he would learn to speak all sorts of foreign languages. After some years with this master, Bobino returned to his home. One evening, as he and his father were walking in the garden, the sparrows in the trees above their heads began such a twittering that they found it impossible to hear each other speak. This annoyed the merchant very much, so to soothe him, Babinu said, Would you like me to explain to you what the sparrows are saying to each other? The merchant looked at his son in astonishment and answered, What can you mean? How can you explain what the sparrows say? Do you consider yourself a soothsayer or a magician? I am neither a soothsayer nor a magician answered Bobino. But my master taught me the languages of all the animals. Alas, for my good money! exclaimed the merchant. The master has certainly mistaken my intention. Of course I mean to do learn the languages that human beings talk, and not the languages of animals. Have patience, answered the son. My master thought it best to begin with the language of animals and later to learn the languages of human beings. On their way into the house, the dog ran to meet them, barking furiously. What can be the matter with the beast? said the merchant. Why should he bark at me like that, when he knows me quite well? Shall I explain to you what he is saying? said Babino. Leave me in peace, and don't trouble me with your nonsense, said the merchant, quite crossly how my money has been wasted. A little later, as they sat down to supper, some frogs in a neighboring pond set up such a croaking as had never been heard. The noise so irritated the merchant that he quite lost his temper and exclaimed, This only was wanting to add the last drop to my discomfort and disappointment. Shall I explain to you? began Bobino. Will you hold your tongue with your explanations? shouted the merchant. Go to bed, and don't let me see your face again. So Bobino went to bed and slept soundly. But his father, who could not get over his disappointment at the waste of his money, was so angry that he sent for two servants, and gave them orders which they were to carry out on the following day. Next morning one of the servants awakened Bobino early, and made him get into a carriage that was waiting for him. The servant placed himself on the seat beside him, while the other servant rode alongside the carriage as an escort. Babino could not understand what they were going to do with him, or where he was being taken, but he noticed that the servant beside him looked very sad, and his eyes were all swollen with cry. Curious to know the reason, he said to him, Why are you so sad? And where are you taking me? But the servant would say nothing. At last, moved by Bobino's entreaties, he said, My poor boy, I am taking you to your death, and what is worse, I am doing so by the order of your father. But why? exclaimed Bobino. Does he want me to die? What evil have I done him, or what fault have I committed that he should wish to bring about my death? You have done him no evil, answered the servant, neither have you committed any fault. But he is half mad with anger because, in all these years of study, you have learned nothing but the language of animals. He expected something quite different from you. That is why he is determined you shall die. If that is the case, kill me at once, said Babino. What is the use of waiting, if it must be done? I have not the heart to do it, answered the servant. I would rather think of some way of saving your life and at the same time are protecting ourselves from your father's anger. By good luck the dog has followed us. 
we will kill it and cut out the heart and take it back to your father. You will believe it is yours, and you in the meantime will have made your escape. When they had reached the thickest part of the wood, Bobino got out of the carriage, and having said good-bye to the servants, set out on his wanderings. On and on he walked, till at last, late in the evening, he came to a house where some houtsmen lived. He knocked at the door and begged for shelter for the night. The houtsman, seeing how gentle a youth he seemed, made him welcome, and bade him sit down and share their supper. While they were eating it, the dog in the courtyard began to bark. Bobino walked to the window, listened attentively for a minute, and then turning to the herdsman said, Send your wives and daughters at once to bed, and arm yourselves as best as you can, because at midnight a band of robbers will attack this house. The herdsmen were quite taken aback, and thought that the youth must have taken leave of his senses. How can you know? they said that a band of robbers mean to attack us. Who told you so? I know it from the dog's barking, answered Bobino. I understand his language, and if I had not been here, the poor beast would have wasted his breath to no purpose. You had better follow my advice, if you wish to save your lives and property. The herdsmen were more and more astonished, but they decided to do as Bobino advised. They sent their wives and daughters upstairs, then, Having armed themselves, they took up their position behind the hedge, waiting for midnight. Just as the clock struck twelve, they heard the sound of approaching footsteps, and a band of robbers cautiously advanced towards the house. But the herdsmen were on the lookout. They sprang on the robbers from behind the hedge, and with blows from their cudgels soon put them to flight. You may believe how grateful they were to Bobino, to whose timely warning they owed their safety. They begged him to stay and make his home with them. But as he wanted to see more of the world, he thanked them warmly for their hospitality, and set out once more on his wanderings. All day he walked, and in the evening he came to a peasant's house. While he was wondering whether he should knock and demand shelter for the night, he heard a great croaking of frogs in a ditch behind the house. Stepping to the back, he saw a very strange sight. Four frogs were throwing a small bottle about, from one to the other, making a great croaking as they did so. Bobino listened for a few minutes, and then knocked at the door of the house. It was opened by the peasant, who asked him to come in and have some supper. When the meal was over, his host told him that they were in great trouble, as his eldest daughter was so ill that they feared she could not recover. A great doctor who had been passing that way some time before, had promised to send her some medicine that would have cured her, but the servant to whom he had entrusted the medicine had let it drop on the way back, and now there seemed no hope for the girl. Then Bobino told the father of the small bottle he had seen the frogs play with, and that he knew that was the medicine which the doctor had sent to the girl. The patient asked him how he could be sure of this, and Bobino explained to him that he understood the language of animals, and had heard what the frogs said as they tossed the bottle about. So the peasant fetched a bottle from the ditch, and gave the medicine to his daughter. In the morning she was much better, and the grateful father did not know how to thank Bobino enough. But Bobino would accept nothing from him, and having said goodbye, set out once more on his wanderings. One day, soon after this, he came upon two men resting under a tree in the heat of the day. Being tired, he stretched himself on the ground at no great distance from them, and soon they all three began to talk to one another. In the course of conversation, Bobino asked the two men where they were going, and they replied that they were on their way to a neighboring town, where that day a new ruler was to be chosen by the people. While they were still talking, some sparrows settled on the tree under which they were lying. Papino was silent, and appeared to be listening attentively. At the end of a few minutes, he said to his companions, Do you know what those sparrows are saying? They are saying that today one of us will be chosen ruler of the town. The man said nothing, but looked at each other. A few minutes later, seeing that Bobino had fallen asleep, they stole away 
and made with all haste for the town, where the election of a new ruler was to take place. A great crowd was assembled in the market-place, waiting for the hour when an eagle should be let loose from a cage, for it had been settled that on whosoever house the eagle alighted, the owner of that house should become ruler of the town. At last the hour arrived. The eagle was set free, and all eyes were strained to see where it would alight. But circling over the heads of the crowds, it flew straight in the direction of a young man, who was at the moment entering the town. This was none other than Bobino, who had awakened soon after his companions had left him, and had followed in their footsteps. All the people shouted and proclaimed that he was their future ruler, and he was conducted by a great crowd to the governor's house, which was for the future to be his home. And here he lived happily, and ruled wisely over the people. End of chapter 18「Chapter 19 of the Grey Fairy Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Bologna Times. The Grey Fairy Book. Edited by Andrew Lang. Chapter 19. The Dog and the Sparrow. There was once upon a time a sheep-dog whose master was so unkind that he starved the poor beast, and ill-treated him in the cruelest manner. At last the dog determined to stand this ill-usage no longer, and one day he ran away from home. As he was trotting along the road, he met a sparrow, who stopped him and said, "'Brother, why do you look so sad?' The dog answered, "'I am sad because I am hungry and have nothing to eat.' "'If that's all, dear brother,' said the sparrow, "'come to the town with me, and I'll soon get food for you.' So they went together to the town, and when they came to a butcher's shop, the sparrow said to the dog, "'You stand still, and I'll peck down a piece of meat for you.' First she looked all round to see that no one was watching her, and then she set to work to peck at a piece of meat that lay on the edge of a shelf, till at last it fell down. The dog seized it ravenously, and ran with it to a dark corner, where he gobbled it up in a very few minutes. When he had finished it, the sparrow said, Now come with me to another shop, and I will get you a second piece, so that your hunger may be satisfied. When the dog had finished the second piece of meat, the sparrow asked him, Brother, have you had enough now? Yes replied the dog, I've had quite enough meat, but I haven't had any bread yet. The sparrow said, You shall have as much bread as you like, only come with me. Then she led him to a baker's shop, and pecked so long at two rolls on a shelf, that at last they fell down, and the dog ate them up. But still his hunger was not appeased, so the sparrow took him to another baker's shop, and got some more rolls for him. Then she asked him, Well, brother, are you satisfied? Yes, he replied, and now let us go for a little walk outside the town. So the two went for a stroll into the country, but the day was very hot, and after they had gone a short distance, the dog said, I am very tired, and would like to go to sleep. Sleep, then, said the sparrow, and I will keep watch, meantime, on the branch of a tree. So the dog lay down in the middle of the road, and was soon fast asleep. While he was sleeping, a carter passed by, driving a wagon drawn by three horses, and laden with two barrels of wine. The sparrow noticed that the man was not going out of his way to avoid the dog, but was driving right in the middle of the road, where the poor animal lay, so she called up, "'Carter, take care what you are about, or I shall make you suffer for it.' But the carter merely laughed at her words, and, cracking his whip, he drove his wagon right over the dog, so that the heavy wheels killed him. Then the sparrow called out, 
you have caused my brother's death and your cruelty will cost you your wagon and horses wagon and horses indeed said the carter i'd like to know how you could rob me of them the sparrow said nothing but crept under the cover of the wagon and pecked so long at the bunghole of one of the barrels that at last she got the cork away and all the wine ran out without the carter's noticing it but at last he turned round and saw that the bottom of the cart was wet and when he examined it he found that one of the barrels was quite empty oh what an unlucky fellow i am he exclaimed you'll have worse luck still said the sparrow as she perched on the head of one of the horses and pecked out its eyes when the carter saw what had happened he seized an axe and tried to hit the sparrow with it but the little fellow flew up into the air and the carter only hit the blind horse on the head so that it fell down dead oh what an unlucky fellow i am he exclaimed again you'll have worse luck yet said the sparrow and when the carter drove on with his two horses she crept under the covering again and pecked away at the cork of the second barrel till she got it away and all the wine poured out on to the road when the carter perceived this fresh disaster he called out once more oh what an unlucky fellow i am but as the sparrow answered your bad luck is not over yet and flying on to the head of the second horse she pecked out its eyes the carter jumped out of the wagon and seized his axe with which he meant to kill the sparrow but the little bird flew high into the air and the blow fell on the poor blind horse instead and killed it on the spot then the carter exclaimed oh what an unlucky fellow i am you've not got to the end of your bad luck yet sang the sparrow and perching on the head of the third horse she pecked out its eyes the carter blind with rage let his axe fly at the bird but once more she escaped the blow which fell on the only remaining horse and killed it and again the carter called out oh what an unlucky fellow am i you'll have worse luck yet said the sparrow for now i mean to make your home desolate the carter had to leave his wagon on the road and he went home in a towering passion as soon as he saw his wife he called out oh what bad luck i have had all my wine is spilt and my horses are all three dead my dear husband replied his wife your bad luck pursues you for a wicked little sparrow has assembled all the other birds in the world and they are in our barn eating everything up the carter went out to the barn where he kept his corn and found it was just as his wife had said thousands and thousands of birds were eating up the grain and in the middle of them sat the little sparrow when he saw his old enemy the carter cried out oh what an unlucky fellow i am not unlucky enough yet answered the sparrow for mark my words carter your cruel conduct will cost you your life and with these words she flew into the air the carter was much depressed by the loss of all his worldly goods and sat down at the fire plotting vengeance on the sparrow while the little bird sat on the window ledge and sang in mocking tones yes carter your cruel conduct will cost you your life then the carter seized his axe and threw it at the sparrow but he only broke the window panes and did not do the bird a bit of harm she hopped in through the broken window and perching on the mantelpiece she called out yes carter it will cost you your life the carter quite beside himself with rage flew at the sparrow again with his axe but the little creature always eluded his blows and he only succeeded in destroying all his furniture at last however he managed to catch the bird in his hands then his wife called out shall i wring her neck certainly not replied her husband that would be far too easy a death for her she must die in a far crueler fashion than that i will eat her alive 
and he suited the action to his words. But the sparrow fluttered and struggled inside him till she got up into the man's mouth, and then she popped out her head and said, Yes, Carter, it will cost you your life. The carter handed his wife the axe and said, Wife, kill the bird in my mouth, dead. The woman struck with all her might, but she missed the bird and hit the carter right on top of his head, so that he fell down dead. But the sparrow escaped out of his mouth and flew away into the air. End of chapter 19、Chapter、Twenty of the Gray Fairy Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Gray Fairy Book, edited by Andrew Lang. Chapter Twenty the, the Story of the Three Sons of Hali. Till his eighteenth birthday, the young Niangir lived happily in a village about forty miles from Constantinople, believing that Mohammed. And Zinebi, his wife, who had brought him up, were his real parents. Niangir was quite content with his lot, though he was neither rich nor great, and unlike most young men of his age, had no desire to leave his home. He was therefore completely taken by surprise when one day Mohammed told him, with many sighs, that the time had now come for him to go to Constantinople and fix on profession for himself. The choice would be left to him, but he would probably prefer either to be a soldier or one of the doctors learned in the law who explained the Koran to the ignorant people. You know the holy book nearly by heart, ended the old man, so that in a very short time you would be fitted to teach others. But write to us and tell us how you pass your life, and we, on our side, will promise never to forget you. So saying, Mohammed gave Niangir four piastres to start him in the great city, and obtained leave for him to join a caravan which was about to set off for Constantinople. The journey took some days, as caravans go very slowly, but at last the walls and towers of the capital appeared in the distance. When the caravan halted, the travellers went their different ways, and Niangir was left feeling very strange and rather lonely. He had plenty of courage and made friends very easily. Still, not only was it the first time he had left the village where he had been brought up, but no one had ever spoken to him of Constantinople, and he did not so much as know the name of a single street or of a creature who lived in it. Wondering what to do next, Niangir stood still for a moment to look about him, when suddenly a pleasant looking man came up and, bowing politely, Asked if the youth would do him the honor of staying in his house till he had made some plans for himself. Niangir, not seeing anything else he could do, accepted the stranger's offer and followed him home. They entered a large room where a girl of about twelve years old was laying three places at the table. Zelida, said the stranger, was I not quite right when I told you that I should bring back a friend to sup with us? My father, replied the girl, you are always right in what you say, and what is better still, you never mislead others. As she spoke, an old slave placed on the table a dish called pilau, made of rice and meat, which is a great favorite among people in the East, and setting down glasses of sherbet before each person left the room quietly. During the meal, the host talked a great deal upon all sorts of subjects. But Niangir did nothing but look at Zelida as far as he could without being positively rude. The girl blushed and grew uncomfortable, and at last turned to her father. The stranger's eyes never wander from me, she said in a low and hesitating voice. If Hassan should hear of it, jealousy will make him mad. No, no, replied the father. You are certainly not for this young man. Did I not tell you before that I intend him for your sister Argentine? I will at once take measures to fix his heart upon her. And he rose and opened a cupboard, from which he took some fruits and a jug of wine, which he put on the table, 
together with a small silver and mother-of-pearl box. "'Taste the wine,' he said to the young man, pouring some into a glass. "'Give me a little, too,' cried Zelita. "'Certainly not,' answered her father. "'You and Hassan both had as much as was good for you the other day.' "'Then drink some yourself,' replied she, "'or this young man will think we mean to poison him.' "'Well, if you wish, I will do so,' said the father. "'This elixir is not dangerous at my age, as it is at yours.' When Nyangir had emptied his glass, his host opened the mother-of-pearl box and held it out to him. Nyangir was beside himself with delight at the picture of a young maiden more beautiful than anything he had ever dreamed of. He stood speechless before it, while his breast swelled with a feeling quite new to him. His two companions watched him with amusement, until at last Nyangir roused himself. "'Explain to me, I pray you,' he said, "'the meaning of these mysteries. Why did you ask me here? Why did you force me to drink this dangerous liquid, which has set fire to my blood? Why have you shown me this picture, which has almost deprived me of reason?' "'I will answer some of your questions,' replied his host, "'but all I may not.' The picture that you hold in your hand is that of Zelita's sister. It has filled your heart with love for her. Therefore go and seek her. When you find her, you will find yourself. But where shall I find her? cried Nyangir, kissing the charming miniature on which his eyes were fixed. I am unable to tell you more, replied his host cautiously. But I can, interrupted Zelita eagerly. "'Tomorrow you must go to the Jewish bazaar "'and buy a watch from the second shop on the right hand, "'and at midnight—' "'But what was to happen at midnight, Nyangir did not hear, "'for Selita's father hastily laid his hand over her mouth, "'crying, "'Oh, be silent, child! "'Would you draw down on you by imprudence "'the fate of your unhappy sisters?' "'Hardly had he uttered the words "'when a thick black vapour rose about him, "'proceeding from the precious bottle— which his rapid movement had overturned. The old slave rushed in and shrieked loudly, while Nyangir, upset by the strange adventure, left the house. He passed the rest of the night on the steps of a mosque, and with the first streaks of dawn he took his picture out of the folds of his turban. Then, remembering Zelita's words, he inquired the way to the bazaar, and went straight to the shop she had described. In answer to Nyangir's request to be shown some watches, the merchant produced several and pointed out the one which he considered the best. The price was three gold pieces, which Nyangir readily agreed to give him, but the man made a difficulty about handing over the watch unless he knew where his customer lived. "'That is more than I know myself,' replied Nyangir. "'I only arrived in the town yesterday and cannot find the way to the house where I went first. "'Well,' said the merchant, "'come with me, and I will take you to a good Mussulman, "'where you will have everything you desire at a small charge.' Nyangir consented, and the two walked together through several streets till they reached the house recommended by the Jewish merchant. By his advice, the young man paid in advance the last gold piece that remained to him for his food and lodging. As soon as Nyangir had dined, he shut himself up in his room, and thrusting his hand into the folds of his turban, drew out his beloved portrait. As he did so, he touched a sealed letter which had apparently been hidden there without his knowledge, and seeing it was written by his foster mother's nebi, he tore it eagerly open. Judge of his surprise when he read these words. My dearest child, this letter, which you will some day find in your turban, is to inform you that you are not really our son. We believe your father to have been a great lord in some distant land, and inside this packet is a letter from him, threatening to be avenged on us if you are not restored to him at once. We shall always love you, but do not seek us, or even write to us. It will be useless. In the same wrapper was a roll of paper, with a few words as follows, traced in a hand unknown to Nyangir. Traitors! You are no doubt in league with those magicians who have stolen the two daughters of the unfortunate Sirocco, and have taken from them the talisman given them by their father. You have kept my son from me, 
but I have found out your hiding place, and swear by the holy prophet to punish your crime. The stroke of my scimitar is swifter than the lightning. The unhappy Niangir, on reading these two letters, of which he understood absolutely nothing, felt sadder and more lonely than ever. It soon dawned on him that he must be the son of the man who had written to Mohammed and his wife, but he did not know where to look for him, and indeed thought much more about the people who had brought him up and whom he was never to see again. To shake off these gloomy feelings, so as to be able to make some plan for the future, Niangir left the house and walked briskly about the city till darkness had fallen. He then retraced his steps and was just crossing the threshold when he saw something at his feet sparkling in the moonlight. He picked it up and discovered it to be a gold watch shining with precious stones. He gazed up and down the street to see if there was anyone about to whom it might belong, but there was not a creature visible, so he put it in his sash by the side of a silver watch which he had bought from the Jew that morning. The possession of this piece of good fortune cheered Nyangir up a little, for, thought he, I can sell these jewels for at least a thousand sequins, and that will certainly last me till I have found my father. And consoled by this reflection, he laid both watches beside him, and prepared to sleep. In the middle of the night he awoke suddenly, and heard a soft voice speaking, which seemed to come from one of the watches. "'Aurora, my sister!' it whispered gently. Did they remember to wind you up at midnight? No, dear Argentine, was the reply. And you? They forgot me, too, answered the first voice, and it is now one o'clock, so that we shall not be able to leave our prison till tomorrow. If we are not forgotten again, then. We have nothing now to do here, said Aurora. We must resign ourselves to our fate. Let us go. Filled with astonishment, Niangir sat up in bed, and beheld by the light of the moon the two watches slide to the ground and roll out of the room past the cat's quarters. He rushed towards the door and on to the staircase, but the watches slipped downstairs without his seeing them and into the street. He tried to unlock the door and follow them, but the key refused to turn, so he gave up the chase and went back to bed. The next day all his sorrows returned with tenfold force. He felt himself lonelier and poorer than ever, and in a fit of despair he thrust his turban on his head, stuck his sword in his belt, and left the house, determined to seek an explanation from the merchant who had sold him the silver watch. When Niangir reached the bazaar, he found the man he sought was absent from his shop, and his place filled by another Jew. It is my brother you want, said he. We keep the shop in turn, and in turn go into the city to do our business. Ah, uh, what business? cried Niangir in a fury. You are the brother of a scoundrel who sold me yesterday a watch that ran away in the night. But I will find it somehow, or else you shall pay for it as you are his brother. What is that you say? asked the Jew, around whom a crowd had rapidly gathered. A watch that ran away. If it had been a cask of wine, your story might be true, but a watch? That is hardly possible. The Kaddish shall say whether it is possible or not, replied Niangir, who at that moment perceived the other Jew enter the bazaar. Darting up, he seized him by the arm and dragged him to the Kaddish house, but not before the man whom he had found in the shop contrived to whisper to his brother in a tone loud enough for Niangir to hear. Confess nothing, or we shall both be lost. When the Kadi was informed of what had taken place, he ordered the crowd to be dispersed by blows, after the Turkish manner, and then asked Niangir to state his complaint. After hearing the young man's story, which seemed to him most extraordinary, he turned to question the Jewish merchant, who instead of answering, raised his eyes to the heaven and fell down in a dead faint. The judge took no notice of the swooning man, but told Niangir that his tale was so singular he really could not believe it, and that he should have the merchant carried back to his own house. 
This so enraged Niangir that he forgot the respect due to the Kadi, and exclaimed at the top of his voice, Recover this fellow from his fainting fit, and force him to confess the truth, giving the Jew as he spoke a blow with his sword, which caused him to utter a piercing scream. You see for yourself, said the Jew to the Kadi, that this young man is out of his mind. I forgive him his blow, but do not, I pray you, leave me in his power. At that moment the Bassa chanced to pass the Kadi's house, and hearing a great noise, entered to inquire the cause. When the matter was explained to him, he looked attentively at Niangir, and asked him gently how all these marvels could possibly have happened. "'My lord,' replied Niangir, "'I swear I have spoken the truth, and perhaps you will believe me when I tell you that I myself have been the victim of spells wrought by people of this kind, who should be rooted out from the earth. For three years I was changed into a three-legged pot, and only returned to man-shape when one day a turban was laid upon my lid. At these words the Basa rent his robe for joy, and embracing Niangir he cried, Oh, my son, my son, have I found you at last? Do you not come from the house of Mohammed and Zinebi? Yes, my lord, replied Niangir. It was they who took care of me during my misfortune, and taught me by their example to be less worthy of belonging to you. Blessed be the prophet, said the Basa, who has restored one of my sons to me, at the time I least expected it. You know, he continued, addressing the Kadi, that during the first years of my marriage I had three sons by the beautiful Zambak. When he was three years old, a holy dervish gave the eldest a string of the finest coral, saying, Keep this treasure carefully, and be faithful to the prophet, and you will be happy. To the second, who now stands before you, he presented a copper plate on which the name of Mahomet was engraved in seven languages, telling him never to part from his turban, which was the sign of a true believer, and he would taste the greatest of all joys. While on the right arm of the third, the dervish clasped a bracelet with the prayer that his right hand should be pure and the left spotless, so that he might never know sorrow. My eldest son neglected the counsel of the dervish, and terrible troubles fell on him, as also on the youngest. To preserve the second from similar misfortunes, I brought him up in a lonely place, under the care of a faithful servant named Guloko, while I was fighting the enemies of our holy faith. On my return from the wars, I hastened to embrace my son, but both he and Guloko had vanished, and it is only a few months since that I learned that the boy was living with a man called Mohammed, whom I suspected of having stolen him. Tell me, my son, how it came about that you fell into his hands. My lord, replied Niangir, I can remember little of the early years of my life, save that I dwelt in a castle by the seashore with an old servant. I must have been about twelve years old, when one day, as we were out walking, we met a man whose face was like that of this Jew, coming dancing towards us. Suddenly I felt myself growing faint. I tried to raise my hands to my head, but they had become stiff and hard. In a word, I had been changed into a copper pot, and my arms formed the handle. What happened to my companion I know not, but I was conscious that someone had picked me up and was carrying me quickly away. After some days, or so it seemed to me, I was placed on the ground near a thick hedge, and when I heard my captor snoring beside me, I resolved to make my escape. So I pushed my way among the thorns as well as I could, and walked on steadily for about an hour. You cannot imagine, my lord, how awkward it is to walk with three legs, especially when your knees are as stiff as mine were. At length, after much difficulty, I reached a market garden, and hid myself deep down among the cabbages, where I passed a quiet night. The next morning, at sunrise, I felt someone stooping over me and examining me closely. "'What have you got there, Zinebi? said the voice of a man a little way off. "'The most beautiful pot in the whole world,' answered the woman beside me. "'And who would have dreamed of finding it among my cabbages?' Mohammed lifted me from the ground and looked at me with admiration. That pleased me, for every one likes to be admired, even if he is only a pot. And I was taken into the house and filled with water, 
and put on the fire to boil. For three years I led a quiet and useful life, being scrubbed bright every day by Zinebi, then a young and beautiful woman. One morning Zinebi set me on the fire, with a fine fillet of beef inside me, to cook for dinner. Being afraid that some of the steam would escape through the lid, and that the taste of her stew would be spoilt, she looked about for something to put over the cover, but could see nothing handy but her husband's turban. She tied it firmly round the lid, and then left the room. For the first time during three years I began to feel the fire burning the soles of my feet, and moved away a little, doing this with a great deal more ease than I had felt when making my escape to Mohammed's garden. I was somehow aware, too, that I was growing taller. In fact, in a few minutes I was a man again. After the third hour of prayer, Mohammed and Zinebi both returned, and you can guess their surprise at finding a young man in the kitchen instead of a copper pot. I told them my story, which at first they refused to believe. But in the end I succeeded in persuading them that I was speaking the truth. For two years more I lived with them, and was treated like their own son, till the day they sent me to this city to seek my fortune. And now, my lords, here are the two letters which I found in my turban. Perhaps they may be another proof in favor of my story. Whilst Niangir was speaking, the blood from the Jew's wounds had gradually ceased to flow, and at this moment there appeared in the doorway a lovely Jewess, about twenty-two years old, her hair and her dress all disordered, as if she had been flying from some great danger. In one hand she held two crutches of white wood, and was followed by two men. The first man Niangir knew to be the brother of the Jew he had struck with a sword, while in the second the young man thought he recognized the person who was standing by when he was changed into a pot. Both of these men had a wide linen band round their thighs, and held stout sticks. The Jewess approached the wounded man, and laid the two crutches near him. Then fixing her eyes on him, she burst into tears. "'Unhappy Azuf,' she murmured, "'why do you suffer yourself to be led into such dangerous adventures? Look at the consequences, not only to yourself, but to your two brothers,' turning, as she spoke, to the men who had come in with her, and who had sunk down on the mat at the feet of the Jew. The Basa and his companions were struck both with the beauty of the Jewess, and also with her words, and begged her to give them an explanation. "'My lord,' she said, "'my name is Sumi, and I am the daughter of Moises, one of our most famous rabbis. I am the victim of my love for Izaf, pointing to the man who had entered last, and in spite of his ingratitude I cannot tear him from my heart. Cruel enemy of my life,' she continued, turning to Izaf, "'tell these gentlemen your story, and that of your brothers, and try to gain your pardon by repentance.' We all three were born at the same time, said the Jew, obeying the command of Sumi at a sign from the Kadi, and are the sons of the famous Nathan ben Sadi, who gave us the names of Izif, Izuf, and Izaf. From our earliest years we were taught the secrets of magic, and as we were all born under the same stars, we shared the same happiness and the same troubles. Our mother died before I can remember, and when we were fifteen our father was seized with a dangerous illness, which no spells could cure. Feeling death draw near, he called us to his bedside, and took leave of us in these words. My sons, I have no riches to bequeath to you. My only wealth was those secrets of magic which you know. Some stones you already have, engraved with mystic signs, and long ago I taught you how to make others but you still lack the most precious of all talismans, the three rings belonging to the daughters of Sirocco. Try to get possession of them, but take heed on beholding these young girls that you do not fall under the power of their beauty. Their religion is different from yours, and further they are the betrothed brides of the sons of the Basa of the sea. And to preserve you from a love which can bring you nothing but sorrow, I counsel you in time of peril to seek out the daughter of Moises the rabbi, who cherishes a hidden passion for Izaf, and possesses the book of spells, which her father himself wrote with the sacred ink that was used for the Talmud. So saying, our father fell back on his cushions and died, leaving us burning with desire for the three rings of the daughters of Sirocco. 
No sooner were our sad duties finished than we began to make inquiries where these young ladies were to be found, and we learned, after much trouble, that Sirocco, their father, had fought in many wars, and that his daughters, whose beauty was famous throughout all the land, were named Aurora, Argentine, and Zelita. At the second of these names, both the Bassa and his son gave a start of surprise, but they said nothing, and Azaf went on with his story. The first thing to be done was to put on a disguise, and it was in the dress of foreign merchants that we at length approached the young ladies. Taking care to carry with us a collection of fine stones, which we had hired for the occasion, but alas, it was to no purpose that Nathan Ben Sadi had warned us to close our hearts against their charms. The peerless Aurora was clothed in a garment of golden hue, studded all over with flashing jewels. The fair hair Argentine wore a dress of silver, and the young Zelita, loveliest of them all, the costume of a Persian lady. Among other curiosities that we had brought with us was a flask containing an elixir which had the quality of exciting love in the breasts of any man or woman who drank of it. This had been given me by the fair Sumi, who had used it herself, and was full of wrath because I refused to drink it likewise, and so return her passion. I showed this liquid to the three maidens, who were engaged in examining the precious stones, and choosing those that pleased them best and I was in the act of pouring some in a crystal cup when Zelita's eyes fell on a paper wrapped around the flask containing these words. Beware, lest you drink this water with any other man than him who will one day be your husband. Ah, traitor! she exclaimed. What snare have you laid for me? And glancing where her finger pointed, I recognized the writing of Sumi. By this time my two brothers had already got possession of the rings of Aurora and Argentine in exchange for some merchandise which they coveted, and no sooner had the magic circles left their hands than the two sisters vanished completely, and in their place nothing was to be seen but a watch of gold and one of silver. At this instant the old slave, whom we had bribed to let us enter the house, rushed into the room, announcing the return of Zelita's father. My brothers, trembling with fright, hid the watches in their turbans, and while the slave was attending to Zelita, who had sunk, fainting to the ground, we managed to make our escape. Fearing to be traced by the enraged Sirocco, we did not dare to go back to the house where we had lodged, but took refuge with Sumi. "'Unhappy wretches!' cried she. "'Is it thus that you have followed the counsels of your father?' This very morning I consulted my magic books, and saw you in the act of abandoning your hearts to the fatal passion which will one day be your ruin. No, do not think I will tamely bear this insult. It was I who wrote the letter which stopped Zelita in the act of drinking the elixir of love. As for you, she went on, turning to my brothers, you do not yet know what those two watches will cost you, but you can learn it now, and the knowledge of the truth will only serve to render your lives still more miserable." As she spoke, she held out the sacred book written by Moises, and pointed to the following lines. If at midnight the watchers are round with the key of gold and the key of silver, they will resume their proper shapes during the first hour of the day. They will always remain under the care of a woman, and will come back to her wherever they may be. And the woman appointed to guard them is the daughter of Moises. My brothers were full of rage when they saw themselves outwitted, but there was no help for it. The watchers were delivered up to Sumi, and they went their way, while I remained behind, curious to see what would happen. As night wore on, Sumi wound up both watches, and when midnight struck, Aurora and her sister made their appearance. They knew nothing of what had occurred, and supposed that they had just awakened from sleep. But when Sumi's story made them understand their terrible fate, they both sobbed with despair, and were only consoled when Sumi promised never to forsake them. Then one o'clock sounded and they became watches again. All night long I was a prey to vague fears, and I felt as if something unseen was pushing me on. In what direction I did not know. At dawn I rose and went out, meeting Izif in the street, suffering from the same dread as myself. We agreed that Constantinople was no place for us any longer, and calling to Azuf to accompany us, we left the city together, but soon determined to travel separately, so that we might not be so easily recognized by the spies of Sirocco. 
A few days later I found myself at the door of an old castle near the sea, before which a tall slave was pacing to and fro. The gift of one or two worthless jewels loosened his tongue, and he informed me that he was in the service of the son of the Bassa of the sea, at that time making war in distant countries. The youth, he told me, had been destined from his boyhood to marry the daughter of Sirocco, whose sisters were to be the brides of his brothers, and went on to speak of the talisman that his charge possessed. But I could think of nothing but the beautiful Zelita, and in my passion, which I thought I had conquered, awoke in full force. In order to remove this dangerous rival from my path, I resolved to kidnap him, and to this end I began to act a madman, and to sing and dance loudly, crying to the slave to fetch the boy, and let him see my tricks. He consented, and both were so diverted with my antics that they laughed till the tears ran down their cheeks, and even tried to imitate me. Then I declared I felt thirsty, and begged the slave to fetch me some water, and while he was absent I advised the youth to take off his turban, so as to cool his head. He complied gladly, and in the twinkling of an eye was changed into a pot. A cry from the slave warned me that I had no time to lose if I would save my life, so I snatched up the pot and fled with it like the wind. You have heard, my lords, what became of the pot, so I will only say now that when I awoke it had disappeared. But I was partly consoled for its loss by finding my two brothers fast asleep not far from me. How did you get here? I inquired, and what has happened to you since we parted? alas replied azouf we were passing a wayside inn from which came sounds of songs and laughter and fools that we were we entered and sat down circassian girls of great beauty were dancing for the amusement of several men who not only received us politely but placed us near the two loveliest maidens our happiness was complete and time flew unknown to us when one of the circassians leaned forward and said to her sister their brother danced and they must dance too what they meant by these words I know not, but perhaps you can tell us? I understand quite well, I replied. They were thinking of the day that I sold the son of the Bassa, and had danced before him. Perhaps you are right, continued Izuf, for the two ladies took our hands and danced with us till we were quite exhausted, and when at last we sat down a second time to table we drank more wine than was good for us. Indeed, our heads grew so confused that when the men jumped up and threatened to kill us, we could make no resistance, and suffered ourselves to be robbed of everything we had about us, including the most precious possession of all, the two talismans of the daughters of Sirocco. Not knowing what else to do, we all three returned to Constantinople to ask the advice of Sumi, and found that she was already aware of our misfortunes, having read about them in the book of Moises. The kind-hearted creature wept bitterly at our story, but, being poor herself, could give us little help. At last, I proposed that every morning we should sell the silver watch into which Argentine was changed, as it would return to Sumi every evening unless it was wound up with the silver key, which was not at all likely. Sumi consented, but only on the condition that we would never sell the watch without ascertaining the house where it was to be found so that she might also take Aurora thither, and thus Argentine would not be alone if by any chance she was wound up at the mystic hour. For some weeks now we have lived by this means, and the two daughters of Sirocco have never failed to return to Sumi each night. Yesterday Azuf sold the silver watch to this young man, and in the evening placed the gold watch on the steps by order of Sumi, just before his customer entered the house, from which both watches came back early this morning. "'If I had only known!' cried Neongir. "'If I had had more presence of mind, I should have seen the lovely Argentine, and if her portrait is so fair, what must the original be?' "'It was not your fault,' replied the Cadi. "'You are no mag magician, and who could guess that the watch must be wound at such an hour? But I shall give orders that the merchant is to hand it over to you, and this evening you will certainly not forget.' It is impossible to let you have it today, answered Azuf, for it is already sold. If that is so, said the Kadi, you must return the three gold pieces which the young man paid. The Jew, delighted to get off so easily, put his hand in his pocket when Neongir stopped him. No, no, he exclaimed, it is not money I want, but the adorable Argentine. Without her, everything is valueless. "'My dear Kadi,' said the Basa, "'he is right. 
the treasure that my son has lost is absolutely priceless my lord replied the kiddie your wisdom is greater than mine give judgment i pray you in the matter so the bassa desired them all to accompany him to the house and commanded his slaves not to lose sight of the three jewish brothers when they arrived at the door of his dwelling he noticed two women sitting on a bench close by thickly veiled and beautifully dressed their wide satin trousers were embroidered in silver and their muslin robes were of the finest texture in the hand of one was a bag of pink silk tied with green ribbons containing something that seemed to move at the approach of the bassa both ladies rose and came towards him then the one who held the bag addressed him saying noble lord buy i pray you this bag without asking to see what it contains how much do you want for it asked the bassa three hundred sequins replied the unknown at these words the bassa laughed contemptuously and passed on without speaking you will not repent of your bargain went on the woman perhaps if we come back to-morrow you will be glad to give us the four hundred sequins we shall ask then and the next day the price will be five hundred come away said her companion taking hold of her sleeve do not let us stay here any longer it may cry and then our secret will be discovered and so saying the two young women disappeared the jews were left in the front hall under the care of the slaves and niangir and sumi followed the bassa inside the house which was magnificently furnished at one end of a large brilliantly lighted room a lady of about thirty-five years old reclined on a couch still beautiful in spite of the sad expression on her face incomparable zambak said the bassa going up to her give me your thanks for here is the lost son for whom you have shed so many tears but before his mother could clasp him in her arms niangir had flung himself at her feet let the whole house rejoice with me continued the bassa and let my two sons ibrahim and hassan be told that they may embrace their brother alas my lord cried zambak do you forget that this is the hour when hassan weeps on his hand and ibrahim gathers up his coral beads let the command of the prophet be obeyed replied the bassa then we will wait till the evening forgive me noble lord interrupted sumi but what is this mystery with the help of the book of spells perhaps i may be of some use in the matter sumi answered the bassa i owe you already the happiness of my life come with me then and the sight of my unhappy sons will tell you of our trouble better than any words of mine the bassa rose from his divan and drew aside the hangings leading to a large hall closely followed by niangir and sumi there they saw two young men one about seventeen and the other nineteen years of age the younger was seated before a table his forehead resting on his right hand which he was watering with his tears he raised his head for a moment when his father entered and niangir and sumi both saw that this hand was of ebony the other young man was occupied busily in collecting coral beads which were scattered all over the floor of the room and as he picked them up he placed them on the same table where his brother was sitting he had already gathered together ninety-eight beads and thought they were all there when they suddenly rolled off the table and he had to begin his work over again do you see whispered the bassa for three hours daily one collects these coral beads and for the same space of time the other laments over his hand which has become black and i am wholly ignorant what is the cause of either misfortune do not let us stay here said sumi our presence must add to their grief but permit me to fetch the book of spells which i feel sure will tell us not only the cause of their malady but also its cure the bassa readily agreed to sumi's proposal but niangir objected strongly if sumi leaves us he said to his father i shall not see my beloved argentine when she returns to-night with a fair aurora and life is an eternity till i behold her be comforted replied sumi i will be back before sunset and i leave you my adorities off as a pledge scarcely had the jewess left niangir when the old female slave entered the hall where the three jews still remained carefully guarded followed by a man whose splendid dress prevented niangir from recognizing at first as the person in whose house he had dined two days before but the woman he knew at once to be the nurse of zelida he started eagerly forward but before he had time to speak the slave turned to the soldier she was conducting 
My lord, she said, these are the men. I have tracked them from the house of the Kadi to this palace. I am not mistaken. Strike and avenge yourself. As he listened, the face of the stranger grew scarlet with anger. He drew his sword, and in another moment would have rushed on the Jews, when Niangir and the slaves of the Basa seized hold of him. "'What are you doing?' cried Niangir. "'How dare you attack those whom the Basa has taken under his protection?' "'Ah, my son,' replied the soldier, "'the Basa would withdraw his protection if he knew that these wretches have robbed me of all I have dearest in the world. He knows them as little as he knows you.' "'But he knows me very well,' replied Niangir, "'for he has recognized me as his son. "'Come with me now into his presence.' The stranger bowed, and passed through the curtain held back by Niangir, whose surprise was great at seeing his father spring forward and clasp the soldier in his arms. "'What? Is that you, my dear Sirocco?' cried he. "'I believed you had been slain in that awful battle when the followers of the prophet were put to flight. But why do your eyes kindle with the flames that he shot forth on that fearful day? Calm yourself, and tell me what I can do to help you. See, I have found my son. Let that be a good omen for your happiness also.' "'I did not guess,' answered Sirocco, "'that the son you have so long mourned had come back to you.' Some days since the prophet appeared to me in a dream, floating in a circle of light, and he said to me, Go to-morrow at sunset, to the Galata gate, and there you will find a young man, whom you must bring home with you. He is the second son of your old friend the boss of the sea, and that you may make no mistake, put your fingers in his turban, and you will feel the plaque on which my name is engraved in seven different languages. I did as I was bid, went on Sirocco, and so charmed was I with his face and manner, that I caused him to fall in love with Argentine, whose portrait I gave him. But at the moment when I was rejoicing in the happiness before me, and looking forward to the pleasure of restoring you your son, some drops of the elixir of love were spilt on the table, and caused the thick vapour to rise, which hid everything. When it had cleared away, he was gone. This morning my old slave informed me that she had discovered the traitors who had stolen my daughters from me, and I hastened hither to avenge them. But I place myself in your hands, and will follow your counsel. Fate will favor us, I am sure, said the Basa, for this very night I expect to secure both the silver and the gold watch. So send at once, and pray Zelita to join us. A rustling of silken stuffs drew their eyes to the door, and Ibrahim and Hassan, whose daily penance had by this time been performed, entered to embrace their brother, Niangir and Hassan, who had also drunk of the elixir of love, could think of nothing but the beautiful ladies who had captured their hearts, while the spirits of Ibrahim had been cheered by the news that the daughter of Moises hoped to find in the book of spells some charm to deliver him from collecting the magic beads. It was some hours later that Sumi returned, bringing with her the sacred book. See, she said, beckoning to Hassan, your destiny is written here. And Hassan stooped and read these words in Hebrew. His right hand has become black as ebony from touching the fat of an impure animal, and will remain so till the last of its race is drowned in the sea. Alas, sighed the unfortunate youth, it now comes back to my memory. One day the slave of Zambak was making a cake. She warned me not to touch, as the cake was mixed with lard, but I did not heed her, and in an instant my hand became the ebony that it now is. Holy dervish, exclaimed the Basa, how true were your words. My son has neglected the advice you gave him on presenting him the bracelet, and he has been severely punished. But tell me, O oh Waisumi, where I can find the last of the accursed race who has brought this doom on my son. It is written here, replied Sumi, turning over some leaves. The little black pig is in the pink bag carried by the two Circassians. When he read this, the Basa sank on his cushions in despair. Ah, uh, he said, that is the bag that was offered me this morning for three hundred sequins. Those must be the women who caused Azif and Azuf to dance, and took from them the two talismans of the daughters of Sirocco. They only can break the spell that has been cast on us. Let them be found, and I will gladly give them the half of my possessions. Idiot that I was to send them away! While the Basa was bewailing his folly, Ibrahim, in his turn, had opened the book, and blushed deeply as he read the words, 
the chaplet of beads has been defiled by the game of odd and even. Its owner has tried to cheat by concealing one of the numbers. Let the faithless Moslem seek forever the missing bead. Oh, heaven! cried Ibrahim. That unhappy day rises up before me. I had cut the thread of the chaplet while playing with Aurora. Holding the ninety-nine beads in my hand, she guessed odd, and in order that she might lose, I let one of the beads fall from my hand. Since then I have sought it daily, but it never has been found. Holy dervish! cried the Bassa. How true were your words! From the time that the sacred chaplet was no longer complete, my son has borne the penalty. But may not the book of spells teach us how to deliver Ibrahim also? Listen, said Sumi, this is what I find. The coral bead lies in the fifth fold of the dress of yellow brocade. Ah, what good fortune, exclaimed the Bassa. We shall shortly see the beautiful Aurora, and Ibrahim shall at once search in the fifth fold of her yellow brocade, for it is she, no doubt, of whom the book speaks. As the Jewess closed the book of Moises, Zelita appeared, accompanied by a whole train of slaves and her old nurse. At her entrance, Hassan, beside himself with joy, flung himself on his knees and kissed her hand. "'My lord,' he said to the Bassa, "'pardon me these transports. No elixir of love was needed to inflame my heart. Let the marriage rite make us speedily one.' "'My son, are you mad?' asked the Bassa. "'As long as the misfortunes of your brothers last, shall you alone be happy? And who ever heard of a bridegroom with a black hand? Wait yet a little longer.' till the black pig is drowned in the sea. "'Yes, dear Hassan,' said Zelita, "'our happiness will be increased tenfold when my sisters have regained their proper shapes. And here is the elixir which I have brought with me, so that their joy may equal ours.' And she held out the flask to the Bassa, who had it closed in his presence. Zambak was filled with joy at the sight of Zelita, and embraced her with delight. Then she led the way into the garden, and invited all her friends to seat themselves under the thick, overhanging branches of a splendid jessamine tree. No sooner, however, were they comfortably settled, than they were astonished to hear a man's voice, speaking angrily on the other side of the wall. "'Ungrateful girls!' it said. "'Is this the way you treat me? Let me hide myself forever. This cave is no longer dark enough or deep enough for me.' A burst of laughter was the only answer, and the voice continued, "'What have I done to earn such contempt? Was this what you promised me when I managed to get for you the talismans of beauty? Is this the reward I have a right to expect when I have bestowed on you the little black pig who is certain to bring you good luck?' At these words the curiosity of the listeners passed all bounds, and the bossa commanded his slaves instantly to tear down the wall. It was done, but the man was nowhere to be seen, and there were only two girls of extraordinary beauty, who seemed quite at their ease, and came dancing gaily on to the terrace. With them was an old slave in whom the Basa recognized Goloko, the former guardian of Niangir. Goloko shrank with fear when he saw the Basa, as he expected nothing less than death at his hands for allowing Niangir to be snatched away. But the Bassa made him signs of forgiveness, and asked him how he had escaped death when he had thrown himself from the cliff. Goloko explained that he had been picked up by a dervish who had cured his wounds, and had then given him as slave to the two young ladies now before the company, and in their service he had remained ever since. But, said the Bassa, where is the little black pig of which the voice spoke just now? "'My lord,' replied one of the ladies, "'when at your command the wall was thrown down, "'the man whom you heard speaking was so frightened at the noise "'that he caught up the pig and ran away.' "'Let him be pursued instantly!' cried the Bassa. "'But the lady smiled. "'Do not be alarmed, my lord,' said one. "'He is sure to return. "'Only give orders that the entrance to the cave shall be guarded, "'so that when he is once in he shall not get out again.' By this time, night was falling, and they all went back to the palace, where coffee and fruits were served in a splendid gallery, near the woman's apartments. The Bassa then ordered the three Jews to be brought before him, so that he might see whether these were the two damsels who had forced them to dance at the inn. 
but to his great vexation it was found that when their guards had gone to knock down the walls the jews had escaped at this news the jewish sumi turned pale but glancing at the book of spells her face brightened and she said half aloud there is no cause for disquiet they will capture the dervish while hassan lamented loudly that as soon as fortune appeared on one side she fled on the other on hearing this reflection one of the boss's pages broke into a laugh this fortune comes to us dancing my lord said he and the other leaves us on crutches do not be afraid she will not go very far the bassa shocked at his impertinent interference desired him to leave the room and not to come back till he was sent for my lord shall be obeyed said the page but when i return it shall be in such good company that you will welcome me gladly so saying he went out when they were alone Niangir turned to the fair strangers and implored their help my brothers and myself he cried are filled with love for three peerless maidens two of whom are under a cruel spell if their fate happened to be in your hands would you not do all in your power to restore them to happiness and liberty but the young man's appeal only stirred the two ladies to anger what exclaimed one are the sorrows of two lovers to us fate has deprived us of our lovers and if it depends on us the whole world shall suffer as much as we do this unexpected reply was heard with amazement by all present and the bassa entreated the speaker to tell them her story having obtained permission of her sister she began End chapter twenty